Okay, um, good morning, everyone, once again. Um, I think we have got a few more minutes before we formally start, but I thought I'll uh, keep you awake by at least uh, talking from my side and giving you a few updates uh, what's happening throughout the day. So as you know, this is the final day today. It is going to be another long day, and I hope that you will stay as long as you can unless you have to catch a flight or something this afternoon. Um, we will have a few... Um, presentations for uh, early career uh, awards. Uh, we will find a slot for that. So we haven't fixed a particular slot, but it's likely to be towards the end of the day once all the presentations have obviously been finished, evaluated and uh, scores collated. Uh, we also um, have a short presentation about the uh, next year CLS. So uh, uh, I, I bet um, you, know, you will be pleasantly surprised. So you know, please stick around. Um, we have a group photo from yesterday uh, that we will try to share with uh, everybody as soon as we have it here on the screen and then we will email everyone afterwards. Um, we would also like to hear from you about, you know, what went well and what didn't go quite so well and how this can be improved, keeping in mind that every time we go to a new place, and, and every new place has its own nuances. So, uh, you know, we, we have to work within that constraints, but we are always trying to look for new ideas to make uh, this meeting as uh, as engaging and as exciting for everyone. So uh, don't be shy and, and be as critical as you want to be. Um, if you don't want to write it down, come and talk to me and, and tell me that why you didn't like something. Um, and then we will do our best um, to make it better for you. Um, I think uh, we are almost ready to start. Uh, I'll be chairing the first half of the session, and I happen to be given the first talk as well for the, for the session. So, yeah, I'll try to keep myself on time. But if I don't, if one of my co-authors sitting in the audience, if they can wave their hand that, look, your eight minutes are over, then I'll try to wrap it up uh, because um, um, I, I tend to speak for longer than I should. Um, anyway, so uh, shall we get this started? Well, we've got a couple of minutes more. Let's just uh, uh, wait for the mics as well. Mics have not yet arrived, the roving mics. So, um, you know, we don't need them straight away because we have the Q&A after that. There are three talks in this session and we have got 10 minutes for Q&A. So I don't want all the questions. So I'll, I'll shorten that and move into the next one. Um, Anything else anybody wanted to say? We have a minute or raise. Uh, yes. Okay. Uh, right. <laughs> How would you like to share it uh, in a visually appealing way so that everybody can get it? Is that picture where you have the two, um, the picture that has the two galaxies colliding or something I saw in the news? Is that the one you are? That's great. Yeah, you're right on time. Thank you for bringing that to our attention. And it's great that that kind of news we are reading in the morning, um, not the other uh, less, uh, you know, happy news that's also around us. So anyway, without uh, spending any more time on that, let me um, start the session. So uh, I'll give the first talk. Thank you. Sharing in the... Yeah. All good? Yeah? And I just... Um... 
Okay, so I, I just wanted to share something, um, you know, very different to what you might know, what I usually do in, in, in my normal role, which is to, you know, I'm, I'm a sample analysis person. I work with the uh, lunar samples and all sorts of extraterrestrial samples. But something that has actually arisen out of that is uh, my interest in, in the field of uh, in-situ resource utilization for the last uh, 10 or so years. And more and more, um, uh, you know, I've got involved in that. Uh, I have started to think how all the work that we are doing for lunar ISRU, how could that be actually brought um, back to Earth or brought to Earth uh, in the near term? So, so I'm confident that anything we do in this area over the next 40, 50 years will eventually have great applications here on Earth. But oftentimes there is a tension about how do you actually justify what you're doing on the moon for the benefit of um, all of us uh, here on Earth? So that got me thinking. And, and I thought, OK, the only thing I know is you know, how to work with samples. So I'm a geologist by training, and I understand minerals. I understand rocks. Um, and so about um, 10 years ago, um, my colleague uh, Sangu Lim and I started uh, working on the concept of using microwaves for uh, developing ISRU processes for um, lunar applications. And, and the reason was that we all heard over the last two days, especially yesterday, Matthias very eloquently um, shared with us how moon is not just going to be a destination for humans to work and do experiments, et cetera. It's also going to be a gateway and an enabler for the wider solar system exploration. But that exploration has to be done in a sustainable manner, and that exploration has to be done in a, in a responsible manner, which means that we are going to be compelled to minimize the wastage of any resource that we take with us, but also maximize the resource that are going to be available in situ. So where does our work fit in there? Well, when we get to the moon, the only thing that is going to be available to us in the first instance is going to be the lunar environment. And in that lunar environment, the main thing is the lunar regolith, right? Again, the regolith is broken down from rocks. So as a geologist, if you understand what the lunar rocks are made up of, then you have a better understanding of what actually that regolith represents. And then regolith contains all sorts of records and history of the solar system and the, the galaxy and all that you would have heard many times before. So this is where the idea of applying microwave technique comes in, because we thought that uh, when we get to the moon, we need a, a source of heat um, to process that lunar regolith to convert it into some meaningful form. Uh, you don't have plentiful water, even if, if you have some water on the moon. So you can't use water in doing your construction activities. So you need something that actually can allow you to handle and process the regolith so that you can mold it into some meaningful structures. So building your habitat. And that's where the idea of using microwave um, uh, heat source uh, came, to, came to our mind. And, and there are some advantages uh, for using microwaves as opposed to other heat sources. So that work was going on over the last you know, uh, few years. And then we also have colleagues here who are in the audience who have been doing a lot of experiment for extracting um, volatiles from lunar regolith. And that is what we are trying to demonstrate through one of the ESA missions called Prospect using the Prospect package, where um, a payload will be sent to the moon, hopefully in one of the CLIPS mission now in the next few years. And that will be the first demonstration of how you can extract uh, oxygen or, or water from the lunar regolith along with something else. So I thought, okay, we are doing so many things with the lunar regolith, but we are not trying or we are not able to combine yet to maximize what you can get out of the lunar regolith. So that's where this idea arose. And then last year, I bumped into another uh, bunch of colleagues from Finnish Geological Survey. And, and you heard from uh, my colleague, Alan uh, Butcher yesterday about the, some of the work that we are doing uh, with them. And, and they are experts in, in mining industry. So they are experts in actually dealing with the raw material, the circular economy, extraction of critical metals, et cetera. And, and, and to me, that's when the whole circle really became a circle. 
Um, and, and I thought, okay, now we are in a pl place and, and with a group of people who actually understand the material, who understand what we need to do on the moon and um, people who are actually today, they are involved in helping the terrestrial economy with regards to utilizing the raw material and making that economy as circular as possible. So that's where this work began. And so the, the first focus is on the lunar regolith. And, and this is a very well-known uh, pie chart. And, and um, all you can see there is almost half of the lunar regolith contains oxygen. So you heard so much about water, you so much about oxygen. If you want to get oxygen on the moon, you need to extract that oxygen from the lunar regolith. It's not freely available. And if you are lucky to find the water ice, if you go to the polar region, well, maybe you can extract that oxygen much more easily from that. But if you don't go to the polar regions, or for some reason that ice is not accessible to you, you have no choice but to actually utilize the lunar regolith. So what else can you do after that? So that's where the PROSPA um, uh, experiment can uh, uh, help us. But the remaining 50% or 60% of the regolith is still contains meaningful material and some critical elements. Let's take an example. It could be nickel. It could be copper. We don't think about it, but that is something that is going to be critical here on Earth because all of us want to drive electric cars. And they all require batteries. And all those batteries actually require nickel, cobalt, copper, and you know all sorts of elements that actually are widely present, but not present in ore quantities that you normally um, you know, expect in ore deposit. So we had two-pronged approach. One was to develop application when we get to the moon to do whatever we want to do. But at the same time, you utilize and translate that technology for terrestrial applications, OK? so. Uh, the first thing is now everybody is aware that there is some form of water on the moon. It's either present as water ice, or it is present in its various forms as hydrogen, hydroxyl, or even molecular water, often trapped inside rocks, often trapped inside mineral structures. So on one hand, we can use the microwave technique or any other technique to extract that water or convert that into its component oxygen and hydrogen could use as a fuel and for all sorts of other purposes so we have a very deeper understanding of the water inside the moon and it is growing every day we are discovering new things and then that is informing what we want to do and how we want to apply those techniques on the moon and that is all underpinned by the laboratory research. I mean, I, I'm not ashamed to actually um, fly the flag for the laboratory scientists here who actually do very hard work with the minimal material that is available to them in terms of lunar material. And so a lot of our knowledge and understanding and the excitement about going to the moon and using it as an enabler of solar system is on the back of those. Okay, so I've got two minutes left. Uh, those um, uh, developments made by uh, any of the early career scientists who are sitting here in this room, in fact. So um, we also know that we can find water on the surface of the moon. And later today, you will hear from one of our PhD students, James Cole, who will tell you about uh, his experiment using microwave, uh, how he can uh, he plans to extract water and oxygen from such um, water deposits. And again, Colleagues are present here who are involved in that PROSPA and PROSPECT um, package development for ESA, which uh, hopefully will be um, flown on a NASA CLIPS mission and will be the first demonstrator for extracting oxygen. So, so this involved miniaturization of laboratory instruments that we use every day for the type of analysis that I described to you, but then fly this to the moon and do that experiment on the lunar surface. So there is a bit of um, a payload development involved there, not a bit, quite a lot, uh, should I say. Um, and of course, um, in the process, you have some very, um, uh, you know, very many uh, early career researchers getting the opportunity to be trained and skilled and become leaders by themselves. So that's very nice to see. Um, and then once you have actually used the microwave to extract your water and volatiles, you are left with the material that you can use to build habitats. And then that's where um, we have uh, colleagues like Sangulim and our recent PhD student, Vibha, 
a living Prabhu who finished her PhD and now she's working at Ezrik in, in Luxembourg. And so <clears throat> we, we have been looking at the possibility of using microwave for building habitats. Um, and finally, we come uh, uh, back to Earth. And this is where what you see is um, some uh, nice uh, field pictures and, and they look nice from a distance. But when you get closer, you see that what a barren uh, desertic landscape it is. And I am in North Wales and anybody who knows about the geography of the UK would not expect a dry and desert-like environment in North Wales. <laughs> so this is on the island of Anglesey. And what it is, is mine waste thousands and thousands and thousands of tons of mine waste that has been produced in the process of extracting uh, mainly copper. Uh, that area used to be the world's largest supplier of copper. So to take out copper, a lot of waste material has been produced. So what we are trying to do is we received some money from uh, our funding agency, which is very, who is very keen to, to apply our scientific knowledge for uh, uh, applied purposes. And so we applied the microwave technique to mine waste remediation. And what we found was, um, uh, take this example of uh, this waste material from Anglesey, it had dispersed uh, copper uh, minerals called chalcopyrite. Now this is very fine grain distributed and you wouldn't call it or it was rejected as a waste. What we found after doing the microwave processing that you will see those uh, circled areas that suddenly nuggets of copper or, or the droplets of copper seem to start it to form. And that gave us an idea that probably using the microwave, we are beneficiating what was based into some sort of meaningful ore deposit. So potentially you can use this to extract your copper further. So what can you do with it afterwards though? So, okay, this may be good for um, beneficiating copper. There may be other elements that people didn't know when they were mining. And as a geologist, you know that copper doesn't occur in isolation. It comes together with lots of other elements. So we came up with a, this flow chart. So on the left-hand side is uh, all about the moon. On the right-hand side is all about the earth. And this is how we think it could connect and make it a circular economy where you have a mine with some material taken out, majority is based. You process that waste in a traditional sense to extract something else that you didn't know it was there. And ultimately, whatever is left, you can make, uh, well, this is my last slide, um, you can make uh, 3D printed uh, structures. And if you want, later on, you can actually come and examine these Lego-like bricks that we have printed using the mine waste. And so I have it with me. And on the left-hand side, what you see there is um, what we want to do on the moon. So we do the same process, but on the moon, we also want to extract oxygen before we extract the metals. And then after we have extracted that oxygen and metal, we want to use the remaining material for 3D printing, okay? So that's how we see the two come together. This is only the beginning. It was a very small pilot project and uh, not my title, but uh, recently, uh, you know, some of us here in this room contributed to this article published by the Chemistry World. And when Royal Society of Chemistry is also picking up about the race to build a base on the moon, that's good news, which means that more people outside our community are starting to recognize what we are doing. So thank you very much for your attention. Okay, so I hope I stuck to as close to the time as possible. So next is speaker, Julian. Julian uh, Grenier and Julian will be talking about the effect of varying the proportion of crystalline amorphous phases in a lunar regolith analog and resulting physical properties for ISRU selective laser melting. Julian, over to you. Do you want to use the mic or that? The uh, uniform code of military justice Specified court martial for any officer who um, turned the shoulder of the valley to run away. And that would be a similar protection for students because students shouldn't be allowed to go in without the ability to be able to go. And that's because the protection life will be determined largely by your ability to speak, your ability to write, and the quality of your ideas in that order. 
that wasn't me. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you, Ricky. Okay, I'll uh, show you eight minutes. Sorry. Oh, the no notification thing. Sorry. Are you sure we didn't unshare the screen? Because <laughs> normally we hide it, right? We don't click the cross. Can you check that it is? Uh, did you just end the Zoom? I thought you were just like the, the short one. On the mic? It's fine. It's yeah, still there? Oh, it's still there. Okay, sorry, I got a bit spooked. But the last thing I wanted people losing online. Yeah, yeah. Okay. Please, over to Julian. So yeah. Everyone can hear me well. So yeah, today I'm gonna discuss um, additive manufacturing on the moon uh, from Yona Soil as called Regolith. So it's a huge part of my uh, thesis work, which is being uh, a collaboration between uh, two French labs, which are the ICA for all the uh, material science concerns and uh, IRAP for all the planetology aspects, of course. And so. I will first have to introduce you my uh, mater working material, which is uh, an analog we are developing uh, in both labs. Then I will show you some details about the process I'm using, which is a selective laser melting, which will allow me to, to talk about the relationship between the process and the material and all the relevant uh, physical properties. And then finally, I will present you our additive manufacturing samples and their mechanical behavior. So you're not gonna learn anything for, about the uh, Yona regolith in itself, but um, what I want to insist on today is that of course regolith has a huge uh, range of uh, chemical compositions and um, two main aspects I, I, I will insist on today is the fact that with uh, space weathering and uh, all the uh, formation mechanism of the moon, uh, you have a lot of irregular and uh, acicular uh, particles and uh, a lot of amorphous phases, which are commonly called glass. And that will have a huge aspect on all the properties of the material we are going to make at the end. And so a few decades ago, my uh, uh, PhD supervisors uh, found a, a place in France, which is called uh, the Pic Disson, which, which uh, provides us um, a basaltic material that is quite close to what we could find on the Marais regions with a quite low content on, of uh, titanium, as you can see on the uh, chemical composition on the bottom of the slide. And so, so a huge aspect about uh, this analog is the fact that the original basalt in itself is 100% crystalline. So what we can do is uh, melt it, quench it, and crush it to have this glass, glass powder and so just by mixing the original basaltic powder with glass powder, we can really control precisely the amount of glass material we have in the analog. So now about the process I'm using, um, the concept is quite simple. You have a powder layer that is be being exposed by a laser source. And so you're gonna melt the, the powder and gonna draw the shape of the object. And so you just have to add your layers of powder one by one to actually manufacture your objects in 3D. And so the aspect that interests me here is uh, the quantity of energy I'm bringing to the material, which is called the volumetric energy density. Because I, if I don't bring enough energy, I will create some lack of fusions and so uh, porosities. And that's the opposite. If I bring too much energy to the material, I will uh, vaporize some content and I will also create some porosities. And that's not a good thing for the uh, mechanical properties. So 
why using this method more, more than another? It's because of uh, two main reasons. There's no need for an organic binder and no post-treatment neither, like um, debinding or sintering. And so that's a lot of payloads you can save for other experiments during your lunar missions. So now we want to understand how the um, process itself interacts with, uh, with the powder. And so the first question we have to ask ourselves is uh, how much of the quantity of energy and bringing with the laser is actually absorbed by, by the powder. And so that's all about the optical properties that you are familiar about with all the uh, absorptivity and then for higher temperatures above, uh, uh, above uh, 1000 degrees, uh, all the emissivity aspects. Then you want to know how quick and uh, how far the heat you are creating will be uh, conducted in, in this granular media. And then of course, finally, um, you want also to, to know at which point your material is actually going to melt and what kind of uh, crystalline structure you can get at the end of the process. And for, for all those properties, there is a huge impact of the uh, uh, proportion of glass you have at the beginning. For example, starting with uh, optical properties, what you have here, is the reflectance of our analog depending on its uh, glass concentration. And so I'm not gonna discuss like the behavior, the uh, aspects of the curves, but if you stick to the uh, SLM laser wavelength, you can see that just going from the 100% one, bosontic powder to uh, completely glassy content, you are dropping from 8% of reflectance to 4% of reflectance. So in itself, it's already a good property for us because of course, the more the powder will uh, absorb the, the light and the less you have to spend some uh, energy to bring some power to the laser. We have also conducted some differential scanning calorimetry. So for those who are not familiar with this technique, the point is to have a sample on which we apply uh, a temperature program. So here we are hitting until uh, 1,500 degrees Celsius, and then going back cooling. And so what we monitor is the heat flow going in or out of the sample, because every time you have a transformation uh, of, uh, of phase, it will be either an exothermic or endothermic. So for example, if you take the original basalt powder, when you heat, you have a huge melting area, and then you have the corresponding crystallization area cooling down. And so in the same way, if you take a look at the glass powder, you have two phenomena uh, appearing. First, the glass transition temperature, which is the point at which uh, glass is entering into a viscous state, it's gaining some mobility. And after that, you have the annealing area in which uh, glass has enough energy to actually recrystallize into a new phase. And so this annealing area is uh, endothermic, so it could help us to reduce a little bit the energy of the process, and uh, it gives us a precious uh, information about the kind of material we can get at the end of the uh, SLM process. So finally, I can show you some, uh, some SLM samples and some microstructure. So what you have here are two samples in the same uh, operating conditions with the same energies, the same uh, laser parameters. But on the left, what you have is a 100% crystalline powders uh, which has been used to make both samples. And so what you can see on the micrographs here is that the cylinders we have made are quite uh, with a lot of porosities and irregular shape. So we have on both samples an average porosity of 14%. And so just by changing one condition, it's the proportion of uh, amorphous powder we have. So we have made a mix between 50% uh, basaltic powder and 50% glass because we want to have some uh, reasonable content of uh, glass and not having 100% glass content, which would be weird on the moon. Um, you can see that the microstructure is uh, generally quite better and uh, more regular with uh, a lot less porosities because we are dropping to 4% uh, of porosity. So that confirms that just the fact of adding some uh, glass material in the analog is actually uh, improving a lot the microstructure at the end. Probably, we don't have the exact reason yet, but probably because of the mobility it's bringing, as I was saying, and all the uh, proper uh, physics 
physical properties like uh, optical properties, it is actually changing. So now I will uh, show you some aspects about the mechanical behavior because we have conducted some uh, compression strength uh, testers. So the obvious thing here is about like uh, the maximum stress we can uh, apply to our cylinders. So we have quite uh, promising um, values with a compressive strength of uh, 56 uh, megapascal at max. But uh, the reason why we have those values are because uh, you can see on the end of the curves, it's slightly non uh, uh, linear be be before the failure. So that's a sign of a progressive multi cracking in the material. And so that can be explained because at the end of the process, we still have some uh, crystalline inclusions in the material but, uh, that are actually acting like crack deflectors. So it's a good thing to have at the end of the process still some residual uh, crystalline phase in the material that can be acting to deflect those, uh, those cracks at the end. So what's up next? Uh, we want to tune to the lunar uh, regolith high variability, for example, by adding some uh, titanium rich phases like uh, ilmenite to have uh, the aspect of the variation of composition. Then we want also to, uh, to, to, to find some ways to increase the mechanical properties uh, for example, by adding some metallic powders that can, could be uh, used from uh, ice through techniques. And so to have a composite uh, material that could be more ductile. And then, of course, we need to think about uh, objects with an identified purpose for future lunar space programs. I'm thinking about Ar Artemis, of course, but could be anything. So that's all for me. Thank you for your attention. Thank you, Julian. Um, Luca, yeah, so the next speaker is Luca Valentini. Uh, Luca will be talking about geopolymers for lunar additive manufacturing and sensing. Luca. So you have eight minutes. Yeah, yeah. thank you. Yeah. 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 Yes. Just a moment. Let me get it up. My presentation up first. Okay, good morning, everyone. So this will be a brief uh, overview of the GLAMS project that was uh, recently funded, funded by the Italian Space uh, Agency. It will be a partnership in between the University of uh, Padua, CISA's uh, center, the ICMATE section of the uh, Italian Research Center, WASP, which is a producer of uh, uh, large-scale uh, 3D uh, printers. Now, the final uh, goal of this uh, project, which we hope to start uh, uh, soon, we haven't started yet, is to uh, produce uh, structural elements for a lunar uh, construction using uh, uh, regolith uh, simulants, such as those that you can see in here. And uh, we want these uh, structural elements to have uh, properties of uh, uh, macroporous materials, uh, such as uh, here in the central slide, in the central images, uh, sorry, I will uh, explain in a moment why we want them to have these uh, properties. And we want to produce them using uh, uh, additive manufacturing processes based, based on uh, extrusion. So the rheological properties of these materials, the flowability will be uh, one of the most improper, uh, important properties to be assessed. So you, here, you can see on the image on your uh, right, an example of uh, rotational uh, rheometer by which we can assess these uh, uh, rheological properties. Now, shortly, the criteria that we want to uh, meet for a lunar uh, construction, of course, uh, we want to minimize the amount of our resources transporting from the Earth. We have to take into account all the um, conditions on the moon. So, for example, we have uh, large variations in temperatures. So, we want the material to be a uh, resistance to freeze to, uh, cycles. So this is why we want to provide the thermal properties with uh, this uh, 
large porous uh, network and uh, uh, other uh, conditions is a uh, low gravity, basically no uh, atmosphere. So this can induce process, uh, possible uh, problems during the mixing of these uh, uh, binders. Also the material will be exposed to micro meteoritic impact and uh, it has to uh, absorb enough uh, uh, solar uh, uh, radiation. Of course, in the, on the moon, we cannot set up uh, a real uh, work sites, so 3D print, uh, printing can be an option for the realization of these uh, uh, buildings. Okay, so, uh, well, we don't want to uh, transport, as we said, uh, Portland uh, cement as a binder material, not just because uh, we want to save uh, uh, money and we want to save uh, fuel, but also because Portland cement uh, in itself uh, is a very large CO2 emitter. Okay, it is estimated that approximately five to eight percent of the anthropogenic CO2 emissions are associated with the production of uh, Portland cement. So we want to look for sustainable alternatives, and one of these is the production of binders by alkali activation. Okay, so we start from a uh, uh, different kind of uh, uh, aluminum silicate uh, uh, powders. And by using uh, uh, alkaline solution, we can uh, induce, as you can see on this uh, side here, the basically the poly uh, polymerization of the aluminum silicate ne uh, network, dissolution of the powder. And when the solution becomes uh, Super saturated uh, enough, we induce the uh, formation of these reaction products called uh, uh, NASH, NASH because it's a, a sodium aluminum silicate uh, uh, hydrate, which is the product, uh, product that uh, gives uh, uh, cohesive properties to the uh, material. Okay, so this kind of alkali activated materials are also known as uh, uh, geopolymers. I'm taking a step uh, uh, back to the uh, from the moon to the uh, Earth, as I said in the uh, first presentation. It's uh, well, it's ideally we want to uh, give an idea of uh, what is also the impact on the Earth that we uh, can have with this uh, uh, space uh, research. Now, to give you an idea of the amount of uh, raw materials uh, extracted. Uh, each year, you can see from this uh, plot, maybe the uh, resolution is not uh, uh, optimal, but you can uh, uh, download the, uh, freely this uh, from this uh, cir uh, circular gap report uh, 2020. So which tells us that every year, uh, approximately 100 billion tons of uh, raw materials are uh, uh, extracted. Here on the left, you can see all the different uh, categories of materials. So approximately 40% of them are industrial minerals. On the right, you see the, the, all the different industrial uh, uh, sectors that are fed. And also you can see basically the construction sector incorporates uh, approximately, again, 40% of this extracted uh, raw materials, okay? So you can see that top of this overall uh, stock of materials, only 10% of them are uh, recycl uh, recycled. So definitely we can do better by implementing this in situ resource uh, utilization approach also on the earth. Okay, so this uh, uh, geopolymer technology can be utilized also to use a different kind of uh, industrial uh, uh, waste, such as uh, fly ash that you can see here. So fly ash is a residue from uh, uh, coal uh, combustion. It can also be an hazardous uh, uh, material. Here you can see this event occurred a few years ago in the US when some of this uh, fly ash spilled uh, from a containment uh, uh, pond and contaminated the environment. Okay, but if you collect uh, uh, fly ashes, it makes up a nice reactive uh, uh, powder made up of uh, uh, amorphous uh, silico uh, aluminate particles. And when activated using alkaline solution, it can lead to the formation of uh, uh, hardened material that can reach uh, uh, mechanical strength, so compressive strength, uh, up easily up to 100 uh, megapascal. Okay, so we have seen uh, similar uh, graphs uh, uh, before. 
So I said also in the uh, previous presentation, we want to aim at uh, uh, those samples of our regolith containing a larger amount of uh, amorphous gas, with, uh, amorphous glass, which is uh, more uh, reactive in alkaline uh, solution, such as those, for example, in uh, in the highland uh, basalts. And in general, uh, also the bulk composition of our regolith is quite similar to those of uh, uh, fly ashes, although fly ash is more amorphous, so fly ash makes up an, a nice analog to see what we can expect by the alkaline activation of uh, lunar regoliths. Okay, these are some uh, pre preliminary uh, study that was uh, carried out in a uh, collaboration with the Oswald uh, University in uh, Norway and the European Space uh, uh, Agency in which we carried out a uh, uh, test by uh, alkali activation of a lunar regolith uh, sim uh, simulants, and we want to test the extrudability of these uh, uh, materials, okay? So what we got, we saw that uh, the uh, flowability of the material improved when we added small amounts of uh, urea, and the rationale, of course, is that of uh, obtaining the urea from uh, by extraction from the uh, urine of the settlers of the moon uh, basis, and also we can show that the demand of water reduced uh, proportionally to the amount of uh, urea added. Okay, so here you can see some uh, results from a rotational uh, viscometry uh, in which again we see that the viscosity is uh, reduced as the amount of uh, uh, urea is, is increased. And again, also on the left, we can see how we, the demand of uh, water is re reduced proportional to the amount of uh, urea. Okay, this result was uh, published in a couple of uh, papers. And the next step is that of uh, moving towards uh, foamed materials. Okay, so we want to improve the thermal uh, prover properties of these uh, structural units. So the idea is to implementing different kind of approach to, uh, to obtain these uh, uh, solid foams. This is an example from a, a foam obtained by our uh, partners of uh, ICMATE. So I don't have the time to go into the details, but uh, there are different kinds of approach by which you can obtain solid uh, foams uh, with alkali activated materials. This is another example. You can see here an animation from 3D tomography of this foam materials obtained by addition of uh, aluminum uh, powders that release hydrogen in alkaline solutions, so creating these uh, bubbles. Okay, so just to conclude, so the uh, specific objectives of this uh, uh, GLAMS project is the uh, design and optimization of the base formulation, then the optimizing of the forming uh, uh, process to obtain an optimal uh, uh, form stability, validating of the extrusion based uh, uh, 3D printing process in the lab, realization of a scaled uh, prototype, and finally the application of sensors to monitor the uh, micrometeoritic impact on these uh, uh, elements. Okay, so just to uh, conclude, I wanted to show that, that this, uh, our studies uh, received quite some uh, resonance in the generalist uh, uh, press. There were this is a couple of examples of uh, magazines, Forbes and, uh, uh, Forbes and Wire, which cited our study. So we hope that uh, this will uh, happen soon. And uh, hopefully there will be no need of uh, implementing the training that uh, Matthias Mayer was, uh, Maurer was mentioning uh, yesterday about uh, broken uh, toilets. And uh, thanks for your attention. Thank you. I'll just stay here. Uh, Juli Julian, if you come and join us. Uh, we have a few minutes for questions before we move on. So are there any questions for any of the speakers? It's going, it's going. Okay, not yet, come. Right. Um, oh, oh, yeah. Excuse me. Um, 
Tom Orlando from Georgia Tech. Um, I had a question with regard to the laser sintering and what power densities you were using and whether or not you could potentially reach those with um, focused solar light, because that's going to be more readily available and won't require power. Okay, so um, for the first part about the density, uh, we used the, um, the aim is not to, to compress the powder at the beginning, so it's a loose powder. So it's about uh, 1.24 grams per centimeter. No, no, a po power density. The, the ah, yeah, sorry, sorry. So, uh, yeah, it was quite quick, but we had uh, 10 kilojoules per, per gram of, uh, of frigorif. So this is average for this kind of uh, technology. And for the second part of the question, of course, we have thought about using concentrated solar light. It's possible. But we wanted at the beginning to start with an uh, identified technology that is already being used, see how it works, and then talking about more, uh, let's say, uh, disruptive ways to, to do the work. But first, we wanted to focus on the effect of the material, and then we'll be able to talk about uh, using solar light. Yeah. But we are thinking about it. Any other? No, then James, you should make your way down here. They, is there one question? Is there a question online, Anna? Did you see? Oh, yeah. um, Alice Cushion, um, University of Michigan. I just had a very quick question for Luca. Where did the 27 day sort of lifespan of the material come from? That's not a lifespan. It, it, it was just the. the Lunar day. Right. It but was just to say that there's a, you know, we can expect that. Really oh, sorry. I mean, so I thought it was, that was the planned lifespan for the material. Sorry. Thank you. Okay. I think uh, we need to move on. And Martin, hope that uh, you didn't have any further problem. You can hear us. Everybody has been speaking in mic or trying to speak in the mic. So let us know if you continue to have problems. So let's thank the the speakers uh, for this panel and then move on to the next one. Thank you. Hello, uh, I'm James Paul. I'm going to be present uh, chairing the next session, which is ICU with water and oxygen. So is Thomas Mike Sell? Yeah. Yep. Okay. Cool. Take it away. I'll give you a quick Okay. Thank you. Good morning, everybody. Um, first off, thank you to the uh, conveners for giving me the opportunity to present via presentation rather than poster. It'll make a lot of the videos a lot more enjoyable. Um, and then secondly, I would like to just thank um, the big list of co-authors. Um, I'm going to talk today about a lot of geotechnical work that we've been doing in Norway at the Norwegian Geotechnical Institute. And it's taken a lot of people to build up our knowledge in this lunar area over the last two years. So in particular, Alex Gervais has worked on a lot of the simulations that you're going to see today. He's now at the Inspire Institute in Ecuador. And Santiago Quinteros has been running a lot of our lab work. Um, so what you're looking at here is a... Uh, a simulation of a, a cylinder filled with what we call digital grains, but these are real um, grains that come from CT scans of Apollo 14 sample 14163. And this is a very common experiment that we do in geotechnics called the angle of repose. So you tip the cylinder over 45 degrees, you let it sit there for four seconds, you tip it back up, and then you look at the angle that the material leaves. Um, and so this this angle is dependent on the size and the shapes of the grains. It's not necessarily equivalent to what we call the internal friction angle, which tells us about the, the maximum shear strength uh, that granular materials can sustain. And it has a wide range of applications. So for example, the previous speaker just talked about flowability. Um, but <clears throat> this sort of tells you about, you know, in the loosest state of the soil, angles greater than this, the material will flow rather than be in a solid state. And so I'll just give you the highlight of the talk right now, but we've been studying 
how these materials behave using lab measurements to calibrate numerical simulations, which are digital twins. Um, and this is just an example showing what happens to this particular experiment if we vary the gravity. And this is interesting because you see that this angle increases. And on Earth, there's this very simple relationship that people have used for a long time where you take the roundness of the grains, the average roundness, and that'll tell you the angle of repose. There's no gravity in that relationship. And so if we're going to take things like this that we've learned over years of doing geotechnical work on the moon or on Earth, sorry, and apply it to the moon, we need to think about some other things that maybe haven't been thought of in the past. And we know that um, we see this kind of high uh, angle of repose because of stuff that we learned in the 70s with Apollo and Luna. So this is just an example of a small excavation with a very steep pit telling us that this soil has high cohesion. Okay, so quickly about NGI, since lots of people maybe have never heard of us, we're new to getting into the space stuff, um, but we're a geotechnical group. We're headquartered in Oslo, uh, but we also have offices in Perth and Houston and all around the world. Um, I work in the natural hazards group, but we have uh, quite a few people throughout the Institute that are just interested in lunar stuff. So there's about 20 of us that have been doing things over the last couple of years. Our main goal is to make solutions for industry and society so that we live and build on safe ground. And this cartoon in the upper right is all the different types of infrastructure things that we do on Earth. And we've slowly been thinking about what we could do on the moon. Uh, and so here's a, a new graph we made. And with that, I would just like to thank uh, the two groups that have been sponsoring this research, um, the Norwegian Research Council and the Space Agency in Norway for the last two years. So moving on. Um, we've seen lots of talks now about Mara and Highland simulants. Normally, when we talk about simulants and thinking about what we want to do on Earth in terms of geotechnical properties and using those as analogs, we categorize things into these two things. But I think over the last couple of days, we've all seen the regolith is much more heterogeneous. Um, and I'm not convinced that just using those two is a good way to define or describe all the geotechnical properties that we might encounter up there. Um, all of the information that we currently have geotechnically comes from these landing sites, either experiments that were done there or return samples. And this is just a nice, not true color image, but I like to look at it and say, just by eye, have we sampled all the different colors? No way. Um, so there's a lot to be learned still by collecting samples in all these other areas. Uh, so what we do know, I just said, we've done geotechnical experiments seismic experiments, et cetera, on the moon. We've also brought back lots of samples and studied those in the lab. Um, and I think it's important to keep in mind that upcoming missions are going to provide new in-situ data and potentially return samples. So I do think as a community, we should argue for return samples that we can continue to analyze because a lot of the geotechnical work done in the 70s, the methods have changed dramatically since then on terrestrial applications. We have new types of standards and we do a much better job um, so with that in mind, NGI's focus right now is to just improve geotechnical characterization of simulants and try to get ourselves ready so that we could be partners in analyzing future return samples. And we're doing that through the lab and through simulation. And so I'll just quickly talk about the lab and then we'll go on to the simulation stuff. But the interesting thing from a geotechnical point of view is considering the in-situ stresses that we're going to encounter on the lunar surface when we go up there and do things anything we want to do, move it around, um, beneficiate it, with, um, whatever. Um, the, the interesting thing is because of the low gravity, we have very low effective stresses. So um, within the top few meters, we only get up to effective stresses of a few kPa. That's quite different than on Earth. Um, and so what we've had to do, this is just a list of what we've currently achieved. Um, but we do advanced testing. These are different types of strength tests that we do on granular materials. And we can get down to one kPa for an odometer, odometer, but then let's say down only to 10 kPa for a triaxial cell. And part of that is just we can't, the end caps of a triaxial cell are too big right now. And so if we want to go to lower effective stresses, we have to kind of actually just redesign all of our hardware and rebuild things. So Aside from the lab, I'm going to talk today about simulations, and the reason for that is because of the lunar environment. 
Um, so internally, we call this the Salino technical environment or Salino technics because it's quite different than Earth. You know, so this idea that it's just a one-to-one -one geotechnics is going to work on the moon, I'm not convinced that's true. Uh, here's just a list, low pressure, low humidity, low gravity, and extreme temperatures. Materials behave much differently in this environment. Uh, and in addition to that, we have a, a very different, let's say, weathering or modification processes that we don't get on Earth. And so back to this idea of two simulants, we talk about high fidelity simulants, the Mare and Highlands, and then really expensive simulants where you actually try to incorporate agglutinites and some of these other interesting things that come from these weathering processes. So for us, the question is, how can we account for this or how do we account for this? And so <clears throat> in a very quick way, I'll just say what we're doing are building these digital twins of lunar soils. To build this digital twin, we use a method called the 3D level set discrete element method, 3D LSDM for short. What this allows us to do is micromechanics at the grain scale, and we can do multi-physics micromechanics. So this is uh, just some highlights, but on the left, you're seeing two negatively charged particles and a positively charged particles following uh, electrostatic forces. We can incorporate this now into our physics. Um, this one in the center is grain breakage. So the walls are moving in on this and you're going to break the grains. This is very important actually because of the very interesting um, shapes that you see on the lunar regolith. And on the right was a video showing thermal expansion uh, and heat transfer. And this is now a combination of 3D LSDM plus finite element modeling that we haven't published anything on, but Alex has been working on this for the last couple of months. So digital twins, the idea is that we can do something in the lab, we can calibrate one of these um, simulation models, and then we can go and we can change the boundary conditions, we can change the effective stresses, we can change the strain rates so that these materials go from, uh, let's say, solid to non-Newtonian. Um, and this is just an example of sand, an example of 2300 LHS1 silt grains uh, on the right at slower strain rates in a compression test. And it's just to show you what we're talking about, this is a nano CT scan image here. So there's a bunch of these silt grains, so smaller than 60 microns, in a nano CT scan at the University of Oslo. And this is just an example of uh, some slices of the micro CT that we have in our facility and then the nano CT at the dental school at the University of Oslo that we've been collaborating with. Um, so I'm going to come to this last thing really quick. But because we can analyze all the shapes with these digital grains, it allows us to do some very interesting characterization. So on the bottom, you see histograms of LHS1 compared to Apollo 11 and Apollo 14 samples that we got from our collaborators in NIST. And it's showing you, let's say, size properties, diameter, volume to surface ratio, and volume. We match those very well with the simulants. On top, you see grain shapes. You see roundness, aspect ratio, and sphericity. Those we actually don't match so well. And this comes down to, again, this grain uh, formation process, this modification. And these images on the right are just some of the examples. You get really interesting grain shapes that you wouldn't find on Earth, where we have aeolian erosion processes, things get smoothed down over time. And so all of these need to be taken into account when we're doing the geotechnical strength properties because they change the internal friction. And these are just some videos of um, some of the Apollo samples. And I'll just end with this last slide. Uh, if you take all of these let's say terrestrial and simulants and you plot them in their minimum void ratio, so their densest state, their maximum void ratio, their loosest state, and you compare those to all the Apollo samples, you see that they actually don't line up. And so this is a paper that we have in review right now, but trying to look at what are the differences and there's now starting to understand and maybe be able to incorporate in simulations. That's it. Thanks. Um, now is Maria Francesca Cecchi, hopefully that's how I said that right, who will be talking about plant growth in lunar simulants.
Hello everyone, my name is Mary Francesca and today I will talk about my project that I developed at the International Space University. It's a project of three months where I had the possibility to compare the plant growth between the hydroponic system and self-watering pots with lunar regolith. So this project comes from the necessity of a sustainable environment for the human set future human settlement on the moon. So we need food, uh, food resources, and this means that we need space gardens. So the aim of this project is to analyze and compare the evolution of the lettuce in hydroponic and regulative based systems in a closed environment. There is the she environment, so the self-deployable habitat for extreme environments at the International Space University, where uh, I had the possibility to control variables as the carbon dioxide, the temperature, and the humidity. The first system that I compared is the self watering pot with lunar regolith. Uh, so basically, these pots were connected to a solution with the fertilizer. And as a reference, I use the same system, but also with traditional soil. These systems were compared uh, with a nutrient field technique hydroponic system that is particularly suitable for long duration missions. Uh, and it's a closed loop that um, helps, uh, that uh, guarantees a low risk of contamination of both the human uh, environment habitat and uh, the uh, lunar environment itself. So what, what, for what concerns the choice of plants, I decided to take into consideration not only logistic um, uh, points of view. So for example, the time of sprouting or um, the resistance of the plants, but also possible um, benefits for the astronauts. For example, I chose the lettuce of the good gardener and the Batavian lettuce because they have important properties as antioxidant power and high content in multiple vitamins. So in my experiment, I control multiple variables as the radiation, the fertilization, uh, fertilizer con concentration and the pH. And as a result, I analyze the number of grown plants, number of leaves per plant, the average area, um, and the total area per plant, and also the refractance, but I will tell you why. First of all, uh, the seeds were irradiated of uh, X-rays uh, from uh, zero to two grays, uh, as you can see here. And uh, I compared the percentage of grown plants with the type of wavelength. That is the blue, blurred, and red case. As we can see, the blue and blue red case have a higher percentage of grown plants with respect to the red case. This is, however, probably due to a lower amount of water that was in the red case. But if we go back to the blue and blue red case, we see that we have a higher percentage of grown plants for uh, zero um, for lower uh, radiation uh, doses with respect to the higher radiation doses. This means uh, that probably the radiation induced damages increases with the increased dose of radiation. But now if we want to compare the uh, three different systems, so the hydroponic system in orange, uh, the regolith one in azure, uh, and the traditional one in green, we can see I compare the percentage of grown plants with the lead intensity. Uh, in three different ranges, the uh, low range, medium range, and high range. So in the case of the low range, unfortunately, I had just the uh, hydroponic system data, but for the medium and the high range, uh, I had the possibility to see that in general, the traditional, so the green case, uh, traditional pots have a lower performance with respect to other two, two others. Uh, and the regolith one are higher performance with respect to the hydroponic in the medium range and is the upside in the high range. I also um, evaluated the average number of leaves per plant um, with respect to the lead intensity as before. And in this case, the regolith um, plants seem to be better performant with respect to the hydroponic system. 
Same discussion for the average leaf area. So the area of the plant, the leaves were uh, approximated to uh, rectangles for a bare measurement uh, and comparison. And here we can clearly see that the hydroponic system is way better performant than the regolith one. But at the end of the day, we don't want to know uh, just the average area or the number of leaves, but the total amount of um, uh, plants, the, of leaves that we can eat uh, for the future explorations. So I multiply the average area per the average number of leaves to have the total area of leaves per plant. And here we can clearly see that the um, hydroponic system is perform way better performing than the regolith one. But at the end of the day, it's not important just the quantity, but also the quality. So I performed a qualitative analysis of, uh, the, um, of the spectrum of the reflectance of my plants. Uh, and here we can see a zoom in the red edge. There is uh, an indicator of the absorbance of the chlorophyll. And here, um, if uh, I have tree spectrum from the regolith based plants in pink and the hydroponic system in blue, we can see that uh, the uh, regolith plants have a um, blue shift, so a shift toward blue uh, wavelengths. And this means that this is often associated to the presence of metals uh, in the plants and therefore associated to a lower, um, less healthy plants. Therefore, um, this indicates that probably um, the plants in the regolith pots are less healthy than the hydroponic system. Therefore, um, we can say that uh, the radiation induced damage increases with the increasing of the dose. Um, and also the important results, uh, very important and interesting result is that uh, the total area the, of edible leaves that we, that we can give to the astronaut is um, better performing for the hydroponic system and also the healthy uh, of uh, healthiness of the plants is better in the case of the hydroponic system due to the probably contamination of metals for the regolith plants. For future works, uh, is, is suggested to do an homogeneous uh, light, uh, a higher number of samples, and a more advanced spectrometer. So thank you very much for the attention. Uh, thank you. I'm now going to introduce myself, so that's quite fun. Uh, yeah, so my name is James Cole. I'm a PhD student at the Open University in the United Kingdom. And for the last couple of years, I've been working on using microwave heating to extract water ice from lunar simulants. So as we've heard over the last couple of days and over the last few years, uh, one of the key aspects of ISIU would be to create lunar derived rocket propellant. There's a few reasons for that. Um, so it would possibly create a sustainable cislunar economy through the use of uh, resupplying satellites in cislunar space, moving crew and cargo up from the lunar surface, and even possibly in the future um, to, create, uh, to create missions that go to further des destinations. And one of the best sources on the lunar surface for this would be water due to its uses in uh, liquid hydrogen and liquid oxygen systems. And as we've also already heard, um, the lunar poles are thought to contain quite vast amount of water ice, especially in the South Pole. And these would be forming in PSRs, at least the ones that are less than 110 Kelvin, which is the vital point at which any water ice that's been delivered to these regions would be stable and would be would stay there. Uh, L-cross is the only in situ result we've got. Um, so it's about 5.6 weight percent water ice. And... Um, but remote sensing indicates that it could be even as high as 30 weight percent in certain regions of PSRs. 
My research is looking at, is microwave heating the best way to gather this ice in very inhospitable regions with no sunlight at very low temperatures? So I'm just going to quickly go over microwave heating and why it's of interest in the first place. Um, so as we know, our most traditional techniques rely on conductive heating. So you have a hot region that the heat transfers through the medium to, towards the colder regions. This is a bit of an issue with uh, lunar regolith due to the fact it's got very low thermal conductivity. So if you want to heat a large area, it takes a, quite a long time. Microwave heating, on the other hand, with the use of electromagnetic waves, polar molecules that are in the sample will rotate back and forth and they this creates kinetic energy and therefore heat and can do so quite efficiently and can uh, heat up the entire volume at once. The equation on the top um, is it highlights the two sorts of key factors in, in all of this. You've got your the capital E, uh, which is the electric field, which essentially just means if you put more power into your microwave source, you'll heat up more area uh, or heat up more quick, quickly. And then you've also got your epsilon, which is your dielectric loss factor. It's a material property. It's reliant on frequency and temperature and is quite different for each material. Um, the important thing to say here is that lunar regolith actually has a very high uh, dielectric loss factor, which means heating is efficient. Uh, and that's why it's been used for sintering and 3D printing experiments is we can get to molten temperatures really quickly using microwave heating. The issue arises in that the dielectric loss factor for water ice is actually really low, even though it's very high for liquid water, it's actually really low for water ice. So my research is looking into how does the addition of water ice to lunar simulants affect the overall heating profile and therefore the water extraction. So to the experiments themselves, um, I've prepared samples using what's known as the permafrost technique. You add water to a lunar simulant, you let it diffuse through, and then you uh, heat it down, uh, cool it down, sorry, to uh, 100 Kelvin. Uh, I used water contents between 3 and 12 or 15 weight percent. Basically, I went up to the saturation point of the simulant I was using. Uh, and there's a few reasons for this. The main one is that we, you know, these PSRs aren't going to be a consistent water content throughout them. So I want to check how does the microwave heating effect get affected by different water contents? Is it better suited to be certain regions of PSRs? And then I also used two different simulants. So I used uh, LMS and LHS from Exolith. And there's two reasons for this. So firstly, Mare simulants always have higher titanium and iron contents. And for um, sintering experiments in the high temperature domain, this seems to suggest that the uh, heating profile is more efficient and Mari uh, simulants always reach the uh, molten point uh, in a quicker uh, fashion. Um, so I wanted to check, does this exist at colder temperatures? And also there's, um, you know, especially at the South Pole, we're not really sure what the composition of these sites is going to be. And so I went for the two sort of end member cases of Mare and Highland to check, again, what are the effects of simulant composition on the overall extraction? Uh, so as Mahesh has already said earlier, we do have a bespoke uh, microwave system at the Open University, which allows us to heat up um, samples uh, in, a, in a vacuum environment. So I used 250 watt microwaves. I was going for the lower end of the what, what's possible with our system. And the main reason for this is I wanted to use, you know, what could be possible with a modern day uh, rover or lander platform. Um, and then I, I heated them up for about 35 minutes initially and about 90% of the water was extracted. That's the first result is that we, we'd extracted water from these samples at a lower power than ever been done before. Uh, but then I reduced it to 25 minutes as I wanted it to be in a point where we could compare the extraction throughout all the different sample types and different water contents. Uh, and yes, yeah, so we did these experiments at three millibar and through the use of uh, spectral identification and some mass spectrometry, we were able to identify that yes, it was the water vapor that was being produced. So the, uh, the figure on the bottom right with the, um, the purple plasma is actually the water vapor being produced. And um, yeah, so that's that's that. Oh, I should say that extraction in this case is measured simply by comparing the mass before and after heating. So to the results, so on your right, you can see a graph of water content along your x-axis and the water extracted in grams on your y-axis. The first thing to note here is that it's a bit difficult to explain, but the difference is the Highland Simmons and the Mare seem to have different extraction profiles. This isn't quite true. So when you're using the microwave system, uh, there's normally an average absorbed power that's going into these samples. And 
the Highland sample, we were able to get a higher average absorbed power. So when we were heating them for 25 minutes, the actual differences in input energy was significant. So what I did to sh show this was I did a 30 minute run. So I just did an uh, input energy calculation. And what this showed was that if you can see this black data point, it lies perfectly on the Highland simulant line. So what I'm trying to show here is that the simulant composition doesn't really have that much effect on extraction, which is quite surprising given what happens when you're going at the higher temperatures. Um, and so what it indicates is that a microwave payload on the lunar surface, especially in these PSRs, wouldn't need to be as careful with what the composition would be. Uh, and then if you go along the x-axis, what you can see is that as you add more water, unsurprisingly, you get more water out. However, the really surprising thing we found is that at the near the saturation points of both simulants, the extraction actually drops. This really wasn't what we were expecting. Um, and I'm going to talk about that in the next slide. Uh, but really overall, what we found is that the heating time and energy input is crucial to maximizing your water extraction. So yeah, so what what we our theory about what's happened here is that before the saturation point, when you're filling the pore space with the liquid water before you freeze it, there's still space. So when the water expands as it freezes, the grains stay in contact. And the important thing to remember here is that the simulant grains are, are what heating up because they're they in, uh, interact with the microwaves more strongly. And by uh, having this contact, you get more efficient heat transfer and therefore your water extraction continues. At the saturation point, however, the pore space is then filled. So when it expands, you get the grains pushing apart. That reduces the contact area. And possibly more importantly, you get these regions of free ice forming. The water ice really doesn't interact with the um, microwaves at all. And therefore, these regions of free ice can actually be maintained. And therefore, that's why you get this drop off in extraction. Overall, this suggests that um, microwave heating might be better suited to low to medium ice deposits uh, on the lunar surface. Uh, yeah, so just in summary, um, we found that microwave heating can be used to extract water from cryogenic samples. We've done it at a lower power threshold than that's been done before. Uh, we found that compositional changes are not that important at lower temperatures for microwave heating. And that at the saturation point, uh, this leads to quite a significant drop in the extraction. So for these points where we think there might be 30 weight percent of water, this effect could be even more pronounced and might be, be more of an issue. So microwave heating overall might be better suited for low to medium uh, ice deposits. And all of this work can be found in a paper in Actor Astronautica that was published a couple of months ago. Um, so yeah, that's, that's me. Hey, up next is Michelle Lavagna, who I think is online. Yeah, yeah I'm online. Can you hear okay. me? Yeah, we can hear you. Yeah, perfect. Can I share my screen? Yes, you can. Can you see it? Yes, yeah, we can see your slides. Okay, so if I can, I start. Yep, go ahead. Okay, thanks. So uh, first of all, uh, good morning, everybody, and thank you for giving me the possibility to do this uh, uh, online. Uh, first of all, I want to uh, just uh, uh, acknowledge uh, the co-authors, uh, uh, the team that is in Politecnico di Milano working, uh, working on this uh, topic, and the team from OHP Italia and OHP uh, System from Germany uh, that uh, were part of the consortium for uh, the work to uh, build up a demo plant for the carbothermal reaction for um, for the water extractions for from simulants, of course, uh, from the lunar soil, and, um, and then running the experiments. So, so very quickly, just to contextualize uh, what I'm going to say, the drivers for our work were to identify a process that was uh, possibly efficient, of course, uh, that allows the recycling uh, the products into the reactants, so, so minimize the mass from the earth uh, as uh, it is uh, uh, of course, uh, uh, trivial, uh, that could be scalable uh, up and down and, and quite uh, robust and uh, uh, to be automized. So with the uh, uh, intervene of the human beings at the least, so to leave the time for uh, of the astronauts uh, free for others. So it has been said uh, uh, many times in uh, these days, uh, uh, the compositions and the materials that we have as availability from the feedstocks from the 
uh, on the moon. So I don't want to spend uh, uh, time on that. I just want to point out that we focused on, uh, of course, uh, the fact that we have quite a large amount of uh, silicon-based uh, group of oxides, of course, uh, and we want to work with the dry regolith that is almost uh, 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 everywhere on the surface. So uh, very briefly, uh, just uh, synthesizing uh, the hula, and uh, as it, it is well known in the community, the focus went on uh, basically two categories of process. One is the thermochemical and the other one is the electrochemical, with the three uh, uh, possibilities uh, that are uh, nowadays quite, uh, uh, let's say, visited by many, many groups in, in Europe and not only, that is the hydrogen reductions and the carbothermal reductions from the thermochemical point of view and the electrochemical, uh, sorry, and the molten uh, salts from the electrochemical uh, point of view with focus, of course, in this case of the gases that are produced. So uh, the CO, CO2 and, uh, um, and, and the water itself, of course, uh, or directly oxygen extraction. So just comparing some, some of the criteria that we considered with respect to the hydrogen and the molten, that are those that we are not visited in our experiments. So we focus on the fact that, um, of course, sorry, these are not necessarily limitations, but point to, uh, to focus on, that we focused on. Uh, the first is the limitation on the kind of materials that you can use for the hydrogen and the results on the yield up to now uh, through testing lab while for the uh, molten salts, uh, uh, the fact that there are uh, uh, still some criticalities under uh, analysis uh, with respect to the recycling, with respect to the tiles uh, uh, preparation for, uh, for the electrolyte uh, 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 boxes, let's say. So uh, we uh, made the decision to go to the uh, uh, carbothermal reduction. Why? Because uh, at the terrestrial level is quite well known and there is a high yield. Uh, of course, it works with a, a molten uh, um, feedstock uh, because the scope is not the uh, gases uh, collection. Uh, it is uh, uh, quite uh, uh, robust, uh, let's say, if we see uh, at the moon because it's uh, independent from the landing side, as we know, uh, it could work with almost every species. Uh, uh, but as the drawbacks uh, uh, to have a high temperature and to have uh, the molten uh, products to be dealt with. So what we uh, did uh, was to focus on uh, avoiding molting, uh, melting, sorry, the uh, the feedstock, uh, staying with a lower, even even if it's high temperature. So we work in the 1200 uh, Celsius, uh, roughly speaking, uh, limiting the moving part. So fluidized the bed, but with no uh, moving mechanically speaking parts. So for simplification, to be scalable and to have the possibility to re-inject uh, uh, the uh, uh, the uh, products, uh, gases speaking in the cycle, so to uh, to be a sort of almost closed loop. So this is the scheme of the uh, of the plant somehow. So we have uh, one cycle of the uh, carbothermal reduction with a mixture of methane and hydrogen that is followed. Uh, uh, by uh, by a Sabatier reaction to arrive to the water, but in the carbothermal reduction we uh, we uh, alternate fluxes of uh, the mixture of hydrogen and methane and a washing phase with hydrogen only to uh, facilitate uh, the uh, CO and the coker removal uh, fixed on the particles and have uh, pristine materials to work with uh, again. So you see uh, the main reactor uh, to get the CO and CO2, uh, the methanation to get to the water, uh, and then the condenser, of course, uh, to uh, separate uh, the uh, interesting product to the waste that are uh, then in principle recycled. Uh, the experiments that we uh, did so far has no recycling, uh, but the work that we are doing, doing uh, so far identified a way to, and we are uh, preparing the uh, the uh, breadboard in the lab uh, for for doing also the recycling of the uh, exhausted mi mix. A snapshot on what we did. Uh, so we run in parallel, uh, thanks to uh, the support of the uh, European space agencies, the numerical um, identifications and then uh, verifications of uh, first of all uh, the thermodynamics, but then also the chemical kinetics. Uh, both for the main reactors and for the uh, methanation, so for uh, the second stage uh, to get to the water. And here you have some snapshot of the work done left to right uh, 
uh, numerical and modeling uh, up to the uh, finalizations of the plan. And then I would like, of course, uh, to run to the experiment. So this is the plant, of course, is not uh, the scale uh, to fly. Uh, the scope and the goal was to manage uh, at, the, at the maximum uh, one uh, kilos of, uh, uh, of simulants. So every, everything is cut, uh, just the condenser uh, right uh, uh, part of the slides is, uh, is a custom uh, done in lab. Um, uh, and we have the main furnace, uh, 1200 uh, uh, degrees uh, with the pit salts and the fluxing of the uh, two gases and the washing one we do just the hydrogen. Then, um, then of course the rack with everything uh, for the control. Uh, the uh, methanation uh, um, uh, for NASA, 250 degrees for activating the, uh, um, the process, uh, and then uh, the condensation at uh, minus 50 degrees in the fridge. Uh, of course, uh, we characterize our simulants. We work at the most uh, we, with, uh, um, uh, with islands, uh, so nothing uh, peculiar to say, just to show you that uh, we went uh, through the mineralogic characterizations, the uh, DSC for understanding the melting point and staying below, the feasibility of that uh, with some uh, TGA test before, and then uh, of course also a bit of flowability for discharging and discharging uh, the reactor before and after the process. Now getting to the results, minutes. that is the most important part. Sorry. Um, mm -hmm. These are the sensitivity analysis that we conducted. So on the simulant mass, on the mixers of the gases, so on the temperature, of course, and then in the second, second bunch of, uh, of experiments, the, um, the uh, ratio between the simulants and the gas that was quite fundamental, uh, the durations of the single batch, the fluidizations, and uh, whether we need the beneficiations of no, of no, or not. So in synthesis, in this uh, table, you can have uh, and you see synthesized uh, all the parameters that we tuned uh, and how. Uh, so starting with uh, a smaller uh, mass getting to the kilos and then coming back to uh, a very few uh, tens of gram, that was the best results that we got. We couldn't uh, uh, control uh, the, um, uh, uh, let's say, the uh, the, uh, the increase of the flux of the gaseous reactant. And so uh, to analyze that point, uh, we reduced the mass and we found out that was really beneficial. And at the very uh, right uh, part of the, uh, of the uh, uh, table uh, is the result that is the most interesting. So the recovery, recovery yield with respect to the overall mass of the feedstock and the recovery yield with respect to the oxygen that was present in the uh, pristine uh, feedstock. Um, they, I, I just uh, reported an example of the, uh, of the of one batch um, uh, evolution with different uh, color lines that represents different uh, uh, tuning that we did, uh, just to highlight the effects on the concentrations of the main reactor output, that is the CO, that is then the trace of having the oxygen, uh, the water at this point, because we didn't put the electrolysis afterwards, but uh, uh, the, the, uh, the water that we got. And you can, you can see uh, the uh, uh, negative slope uh, in the in mixer part uh, uh, for the carbothermal reduction. And at the end of it, the, uh, the, um, the, the fluxations of the hydrogen only. And when you see this step is, of course, uh, the mixer uh, starting again. And so uh, the step uh, let's say, uh, witnesses uh, the bene benefits of having the fluxations of the hydrogen to uh, recover the concentrations and starting, of course, with decreasing peaks, uh, but higher uh, with respect to the end of the fluxation. Um, uh, so what I uh, would like to uh, uh, show the more uh, in this um, chart, uh, the rest All of right, the same, I... just concentrate on the, I'm, I'm finishing, okay. uh, on, the, on the graph. Um, the effects of the uh, of the uh, hydrogen fluxation. So it is important to have an hydrogen fluxation quite long with respect to the mixer that is beneficial for the results. So getting getting to the very final uh, slides so that uh, to be fast. Uh, this is the visualizations of, of what we get in terms of water and the fact that uh, 
the wasted material is quite uh, uh, fluent, so easy to be discharged. And with that, we also run, not at the level of the uh, former uh, speaker, but we run some laser uh, melting, um, sorry, um, selective laser melting techniques uh, for, uh, for 3D printing that uh, gave good results as uh, in line with what has been presented before, just uh, small bricks uh, that we produced and we tested in terms of uh, strength, uh, as uh, mentioned before. Beneficiation, we did some tests also uh, selecting uh, the grain size, but as you can see from, from the graphs, there is no uh, uh, significant variations in the yield. And so this confirmed that uh, the beneficiation is not needed uh, with this uh, kind of process. It's just a matter of a long time. And I'm concluding saying that, of course, uh, 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 the test allows us to uh, confirm uh, what we expected uh, from the theory and the numerical uh, modeling. Uh, what we have in mind to uh, keep on going is to do with the recycling, as I uh, told you before. So we are in preparations of the uh, uh, breadboarding for that part uh, because we identify the technology. And we also are uh, starting working uh, with a scaled uh, plant to demonstrate it possibly also um, with flight. So I ended up, thank you for your attention. Okay, can I ask the speakers to come down to the stage, please? Anybody have any questions? Uh, for the first speaker, um, I would like if you consider or you are studying also the electrical or electrical properties of these materials, because um, we are. <clears throat> Well, we consider, for example, or calculate the ice inside the, the grains for, for studying ice in the, in the regulator. We use uh, um, typical mixing formulas that are based on the grains we know on Earth, like sand or other materials. So I would like to know if you have considered this or you're planning to do this. I'll just do this. So we aren't exactly planning to consider that yet. We are doing IC regolith tests now, and we're doing all of the geotechnical strength tests with different uh, water concentrations, as well as some geophysics. So we're doing ERT on this, um, but I don't think that's getting at exactly what you're interested in because it's the shape that uh, is gonna be important. And we're not doing that right now because we just have simulants. Uh, uh, sorry, just to, just to uh, clarify better. For example, for the porosity, this has uh, some effect. How do you mean on the electrical properties of the electrostatics in our simulation, or no, let's no. say electrical conductivity? The electrical conductivity, yes. Yeah, uh, I don't know actually. This is that. Yeah, EM is not my specialty. Uh, Good morning, Federico Tosi in from. I have a question for the second speaker, Francesca. Francesca, I enjoyed your presentation about the plant growth. Uh, I have a curiosity about the lunar simulants. I mean, uh, those commercial products uh, can be different from the real uh, uh, lunar regolith, uh, for example, in terms of uh, percentage of nanophase iron particles. So that there is much more iron in the real uh, lunar regolith as far as I can understand compared to the commercial ones. So uh, do you expect any change in the plant growth or do you expect to be the same? Uh, thank you for your question. Uh, it's actually a really good question because we performed the uh, experiment just with the ESC uh, 1A simulant. So it was is also in plan to do with other simulants if it is possible, and then maybe compare if there is any difference attributed to the different uh, composition of the metals of the simulants, and then eventually see if there is any change according to the iron content or other metal contents. So it's in plan. So. Okay. 
Thank you. Um, a question for James. So before the reaching saturation and having the decrease of yield, um, what sort of yield are we talking about? How much water do you recover compared to what you put in? Okay, so within in 25 minutes of heating, we were getting between 50 and 60% of the water being extracted. Um, but as I said on in the presentation, with 35 minutes of heating, you were getting 90%. Um, so with microwave heating, it's a simple thing. If you leave it long enough, it will remove pretty much all the water. Um, I have a question regarding the plant growth. Um, for the radiation uh, test that you did, was the main concern um, from radiating the seedlings to seeing how many of them actually grew out properly or were there, are there any other concerns after that regarding the usability of the crops for actual like, practical use later? Well, the main uh, uh, problem that we can see is, for example, if the plant is uh, absorbed, like eaten from the astronauts. So uh, maybe uh, we uh, didn't do um, micro, micro analysis, biological analysis of the samples. Uh, it was on plan, but it didn't go. So, uh, but we're planning to do that too, so that we are able to infer if there is actually a real difference in the composition of the plants and if this can affect the uh, astronaut health. So, yes. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, I think we'll go and have coffee. Thank you. Uh, before, before you go to coffee, just a small announcement. Uh, yesterday at the poster venue, we found a pair of Air Air AirPods, Apple AirPods, and a pair of uh, sunglasses. Check if you miss them. Uh, they are downstairs at the desk.
Janice Bishop, uh, if you want, you can do a, a screen sharing test now. Hi there. Can you hear me okay? Yes, yes, we do. Okay. Um, let me see about sharing my screen here. Um, I think, okay. I think when I've tried this before, I have to just share the whole desktop in order to have this work when I um, do a slideshow. Yeah, it's, it works. It does work? Okay, yes. let me, um, okay. And do you see like the second slide now? Yes, yes. And the third slide? Yes. Okay, so um, should I just go ahead and and share? I'm um I'm in California, so it's the middle of the night here for me. <laughs> um, internet seems to be okay. I guess you're able to um hear me and see my slides. Okay. Yes, Janice. Um, preferably you share the sc your screen, and I do have your slides. So if there's any problems, we can share them. We can pull them up and then you can say next slide, but ideally um, you control it and, and, and things will be fine. Okay. Yeah, it's probably easier if I'm doing my own slides. So um, thanks for letting me test this and it looks like it should work okay. So I feel confident. <laughs> okay, great. Thank um, you. And I, I'm just not quite sure when, um, so this link worked for the main session but I need to join a different link later uh, for my session. Is that right? No, no, you're in this. This is the link. Yeah, this is the room where you have to present. So you. Okay, so I don't need to change sessions. I can just stay here. Oh, yeah. Okay, very yep. good. Thank you. I'm so sorry I'm not there. I, I love visiting Padova and was really hoping to, but it, it just wouldn't work out this time. So. Um, I'm sure you guys are enjoying the meeting and I, I wish I were there in person. And we will have more occasions in the future, for sure. Good, good, good.
Okay, so welcome back after the coffee break uh, and welcome to this session, uh, Regolith Volatiles and Surface Processes. Um, this is a double session um, right uh, up until lunch. And uh, we have five speakers in this first block and five speakers in the next block with the Q&A in between. Our first speaker in this session is Chloe Matella of uh, Roma Tre uh, University. And she will um, talk about, can water ice be detected inside the lunar regolith by ground penetrating radar? Laurie yours. Thank you all. So um, um, regarding the presence of water ice on the moon, we have plenty of evidences nowadays. And this fact was also very well highlighted during the very first day of this conference here, but also during the first presentation um, given today. So starting from this fact, we are now interested in the detection of water ice on the moon for future missions, of course, and in situ resource utilization. So here we are trying to address several questions, like, um, you see what water ice present at some depth, and of course, how much water ice it is present. Then, um, in what form we can find water ice? Is it maybe mixed within the regolith, or maybe uh, we can find it in the form of layers, massive layers buried within the dry regolith. And of course, the most important question here is can the ground penetrating radar technique may detect water ice um, on the moon in different forms? So very briefly, uh, the GPR is an instrument that has a transmitting and receiving antenna. And while moving on top of the surface, it sends small um, electromagnetic pulses that travel through the subsurface. And when the pulse encounter a very strong contrast in terms of permittivity of the material buried at depth, um, the wave is reflected back and received by the receiving antenna. So the, the very final um, uh, product of GPR surveys are the so-called radargram as the one shown here. And what we are looking for in a radargram is basically anomalies. And in this case here, it's reported this very bright anomaly, this very bright hyperbola, which is produced by a target, buried at depth, which means that the permittivity of the target uh, presents a very, very different value of permittivity um, um, respect to the surrounding environment. So we have to very... Um, Keep in mind that for a subsequent discussion that strong electromagnetic contrasts are produced by very strong contrast in permittivity. And so related to the um, water ice detection on the moon, here I report the permittivity values of material involved in water ice detection. And as you can see here, the permittivity of water ice, lunar regolith and simulant as well, and regolith ice mixtures present very similar values of permittivity. And this fact is also very uh, well highlighted when I add to this plot the permittivity of liquid water, which is around 80 on the vertical scale. So now, if we compare the Earth and Moon environment, we clearly see a very big difference. And so the presence of liquid water on Earth in the subsurface enhances the electromagnetic contrast, make it easier to detect target burrito depth. While on the moon, since we have a very dry environment, the electromagnetic contrast might be even lower. So um, in case uh, we want to apply the GPR methodology on the moon, we have to take this fact uh, into account. So uh, in this work, we are trying to address two different scenarios about the form of water ice we can find buried within the dry regolith. The first scenario is, of course, water ice lenses or water ice layers, so a massive layer of pure water ice buried within the dry regolith. And in the second case, we have regolithized mixtures, which is basically a regolith completely saturated with liquid water, then frozen, and this frozen layer is buried within the, within the regolith. So for doing so, we conducted several experimental activities in our facility using the so-called electric box shown here on the left, so the box was filled with a material that we can consider a very good simulant, um, regolith simulant in terms of primitivity values and the electric, the electric properties. And we use the so-called glass beads. So um, on the right, you can see a picture of the, um, of the box. We use uh, the, um, this plastic grid as a reference to collect the GPR lines. 
and uh, we collected uh, GPR data in two different ways. So we first put the target uh, uh, at the center of this grid uh, below within the, the glass bits and we collect the grid uh, when the target is still frozen. Then we let the target melt uh, and we track the melting process, uh, putting the GPR on top of the grid and let the GPR acquire uh, data, um, one trace every five minutes for about five to 24 hours um, to track and follow the um, melting process. So on, where we knew that the the target is partially or totally melted, we then reacquire the GPR lines following the grid. So very briefly, uh, that's how we recreated, recreated the target. In the first scenario, we use frozen distilled water into a plastic bag. And in the second case, we use uh, um, frozen saturated glass beads. So here are the results. So first of all, I wanna show you the background acquisition when inside the the target, the, the box, there is no target at all. And here, where is the black line, uh, is a reference uh, for the reflection given by the bottom of the box. So knowing that the depth of the box is 30 centimeter, we know that uh, um, if we are looking into our radar gram for an anomaly given by the target, it should be found between 20 to 30 centimeter depth. So now, uh, what happened when we insert the first target, the frozen uh, water ice layer? We insert the water ice um, in our box. And of course, here, we don't clearly see any kind of um, anomaly into the radar gram. So in this scenario, the frozen target is not detected in this condition, in the laboratory condition. And as I mentioned before, we let the target melt and we acquire the traces every five minutes to track the melting process. And here um, in this um, figure, what is the red arrow, it's reported the very first trace acquired when the target is still frozen. And the red arrow indicates the position of the target into the box. And here, the amplitude of the signal doesn't indicate the presence of any anomaly, any target that has different permittivity values into the box. In fact, the, the amplitude of the signal is very similar to the background noise. But what happened when we let the target melt? Of course, the amplitude of the signal is enhanced by the presence of liquid water. And this fact is also very well highlighted when we required the GPR lines when the target is partially or totally melted. And here is reported the radar gram when uh, into the target uh, liquid water is present and it's clearly visible inside the our radar gram with this very bright hyperbola. So in this case, the target is detectable with the GPR only when the liquid water is present inside. So now we are addressing the second scenario, the regularized mixtures, or also called icy soil. Um, in this case, when the target is still frozen, we are able to detect it with the GPR. And in fact, into the radar gram is clearly visible on the right side, this anomaly, the, the hyperbola produced by the target itself. And the difference between this scenario with the previous one is just um, related to the permittivity contrast, which in this case, the permittivity contrast is higher compared to the previous one, which allows the detectability of the target itself. And uh, the detectability of the target in this case is even more highlighted when we let the target melt. And of course, uh, the presence of liquid water enhances uh, the reflection, giving this very, very bright hyperbola. So how we can conclude the, this work? Of course, the detectability of water ice on the moon depends on local conditions. And these are very preliminary results. But based on our results, we can say that if the uh, conditions on the moon of the regolith uh, um, led the permittivity values of the environment to be too similar to the permittivity of uh, um, pure water ice, uh, the detectability of uh, water ice in this scenario, um, the probability is too low. Um, but in the other scenario, when the, the water ice fills completely the pores within the grains of regolith and completely saturates uh, the, um, uh, the, the soil, in this case, the probability should be higher. But of course, the detectability of water ice on the moon is a very hot topic nowadays due to the in-situ resource utilization for future missions. So it is important to keep studying this topic. And of course, it requires systematic studies. 
So uh, that's, that's all. And I wanna thank you all for your attention. Thank you very much. Our next speaker is uh, Thomas Orlando, Georgia Tech. And he will speak about the role of electron irradiation in producing molecular water on the lunar surface. Okay, I want to start by thanking the organizers for an opportunity to give you an overview of some of the work we've been doing with respect to understanding water on the lunar surface. Uh, Brant Jones, who's the next speaker, has contributed significantly to this. Uh, it's also part of the uh, thesis, uh, PhD thesis of Ashley Clenenden. And um, Shri Lee at the University of Hawaii was a major contributor in particular to the uh, last part of this talk. What I want to convince you of is that we need to pay attention to electrons when we're dealing with uh, trying to understand solar wind processes. Water on the moon, there was a very good, uh, many, many talks uh, with respect to water on the moon, in particular the one right before this. There are many source terms of water, um, volcanic eruption, water from pyroclastic materials deep in the lunar interior. The abundances don't sort of uh, match that well with optical signatures, uh, and in particular, M cubed is what I'm going to be talking about. Uh, delivery by, via comets. Manesh showed a, a nice paper where there was, you know, comet delivery by impact events, meteorites, interplanetary dust particles. What I'm going to focus on is the water that's produced due to the impact event. And, and not so much myself, but uh, Brant Jones will talk about that in the next talk. I'm going to concentrate what the solar wind does, and a lot of people implicate this as a source for water. It's important to say that it's required, but not sufficient. Okay, the solar wind implants protons, but you need a second step, which is typically a temperature increase or a reactive scattering event with a hot hydrogen atom to produce water. Okay. So here's a sort of a, an overview of uh, what I would call the water and hydrogen cycle, uh, which would occur during the solar wind processing of any airless body, but in particular, the moon. So the solar wind in plants um, into a depth, this is a little bit low, it could, it's typically about 100 nanometers, and it creates very chemically stable hydroxyl termination sites and some hydrides. This is the te temperature independent. It will vary with latitude, which is following the proton flux. But what's important is that these things are chemically stable. Hydrogen that doesn't produce one of these chemically stable termination sites is lost because it's either back reflected or it's trapped as molecular hydrogen. And I mean lost with respect to the optical signature of it. And then what happens is there's a temperature excursion. Uh, so these things build up, it gives us this optical signature. And then there's a temp temperature excursion that leads to the formation of water by a process known as recombinant desorption. And so Brant Jones will tell you more about this. I will just give you a, a, a slide that he probably already has in his talk. And our, our view of this, so we're, we're, we're sort of from the physics community and surface physics community, we look at the surface. Okay, and then what, what we show here on the surface is these little white dots here, which is like a terrible color on a white background. But anyway, the little white dots are hydrogen, and then the red is oxygen, and this is sort of olivine, and you know, the yellow is magnesium, and the blue is silicon, but, but the, the top surface is hydrogen terminated. Okay, and then if I heat this up, uh, you can get these hydroxyl groups that are next to one another, interact with one another, and they can form water, and then it leaves. And so we've kinetically modeled this, and that, that's the fit of the model for the uh, water that's removed, but it's actually produced and removed during heating of regolith. This is what's happening when you do the ISRU that was talked about earlier this morning. Uh, the kinetics uh, is 
it's right at the surface submodel layer, and then when you start to center it, submodel layer or subsurface to us is one layer in. Okay, I'm not going to spend a lot of time on this, but we wanted to see uh, if we can detect this during the impact event. So this was heating. And so we know that heating occurs when there's an impact event, a micrometeorite impact event. So a lot of people simulate micrometeorite impact events by laser impact. And then they look at the reflection properties and the optical properties of the remaining material. We are doing something different. We are looking what is produced during the impact event itself. So we need some dynamic and real-time measurements and we do this with lasers. So we have a laser coming in doing the impact event and then we have another laser focused a little bit above the surface that measures the water that's released or the hydrogen that's released, or whatever other product leaves. And it's interesting because you can vary the time delay between these two impacting events or the laser hitting the surface and then the detection. And I'm not gonna go through the details because it's a little bit subtle, but what happens is there's a lot of vibrationally excited water that's produced during an impact event. And uh, that's forming by this recombinative desorption. And if it just leaves, it can't lose the energy because it, there's no collisional losses. Okay, it, the details of this is in this paper by uh, Alice. Um, we've looked at the proton and the OH plus produced by the second laser in coincidence. And we map out a velocity distribution, which is identical doing, using both coincident particles. And that's the only way you can get that is if you have the same parent and, that, and that's water. Uh, vibrationally excited. But what I want to do, and this is the crux of the talk here, is I want to change it up a little bit here because you, you, everybody will make a mistake if you think of the solar wind solely as protons irradiating the surface. And that's pretty much how it goes. Most people think the protons come in, they do all this magic, and then the water's produced. The protons come in, they implant themselves, they stay until they get moved around by a thermal spike or something else. And the other something else is the electrons. Because in a real, in the solar wind, it's a quasi-neutral plasma, which is being, you know, you have the protons and electrons bombarding the surface. So we wanna know what happens here. And I know that you can sort of short circuit this whole thing and create water and hydrogen due to an impact event, as long as there's protons that have been implanted. Okay. And so Shui and I have been talking about this for a number of years and, uh, he got together with Andrew Poppy, and uh, he's the driving force and the lead on this paper that's coming out in Nature Astronomy. This is interesting. So Andrew Poppy had a lot of the uh, data for the plasma physics in the, in the plasma sheet and the magneto tail from the Artemis program, not, not the upcoming Artemis program, the earlier one. And this is the proton, solar wind flux, as you go, as the moon moves in and out of the magneto tail. And as you go through the, the, uh, the dusk, you have a little bump in it. Then you get behind it and the, earth and the moon is completely shielded, right? So this is a really interesting scenario where if protons are doing everything, you can now see this because the protons are turned off while it's in the magneto sheet. Then it comes out and then there's a little blip of the protons and, and it goes down again, right? And so Andrew did this uh, and he pulled out all of the uh, information with respect to what the differential electron flux is in, in particular in the magnetic, uh, magnetic sheath. And it turns out there's a significant differential flux in the magneto tail, especially below about uh, one KV and, 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 and particularly below, below 100 EV or 10 EV. And so in the backside there, the proton flux is turned off, but the electron flux is not. And to me, I'm now the self-appointed supporter of electrons, okay? They need to be part of the problem because they are part of the problem. Okay, so we looked at this and then Schwei went back and did a, a lot of analysis of the, the M-tube data at lots of different points. And he was looking at the 2.8 micron signature, which is OH. And, and, you know, and if you look at the far side, it could be water, right? And he found that this is going up like you would expect as it goes through the cusp, but it doesn't go down. So it does not follow the proton trend at all. It stays flat, it's a little bit going up, maybe a little more, and then it, it goes up again, but it doesn't follow the proton flux. So there has to be something else going on that keeps this at a steady state or dynamic level, which is not driven by the protons. So to me, it's the electrons. And so in the experiment that we did, the laser irradiation, we did a similar experiment, but we did an electron beam irradiation. And there we look directly at the removal or production of water due to the electron beam on a lunar sample that had been 
proton irradiated because it was an actual lunar sample. And we do see water formation. The symbol here, M over Z equals 1819, should be on the other side. This is a neutral signal that shows up at about 18 EV. That threshold may be a little bit lower. Uh, I call this preliminary ground tooth data because we want to get a lot more statistically uh, valid data. But then we see the ion signal. The ion signal shows up around 28 EV. And then there's looks like a peak, and that may be correlated with some ionization core levels of the lunar regolith itself. So the, uh, the regolith is being electronically excited, and its response to that electronic excitation is transferred, and, and it turns on all these hydrogen reactive scattering channels. And so that I'm going to leave uh, it up to Brandt to give you basically part two of this. I won't read through all of these, but I do want to point out the first three. Thermal spikes from micrometeorite impacts do make molecular water. This water is vibrationally excited if it's leaving directly off of the surface. It can rattle around too and, 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 and give you sort of a you know, non-excited water. And then this is a, the point of the talk is the solar wind is a quasi-neutral plasma. It involves both electron and ion radiation bombardment. So we actually have to you know, think about both of these. And, it, and this is the direction uh, that we're moving. So. Thank you. Exciting research. Thank you very much. Next up is um, a colleague, Brent Jones, also from Georgia Tech. And uh, the title of his talk is uh, Meteoroid Stimulated Synthesis of Water on the Moon. All right, good morning. Um, and thanks to the organizers for allowing me to give this talk today. Um, I'm just gonna jump right into it. Uh, Tom briefly mentioned this, this is you know, recombinative desorption. This is the heart of the model that I'm going to present to you. Um, very simply, if you supply heat to this, you will form water um, through reaction of these surface hydroxyls. Um, I just wanna really briefly talk about this. This is called a, a temperature program desorption curve. Um, and it's, uh, you know, described well by this polynomial bigner equation. And the key part here is this part right here. This, so this is recombinative desorption. And um, I just want to show you the effect that the metal ions have on that. So quartz, you know, silicon dioxide is what usually people are familiar with. Um, heating that up requires to drive water off requires significant uh, temperature, about 500 um, Kelvin or so. Um, here you can see that we're, you know, down to about 250 lower than that. And these temperatures are accessible to something that's happening on the day site lunar surface now. So the chemistry of your mineral surface does have a huge role in that. Um, here is a snapshot of the melt rate that our collaborators at NASA Goddard, uh, particularly Juan Diego, did this. He uh, basically updated this Intella model, which many people are probably familiar with. Um, by taking into account all the Jupiter family comments, all the Oort family comments, et cetera, and calculating this melt rate. All right, so and here is just um, at the at a full moon, you can kind of see that all of the melt is uh, centered around the equatorial region and slightly offset um, as well. Um, the melt rates on average is incredibly low, though. We're talking about feptoseconds per, um, or sorry, feptograms per centimeter squared per second, right? Um, However, the key takeaway here is that you know you're you're melting the regolith. You're obviously at high enough temperatures to produce water from the recombinative desorption mechanism. Um, this has been done in the lab actually a few times. Uh, Schultz a few years ago basically uh, had a BB gun where the pellet was a mineral that was impacting onto another mineral uh, and showed the formation of molecular water that was trapped in the uh, mineral. Uh, Chu at the University of Hawaii irradiated an olivine sample with D2 ions and then heated it up with an IR laser and showed the, um, the sublimation of water, which is here in blue and red, uh, hydrogen in blue. Um, and then there's been some molecular dynamics uh, simulations as well that has shown that the uh, number of water molecules you're produced or producing is directly correlated with the amount of energy you're uh, inputting into the system. Uh, so another question is where you know where do these hydroxyls come from? 
Um, we're of the opinion that a lot of it is through solar wind hydroxylation. This is an idea that was first postulated by Zeller back in 1966. That's a pretty famous paper in the community as well. Um, these are just some recent examples of these processes. Uh, on the left is uh, proton irradiation to an olivine sample um, done by Micah Scheibel. And on the right is proton uh, implantation into an actual Apollo sample by Jason McLean at Nanus Goddard. So you can clearly see that there's an increase in that hydroxyl um, band, right? Um, and, you know, and you know, like Tom said, this is a stable thing, right? So the, and the key takeaway here is that, you know, if it's IR active, it, it is a dipole. It has to have a dipole moment and which implies a, a chemical bond and, and not some sort of metastable hydrogen that's sort of, you know, bouncing around internally. Um, this is the crux of the kinetic model that we put together. Um, so here you just have the lattice network, uh, you know, a typical lattice network of some metal oxides. You have proton implantation, which creates this hydroxyl defect. That hydroxyl defect will then diffuse to the surface, creating these surface um, dangling OH bonds, and it also can uh, diffuse into the bulk as well. In addition to hydrogen and solar wind, you also have um, oxygen ions, uh, albeit relatively much smaller than the hydrogen. But that create these peroxide uh, defects as well. And again, that can diffuse to the surface and down into the bulk. Eventually, you end up with these surface hydroxyls. Um, you supply heat in the form of dayside, you know, typical lunar temperatures, or through that impact event, and you'll fill, you know, you'll make water, and then this process just kind of repeats indefinitely over and over again. Um, from this, you know, we build your differential equations, as the computer solve those differential equations, and then calculate how much water is being made. Um, so here's just an example of, of what's happening as a function of time. So on the, on the top here is the recombinative desorption uh, rates, and on the bottom is the um, rate of, of water formation through impact melts. Um, you can see here that the, you know, as you would expect, the recombinative desorption um, water producing events is really centered in the hot part of the lunar surface and it's increasing towards the uh, you know cold pores as that hydroxyl concentration is built up right so it takes longer because the flux is lower uh, in those regions and and then you're eventually going to start producing water through that as well and so that's why it kind of increases interestingly it has a pretty strong effect on the impact melt because you're removing those hydroxyls faster than the impact melt is. And so the peak water production initially in the impact melt is centered around the equatorial region. But as the recombinant absorption is removing those hydroxyls in the equatorial region, it's then dominated in the uh, colder, polar latitudes through the impact melts. Um, um, so this is just a, an example of the internal um, hydroxyl concentration uh, after about a thousand years. So on the left is what I could, what I would call a kind of a low um, uh, energy case. So this, the energy that I'm, I'm showing here is the energy of diffusion, the activated diffusion for the hydroxyl. Um, so we have, you know, low energy on the left, high energy on the right. And so as you would expect, with a higher activation energy, the rate of those hydroxyls going to the surface is much slower. So you're holding on to um, that water uh, much more longer, right? Um, and this little blip right here is, is, is what Tom talked about, right? If, as it goes through the full moon and it's behind the earth, the, the solar winds should shut off, right? And so the, the fact is that we kind of don't see that, which would imply that, um, you know, there's some sort of non-thermal process here. Um, this is in agreement with the paper that was done by um, O.J. Tucker and, and Bill Farrell as well that sort of did a similar um, model where they show that there's this, um, kind of artifact from going into the moon shadow. Um, the other point here is that this, the low energy is um, matching more of what we see in observations, which I'll talk about here. <clears throat> so this is a comparison with the MQ data that was reduced by Schwei um, back in 2017. Um, uh, I just want to point out that the general trend matches quite well, right? There is uh, a couple of discrepancies here. For one, if you notice uh, the scale, I kind of had to change. Um, I'm predicting in the, even in the equatorial regions that there should be about 70 parts per million, um, which matches more closely with the Apollo missions and even the more recent Chang uh, data sets that have been coming back from that. 
Um, and then there's also not this huge diurnal shift right here, um, which would most likely imply either there's a lot of molecular water bouncing around or there's a huge artifact from the um, chemical composition of the regolith in these areas. Um, <clears throat> And so we can predict, you know, how much water is being produced um, given certain energies. Um, now the question is, where does this water go, right? Okay, thanks. Um, and so we I built this Monte Carlo model that took into consideration all the last terms. So, you know, photo dissociation, dissociated adsorption, genes escape, et cetera. And um, this is what we see after about a thousand years as well. So uh, this is a zoomed in region uh, so that we don't see the permanently shadowed regions, which are these bright spots up here. Um, you can clearly see that there is a diurnal change uh, of about 50 parts per million. Um, and this happens, you know, this comes to a, a kind of a steady state uh, system relatively quickly after about 100 years, you'll, you'll see this on the lunar surface. Um, this is the amount of water, and I want to stress like two that could be potentially delivered to these PSRs, right? I mean, and this is assuming that PSRs are all uniform of one temperature, which of course is not true. And so there's potentially up to one weight percent that could be delivered. However, there is a caveat here. Again, um, this is assuming that the PSRs are completely static, which they aren't, right? We have fresh regolith that's being deposited through impact gardening, which is going to significantly dilute the um, sort of mass fraction in the PSRs. Um, particularly that's being delivered through uh, this impact event and, and just standard recombinant absorption. Um, here's a brief comparison with um, observations that were done by Honeyball as well. Um, you can clearly see that the overall trend matches very well. So we have this nice latitude dependence on the warm bayside temperatures, and it begins to flatten out um, quite nicely and matches the trend as well when we go into the night, colder night side temperatures. Uh, one thing, though, is that I want to point out is that the scale is slightly different. So, and which is generally true for all of the observations, um, it matches the trends. My model predicts a lower abundance, and I kind of think that these observations, in my in, in my opinion, are are over predicting the amount of water um, because there's you know 150 parts per million is about a monolayer of water, right? Which should not be stable at these temperatures. Um, and so it kind of makes more sense to that they're either over predicting or that there's some very, very high binding sites on the regolith, which is also quite possible. That's not captured in my model. Um, I guess with that, I'll end and I'll just uh, thank you for your attention. Thank you very much. I believe the next speaker is online. Would you like me to start sharing? Yes. You already do that. That's great. So okay. Yeah, please go ahead and share. Excellent. So we're seeing the PowerPoint. You could go into presenter mode, please. Presentation mode. Okay. <clears throat> So um, the next speaker is uh, Janice Bishop of the SETI Institute. Um, she will talk about the um, investigating variations in the hydration band in lunar spectra. And uh, yeah, now it's looking good. Okay. Yeah, it yeah. didn't work the first way. time. Great. Well, I'm I'm happy to be here remotely. Sorry, I'm not there in the room. Um, fortunately, though, um, Rachel, Angela, and Jessica, three of my co-authors are there at the conference, so feel free to tag them this um, later today if, if you want to talk to somebody in person about this. So this, this project, our, our goal is to try to figure out the source of the hydration features in MCube data, and this is, of course, a ginormous question and problem, and we've heard some excellent talks so far today addressing this issue. Our approach has been focused on the MCube data, and we've been looking at sort of four, four uh, ways to approach this. The first is comparing targeted and global um, images of, of certain locations. 
And then also looking at the global data that's been processed with a method developed by Christian Voller and his um, graduate student Kai Wolfarth recently. And that is using Diviner, Mertes, and Gelfin for data from those missions. Another technique we're using is modeling these spectra and looking at the residual in order to look for changes with the time of day. And also um, fourth tack is sort of looking at lab spectra to try to compare those with these uh, mcube data. So first off, looking at the targeted versus global images, there are not very many targeted mcubed images. And here is sort of a map in the upper right. And the image we looked at is in this yellow box. And that is from is processed with the initial Roger Clark thermal correction, and that's available on the PDS. And then we're comparing that with global mcube data. And this image in the, the lower right with the yellow box shows where that is in the global data set. And the yellow box shows the sort of snap out that we use to analyze this. And one advantage of the global data is that you have broad coverage and you have data from different times of day. And so for example, uh, the early morning, late morning and midday have different um, integrated band depths across the 2.7 to 3 micron region that could be related to OH or H2O as we heard in the previous talks. And across this highlands region on the far right, lower right, is sort of a mineral map. And most of this image is blue corresponding to plagioclase. There's a little bit of OPX and a tiny amount of basalt in red. So, and the, the global data set that we're using here is processed with a thermal correction that involves calibration with LRO, Diviner data, the Galfin 4, and the Bepi Colombo Meredith missions. And we're really excited that the near infrared and thermal infrared data show high accuracy with these other missions and with the technique we're using. So, that gives us high confidence for the technique. So here on the left, we have the targeted mission, uh, targeted image, and on the right, the global image. And these little spots, um, Angela and Rachel collected these spectra. So there's a pink, green, uh, red, green, pink, and blue spots from both sides. And so if we look at the spectra here, the targeted data, of course, has higher spectral and spatial resolution. So it's smoother. And it's in general very similar to the global data, which is exciting for us. Um, however, there are some issues with binning um, from the global data that present some challenges. So if we look at the spectra here, on the top are the global data and on the bottom are the uh, targeted data. And generally in, in these two examples, the uh, the red, and the green and the pink show stronger pyroxene absorptions and the blue shows weaker pyroxene absorptions and that's pretty consistent. The big difference is out at longer wavelengths in the 2.7 to 3 micron region. This new thermal correction better model is better consistent with other missions and it shows this change in the 2.7 to 3 micron region that's integrated in this integrated band depths used by Willer and Wolforth for mapping um, water OH on the, on the moon. And so transitioning to this map here, this is from Kai's recent paper in astronomy and astrophysics. So if you look at global maps from the morning to midday to afternoon, we see a higher abundance of this band depth due to water OH earlier in the day, a redu reduction towards midday, and then higher again in the afternoon. So something is causing a decrease in this band at midday across most of the moon. And so we looked at some spectra from three different strips from these to try to look at the spectral shape and changes in more detail. And these are some examples. So from, from one of these strips um, at 240 to 250 um, longitude. These on the bottom with the triangles, these are the morning data at a few different latitudes. 
the first step was to normalize these at channel 70. And we did this for the morning and the midday data. And then we ratioed the morning to the midday data. And you can see it's a little noisy in some areas, but it's it's fairly consistent, except at the end, there's a change in this 2.7 to 3 micron region. And then if we also look at, um, this is the same plot from before the morning to midday versus to morning to afternoon. In many places, this remains fairly flat from um, morning to afternoon. And in some places, there's some diversion from that. So in the blue and the light green here. And again, if we compare this from different three different locations, we see the biggest difference from morning to midday. And we see different shapes here from 2.7 to 2.95 or so. And unfortunately, the, the data is binned and the spectral resolution isn't super high, but we do see differences in the shape near 2.7 to 2.8, which is more associated with OH versus longer from 2.8 to 3 microns or so, which is more associated with, with water molecules. So potentially this could be due to different components. So the next tack we applied was looking to model these data. And so we compared midday to morning or morning to afternoon. And in these cases, the original spectra are shown in blue and red. So the blue and the red you can see here. And then the modeled spectrum is shown in yellow. And so the difference between red and yellow is this linear line shown in purple, and then the residual shown in green. So um, red multiplied by the line gives you the yellow modeled spectrum. And then the residual is pretty flat across here, but there's a difference here in the water area. So for this model, we're looking at what the shape of this residual is and what the intensity of the residual is for different sites on the moon. So for this particular site at Bullialdus Crater, we looked at midday to morning, and we looked at the, the change in this region that appears in this residual, and that's shown here. And then um, Mario Prente was leading this effort, and then he mapped this on the right. <clears throat> and then he did the same thing for um, the morning to afternoon and then map this on the right. So there is some change in residual, but it's less. So if we compare the map of morning to midday on the left and morning to afternoon on the right, the higher integrated band up is shown here uh, in red. So there's there's more orange and red for the morning to midday and there's still some um, some green showing some increased change in the morning to afternoon, but the biggest change is observed in the morning to midday transition as observed um, in the maps that Kai and Christian were working on. So wrapping this up, the, the last tack is comparing this to lab spectra. And I collected, I, I looked through a lot of my spectra from anhydrous minerals and volcanic glass, and also some from the USGS library. And many of these do have bands at longer wavelengths and in the, from 2.65 out to 3.2 microns in these nominally anhydrous minerals, we do see bands due to OH and water. And these could be due to inclusions with trapped water or due to some um, abnormalities in the mineral structure. And we also heard a lot of um, lab experiments in the last two talks about causes for OH and water in olivine or other minerals. One thing we did note was a change in Volcanic glass and, and quartz and olivine fine-grained um, components of these tended to have a broad distribution of water, like in this green here or the gray at longer wavelengths, whereas coarser-grained olivine and many pyroxene and feldspar minerals tended to have both OH bands as well as water bands. So wrapping this up in conclusion, then we see we're looking at the MCUBE global data set, and it's known to show difference, diurnal differences in this 2.7 to 3 micron region, which is associated with hydration. And we see the biggest changes from morning to midday. 
And using ratios of the spectra allows you to get rid of some of the artifacts from the binning. Using a modeling technique, we saw similar trend changes where we saw the largest change in this band from morning to midday. And then in looking at lab spectra, um, perhaps molecular water is embedded in some of the regolith or OH groups could be protonated along grain surfaces. And potentially these could be involved in differences in this hydration band. So thank you, appreciate the chance to speak today. Thank you very much. So our next uh, speaker is Lee White. Is he in the room? Hello? Hmm? Virtual. Ah, OK. So that's a virtual talk, too. Um, and um, are you online? Lee, can you hear us? I'm not seeing or I'm not seeing your microphone being active right now. Is that better? Yes. Now we can see you and hear you. Okay. Yeah. Apologies for that. Um, yep. Yeah, so I I am virtual. Unfortunately, uh, I wasn't able to join you guys in person today, but through the power of the internet, I can at least deliver my talk this way. Um, am I okay to start or? Can, can yeah. you see the okay. Right. Excellent. Okay. Um, yeah. Uh, thank you for having me. Um, as I say, so I can be there in person. Um, so initially today, I was planning to talk about the uh, abundance and distribution of volatiles in normally anhydrous minerals by atom probe tomography, which sounds very fun and very challenging. And it turns out it is. So we haven't been able to do too much with abundances, but we're at least going to show some cool atom probe data. The implications for volatile reservoirs and the linear regular are still very much there. Though. So back backtracking a little bit from actually putting pure numbers on this, but still going to show some really, really fun stuff from a technique that a lot of people haven't really been exposed to, especially in the lunar science community. Um, so the bulk of what I'll be talking about today revolves around space weathering. So it's been a, a very interesting session. Previously, I was uh, subscribing to the idea that hydrogen kind of comes in and you magically get water. So it's been quite, quite eye-opening to really think about the mechanisms that are, are defining that. So when we think about space weathering, at least in the lunar regolith, think about the idea of micrometroid impacts, and solar wind implantation, and all those kind of really, really complex mechanisms that are, are going on in that superficial layer. Um, obviously, in reality, it's not just happening to the very surface. We're getting um, impact gardening and this sort of regolith being churned over and over. So these, uh, these effects, for example, hydrogen implantation, could be occurring at deeper intervals sort of after that cycling process. But I think, I think the, main, the main point from all this is that the mechanisms are still fairly poorly constrained. So we know there's a lot going on without, um, without an atmosphere, without any protective buffer there. The lunar regolith being exposed to all of this for, for its sort of geological history. We know a little bit about the kind of uh, products that are produced from space weathering. So uh, nanophase iron in particular. There's a, a nice study coming out of the Tanger 5 sample uh, back last year, actually starting to constrain how and why nanophase iron might be forming in different minerals in the, uh, the the regolith, and of the OH formation, which we've already heard quite a bit about today, OH and H2O formation. The mechanisms are still fairly poorly constrained, and that is because these interactions are occurring on such a small scale, they're pretty damn hard to visualize and interpret. So my background is very much in geochronology, so I like to date rocks, and that involves understanding the structure and the petrology of the samples. So I very much subscribe to the idea of correlative microscopy, so linking sort of length scales here across time and space, right? So you look at your whole rock sample, even better with things like the Apollo samples, because you know exactly where on the moon they're coming from, as opposed to a meteorite, where, you know, pick your poison. Start with your whole rock, come down the fin section, correlating the whole way. And now with modern techniques, we get, you know, such as SEM in the EDS work now, we can go down to the mineral scale. Go down even further, you can start like TEM, and you can actually image the crystal lattice. And now, through the power of Atom Probe, we can actually start to image um, atoms in 3D. So you get to produce beautiful videos like this. Um, this is from the, the Tagish Lake Carbonaceous Chondrite, but you can imagine this is sodium decorating a, uh, a subgrain boundary within that sort of magnetite framboid in the sample. What is atom probe? 
Uh, it's a, a fairly new technique for us in the geological and planetary sciences, but for material sciences, this has been kicking around for about 50 years now. Um, the biggest hindrance for us in particular is sample preparation. So historically, atom probes were used to analyze uh, metals and conductive samples. Obviously rocks aren't particularly conductive, um, but through the advent of the laser, um, the LEAP, the laser atom probe, we can actually now start to look at the sort of materials that we care about. Um, sample preparation is the big thing. So you need a focused ion beam, FEM. So um, the samples are prepared. You have your fin section or your grain mount or your sample um, cut around the area of interest. So if I can just use, uh, hopefully you guys can see that. Um, you can isolate the grain of interest under a platinum cap. You cut it out, so you completely isolate it in 3D. Lift it out using a micro manipulator, same way you would see M lamella. And then you go along, you stick it on these little silicon posts, cut it off so that it's completely isolated in 3D. And then you just operate your focused iron beam in a circular annular mill to produce this lovely little fingertip shape, which is the final, the final specimen. So the reason we need it to be that shape is because once it goes into the atom probe, uh, it's super cooled down to about 50 Kelvin, and then it's exposed to a rapid laser pulse. It operates about um, 100,000 perps. And that energy is then transported to the end of the tip, where it's coupled with a uh, field evaporated iron sort of electrode and a position sensitive detector. So the reason this is so cool, this time of flight detector, um, is that we know if an atom breaks off the top of the tip, it will land on the top of the detector, from the bottom of the tip to the bottom of the detector, and then the first laser pulse will evaporate the front of the tip, the last will evaporate the back. And that means that we get the X, the Y, and the Z coordinate, which allows us to do those really nifty 3D reconstructions. And like I say, it's coupled with a time of flight mass spectrometer, front of flight detector, sorry. Um, and that allows us to measure the whole mass to charge state ratio spectrum at one in, um, at once, basically. So you can measure everything from your hydrogen down at one Dalton, all the way up. I mean, not because you're on here, but sort of like uranium P38, if it's there, we'd start to see a peak. So you don't have to select what species you want to measure, you just kind of get the whole grab bag, right? So minimally destructive, we're only cutting out, I mean, the example here is sort of like 10 by about 30 micron square. Um, and then we're getting quite a high scientific yield from that, from that extraction. In terms of space weathering, Atom probe is starting to really sort of show its face, which is really exciting, at least for me. Um, so we have a study last year by Luke Bailey looking at some of the returned Hybris 2 um, grains. So in Olivine, they actually managed to image uh, OH enrichment and H2O enrichment in the outer kind of 30 nanometers or so of the grain. So what they've done here uh, is this is a, like a chromium cap. So you know exactly where the surface of your grain is. And then everything below that, they can be confident it's sort of the nanometer scale uh, interaction of that grain. So they've actually imaged H2O here in the, uh, the outer layer. So they improve confidence in that by actually doping some terrestrial standards and then they get very different profiles of enrichment. So they're confident that this is from space weathering and not for sample preparation or sample matching. Uh, on the moon, uh, Jennica Greer back in 2020 actually looked at asteroids of ilmenite. So the same idea, you put your, in this case, they use platinum as a capping layer. Um, just so you can be confident you're getting that very outer superficial layer. And they actually managed to image microphase and nanophase iron. And they even managed to grab a few vesicles, which are really challenging by atom probe unless you super cool your, your sample for L. Uh, and then unfortunately, this was only in an abstract, but Josiah Lewis uh, back in 2019 actually had a look at some of the agglutinates from the Apollo 11 return samples. And again, they managed to get nanophase iron, from which they found nickel, so it's a meteoritic component. Uh, and they also managed to try and infer some growth mechanisms within those. Uh, those nice regoliths. So they've got sort of iron sulfur grains embedded in iron, which they infer to form from Oswald ripening. So atom probes already starting to show a way that you can visualize these nanoscale space weathering features and actually try and interpret the formation mechanisms as you go along the way. So this study, we kind of wanted to broaden the range of minerals and samples that have been looked at. So the only olivine study previously was in the higher boots of two grains, so fairly young soils. Um, so we had a look at soil 6500. Um, so it's a very mature soil, at least in terms of the uh, kind of the maturity scale. Um, primarily an orthocyte, as expected, but yeah, about 30% impact now, and then you've also got a mare component. So there is olivine in there. So, and notably, it's also enriched in meteoritic cinephile elements. Uh, so we used DDS on a few of the grains, just to target our areas of interest, went in with five atom probes using our star and beam extraction method. Two of them blew up, which is quite a good ratio, actually, for atom probe if you uh, really get into it. Um, but the three other tips ran really well, so that's great. Uh, we also had a look at a DR5 standard. So this is just a, a known nanosim standard used here at the Open University. And we just, using exactly the same method, we put a chromium capping layer on, we extracted the tip, and then we just try to measure kind of what's happening at that official layer. The main takeaway from this is that OH, here in this kind of tealy color, um, is fairly homogenous throughout the sample. And then once you get towards that official layer, marked here by this little line, it drops off. 
So, weirdly, so in Rich. I mean, that's some kind of atmospheric interaction, but there's no notable OH or enrichment from uh, atmospheric contamination. Uh, quantifying this, as it was an absolute nightmare, hence dropping the, the quantification aspect. Um, initially, we were getting about 2.9 atomic percent hydrogen when it should be about 0.05. A lot of that was coming from these really weird one and two Dalton piece, the pure hydrogen and deuterium. A lot of that will just be noise in the uh, the F and Pro vacuum chamber. So still we can be confident that this is a, a real relative distribution within that within that sample. So we can use a relative distribution, even if not for hard numbers. Diving into the Apollo stuff. Um, so here we've got uh, one of the micro tips. The notable thing is that we found nanophase form ion formation right down to about 450 nanometers depth. So really deep. I mean, you can almost call it microphase, but they're still 20, 30 nanometers. But we do get OH enrichment. So again, you think about what we saw in the uh, terrestrial standard, that OH curve should drop off. We do see enrichment. So that's suggesting, and same as the Hayabusa study, that this is a real kind of space weathering artifact. Um, but the notable thing is that it seems to be coupled from the depth of nanophase ion formation. So we've got up to about 150 nanometers depth of OH formation within that sample, but nanophase ion going all the way down to four, 450 nanometers. Uh, and there's no meteoric component in any of the nanophase ion here. Uh, the next tip we looked at was completely different. So nanophase ion was very localized, just within sort of 20 to 50 nanometers below that surface. Uh, and in this case, it does correlate with OH. So again, you get this little uptick of OH right at the sample surface, which is about the same depth, about 100 nanometers. Uh, but importantly, we do actually find nickel within these within these nanophase ions. So it's almost a camasite composition, and that's kind of suggestive of a meteoritic origin for these nanophase ion grains in particular. Uh, the final sample that ran really well, looks a lot more similar to that very first tip, right? So we got really nanophase ion formation and a pretty, pretty substantial OH enrichment at the surface again. Um, and again, slightly decoupled. So the nanophase ion, microphase ion, whatever you want to call it, because they're much greater depth than the OH enrichment. So within those three tips, you've got decoupling of nanophase ion and OH formation, all kind of running in, in parallel. That's kind of speaking about multiple mechanisms that are potentially forming these things. So I'm very much not a space weathering expert, uh, so take all of this with a grain of salt, but at least interpreting the atom probe data that we've got, um, the fact that we're getting comparable depth of OH formation in the really mature Apollo 6500 soils compared to the Hayabusa 2 grains suggests that it's more the, uh, the saturation point of the mineral that stops hydrogen implantation rather than like a time limit factor. So it doesn't matter. We don't need really mature soils to necessarily have deep OH formation. And that's really important for ISIU purposes. So if we're thinking about hydrogen extraction, we don't need to sort of exclude certain soils that might be younger from the, uh, from the maturity index. Uh, and finally, talking about nanophase ions. So if I, again, going back to in situ resource utilization, uh, nanophase ions often been suggested as a, a potential proxy for OH formation. So if there's lots of nanophase ion, that suggests there could be quite a substantial reservoir of, sort of OH formation. Again, tying into this kind of maturity idea. Um, but what we're seeing is that that can often be decoupled. Um, so a lot of nanophase ion doesn't necessarily facilitate a lot of OH. Uh, and the fact that we're seeing sort of nickel and chromium kind of compositions, camasite compositions, um, starts to think about different mechanisms for the formation of those grains. So I know it kind of correlates with that kind of impact map that we saw from micrometrics earlier. Just a, a few a few kind of whistle stop ideas there from, from the Atom Pro. Um, but I guess the thing I do want to flag up for Atom Pro before I finish is that, like I say, you get the whole master charge spectrum. So you don't have to cherry pick uh, any particular regions of interest in that mass spec. So even though here we've used it to isolate nanophase iron, look at 08 and sort of things like that. You can measure uranium lead, you can measure fluorine, I suppose, uh, but whatever you want, right? You get the lot. So it's really useful. It's minimally destructive, at least on the kind of scale that we, we normally think of as planetary science. And I think it's really going to be the kind of next frontier of sample return analysis. So, thank you. Thank you so much. Uh, please uh, stay online and um, leave your camera on. Uh, we have the Q&A panel now, so may I ask all the speaker of uh, this session to the stage, okay. We're missing, uh, ah. okay. Any questions from the audience or from the people online? There's one.
Hi, I'm Christian Carli from Ina Fiaps, and I have uh, we can say a couple of questions. One following the other two for Johnny, uh, Jessica, and for yeah, and uh, our colleagues uh, Rachel and so on. Uh, really, uh, Johnny, yes, sorry. Uh, the one is uh, uh, which is the difference of temperature on the images taken at midday and uh, uh, images taken in the morning, and uh, uh, this is related to the fact that uh, this uh, weak bands at uh, around three microns is often seen also in the nominal uh, anhydrous silicates, major in terrestrial or in vacuum. And uh, I was just wondering if how we can, we can say trust in some way that is related to the presence of OH since those minerals are often with uh, just PPM of water or better of hydrogen bonded in the crystal and is not uh, instead of just uh, a typical uh, uh, absorption related to the silicates. Since measuring OH in this mineral is difficult also with the transmittance measurements, so in absorbance. And so if this, then the difference that we see could be just related to a different of temperature on uh, those absorption related to pyroxene or olivine and so on. That is not uh, any way potentially attributable to, to water. So there is any connective uh, activity on the lab to enter much more in details on this problem, to understand if we are really seeing from remote sensing water in that areas, or is just related to some absorption due to pyroxene or olivine or plagioclase. So the, the spectra that I showed were measured under controlled dry environments. So the samples were put in the instrument and then the water was purged out overnight. So it should have removed all of the adsorbed water. So the water and OH bands should be from inclusions or um, OH or H2O actually bound to the surfaces. But those were all measured just at room temperature. And I actually have a Europlanet grant to visit Alessandro Materilli at the DLR in Berlin. And we're going to do some reflectance and emission spectra this fall where we're looking under vacuum and um, under higher temperatures to try to get a better idea of, of how this might change, how the spectra might change in this region. And then for the M-cubed data, there is a change in temperature of the moon from um, the morning to the midday to the afternoon, and it is warmer during the, the midday temperatures. And I don't recall right now what those temperatures actually are. And it's difficult. We um, when we get the trailblazer data, it's going to be so much better. But right now, we've got to work with what we have. And so um, the M cubed data is at a range of temperatures. So it's there's sort of morning ish data is somewhat classified together, and midday data is somewhat classified today uh, together. But there are variations in the, the heights and variations in the temperatures for each of those categories. So it's not really like comparing apples to apples, but we're doing the best we can with the data that's available right now. Right, thank you. Any further questions from the audience? Hey, can I ask one? Yes, sure. I'd, um, I'd like to ask Lee a question. So as you mentioned, the atom probe is pretty well known in the surface physics community and they typically have like tips. You circumvented that a little bit by using the laser, but the laser itself, when you do the impact on the tip, that creates a little plasma before you have melting. So I'm wondering how much of the ionization you see is actually due to the laser interaction versus the field emission from the tip. So we, the way that's kind of controlled is through the, the temperature of the tip. So by keeping it at 50 Kelvin in theory, you're minimizing those kind of thermal effects. Uh, and the, the hit rate, if you like, is always controlled by the instrument. So it's automated to try and keep the tip at that, at that temperature. So the, the, the biggest issue would be from the FIB preparation, the focused arm beam. So especially if you use um, one of the old gallium source fibs. There have been examples of, sort of nanometer scale amorphization of your regions of interest. So that's why we always keep those capping layers on the top. 
Um, but yeah, beyond that, it should be should be fairly real from the sample. So we shouldn't be inducing too many artifacts. And at least by looking at the uh, the known terrestrial standards and some of the experimental work other groups have done, it does seem to be a, a real space weathering signature that we're picking up rather than induced by the atom probe. So if, if it was a common problem, you expect to see it in kind of all of our data sets, which we, which we don't. I have a question for Thomas um, and or Brandt, if, if that's okay. I, I was wondering about some of the, the surface reactions that you showed with the, the olivine structure and what are your thoughts on the moon about some kind of a exosphere or how do you feel about molecules attached directly to the olivine versus some that might float off and then reattach? Does that is that a reasonable scenario to you or or not really? I've heard others mention that. Yeah, yeah, it's definitely a possibility. Um, it, it generally, it's called in particularly for water. Um, when it interacts with the surface, it can either you know can be absorbed as water whole or it can dissociatively attach. And what that means is that it just breaks apart into uh, surface hydroxyls again. Um, as far as an exosphere goes, I. You know, I do think that there's an exosphere. I mean, there's obviously a lot of hydrogen bouncing around too, but I also think that there's a lot of, um, well, I shouldn't say a lot, but some amount of water bouncing around too. And I do think that that probably scales with the height. Um, so, you know, if water is dissorbing from the surface and due to the, like the really fractal nature of the grains, um, it probably doesn't have the kind of typical cosine distribution that a, a flat surface does, right? So um, you probably get these really shallow uh, angles of, of, of a launch trajectory um, with an equal probability as you would um, uh, as I, like a purely vertical or, or um, you know, at a 45 degree. And so what that probably ends up with is that you have, you have a higher number density of of, of water um, in this particular example, um, you know, really close to the surface and it, and it decreases significantly as you go uh, higher from the surface. I, I wanna add one thing to that. And we didn't talk about it because we had the parlance of water removal and desorption primarily by thermal processes, but the lima alpha photon and the photon impinging on the lunar surface has a very high cross section for photo desorption which is a non-thermal process. And so, you know, right at the surface, due to the photodesorption event itself, there should be very little water hanging out directly on the surface. Okay, just, so from, uh, sorry. From what both of you said, it, it sounds like it could be possible for water that's chemisorbed onto the surface to be released and then reattached in a chemisorbed manner and potentially that could be happening in a diurnal pattern and potentially also electrons could be involved in that process as well as temperature. Yeah, uh, so in that model that I showed, the strongest diurnal effect was from chemisorbed water. Um, there was a small diurnal change just from the internal OH, but it was not as, as big as what we've seen in observations. So okay. in my opinion, the big change that we're seeing is probably um, adsorbed, chemisorbed water. Okay. Um, we have only time for a very quick last question, maybe to Chloe. If not, I'm going to ask something. So I, I very much liked your um, experiments in the lab uh, with the, the buried ice and buried water. Uh, I was planning to... Um, uh, to test with regular ice mixtures. Um, as you indicated, the... Um, um, the uh, attenuation would then be different due to probably interface coupling effects. Yes, indeed. Um, we are thinking about how to recreate a mixture of grains of ice mixed with grains of regolith. And of course, we have to modify our um, facility if we're doing so. So it's not so easy as it can be. So, yeah, looking forward to that. Thank you, all the speakers again. Thank you, everyone. And the next block starts off with uh, Mark Nottingham from the University of Manchester. He's going to talk about uh, rare gases in the lunar regolith, preparations for in situ lunar polar volatile analysis.
or zeros. Okay, um, so we heard an overview of the aims of the prospect instrument package from Mahesh earlier today, um, and thank you for making my job slightly easier. <clears throat> um, but this talk focuses on our efforts towards honing our ability to use the prospect instrument package to meet the objectives of working out what uh, resources of interest are available at the lunar poles and to, uh, to help facilitate human exploration of the moon and further. So just to recap, for those that might not know, <clears throat> um, two of the defined science goals of PROSPECT are uh, first, the quantification of volatiles trapped at the lunar pol uh, polar regions, and second, to characterize these volatiles in regards to their sources. That's um, identifying if the volatiles found at the poles are from solar wind implantation, asteroidal or cometary impact delivery. Um, and our team in Manchester has kind of kicked off the cross lab collab uh, calibration process, focusing in on the noble gases. So those are helium, neon, argon, krypton, and xenon. And the aim is really to um, calibrate the instrument capabilities against some lab based standards. So, why do we use uh, the noble gases? Well, um, Noble gas systems form one way of quite robustly characterizing uh, volatile inventories. Um, and that really comes down to the fact that noble gases are incredibly chemically inert, uh, meaning there's little in terms of chemistry that can complicate the measurements. Um, they're also found fairly evenly spread across the solar system and for the most part are in low enough concentration that small deviations uh, within their isotopic ratios can easily be detected. Further to all of that is the amount of complementary science that you can also carry out using these uh, systems. However, um, as this figure shows, they're not without their own drawbacks. Um, the, the illustration is, it, it shows how complicated some of these processes that can modify um, the noble gas inventories of samples can be. So, as I mentioned, the work uh, is the start of efforts to calibrate the measurements uh, made by Prospect on the lunar surface. And to do this, we selected two lunar soil samples uh, from the Apollo 14 and Apollo 16 sample collection. Uh, these were selected based on what we thought to be representative of the most likely dry case scenarios uh, that we might, may find upon landing. Uh, aliquots of these samples were distributed for measurement at three institutions across the prospect science team. Um, and the idea being that we would cross collaborate, uh, I think keep saying cal collaborate rather than calibrate, um, cross calibrate across these labs and then to the uh, lander itself. So our setup in Manchester um, is a Thermo Fisher Helix multi collector mass spectrometer. Um, our standard measurement protocol is to use two aliquots of any given sample, one for light noble gases, so helium, neon, and argon, and one for heavy noble gases, the like krypton and xenon. Um, we sequentially heat a sample using a 970 nanometer laser, um, and the extracted gases, uh, at, sorry, we extract gases at defined laser power steps and these gases are then purified across a range of getters um, and cryogenically separated into single element phases. Uh, we release these and measure them in sequence um, using the mass spectrometer kind of in, in a similar way to what we expect the prospect instrument will be able to do. Uh, we've also recently modified these protocols to test whether subsplitting the extracted gases into known volumes would cause any unforeseen issues uh, within the data reduction process or the, the measurement itself, um, as this is something that we th should be possible using Prospect. Um, and the aim here is to collect 
all the noble gas data we can from a single aliquot, uh, which is important given, uh, particularly with prospect, we're limited to the number of samples that we can extract. So these are the uh, release profile data from the two calibration samples that we have measured. Um, as you can see, we extract about 75 to 90% of the total inventory of each sample within 0.1 watt of um, heating power. This early release is likely to be surface implanted solar wind, um, which we, we do confirm using isotope ratio data, um, but I've opted to not show that here. Uh, on top of that, we achieve uh, within our laser heating, uh, we achieve sam uh, sample melting at about three watts. I mean, that changes slightly because of how lasers couple with uh, different minerals. Um, but then we get a second release at three watts of um, mineral lattice bound gases, which include your cosmogenic gases. And this is how our, our measurements compare to uh, literature data. Uh, as you can see, the submature sample 14163, uh, which is the yellow diamond, um, appears to contain greater concentrations of gases than the more mature sample, um, in, which is the purple square. Um, we wouldn't normally expect that. We would normally expect solar wind implantation to correlate with um, maturity. And we suspect that this indicates that maybe the measured uh, sample aliquot used in one of the analyses is either um, oversampling or undersampling the agglutinate content of the parent soil. that slide. Um, just going to jump to this one. <clears throat> so we can look at um, just the major isotopes of each noble gas element um, and assess the gas inventory for its fit to known volatile reservoirs. Um, so here we're comparing it to solar wind, which is the, the black line with the white diamonds. Um, we take each uh, major isotope and we ratio it to 36 argon uh, to give us a, a nice baseline comparison. Um, and as you can see, there is similarity between uh, the samples and solar wind, um, but there's notably a depletion in the light isotopes and an, an enrichment in the heavy isotopes relative to the expected solar wind composition. Um, and this really hints back at um, that illustration earlier that shows how complex noble gas processes can actually be. We do suspect that this is solar wind. It's just been, there's, there's been a small amount of gas loss um, or you know, sample disruption that has led to this fractionation. So what can we achieve? Um, just touching upon the kind of science questions that we can answer with noble gas measurements. Um, we can take the measured values and fraction them into um, the amount of gas that's attributable to each contributing source. Um, here we're using solar wind and cosmic ray produced gases uh, to enact a simple lever rule two component mix. So this plot shows how each heating step is progressively depleted in solar wind type gases, um, which is expected because they're surface absorbed, uh, oh, sorry, surface implanted. And due to, uh, from this uh, fractionated gas, we can also calculate parameters such as the cosmic ray exposure age, um, which indicates how long a sample has been exposed to the cosmic ray flux, uh, which is typically synonymous with residents within one to two meters of the lunar surface. So we calculate uh, that this sample uh, appears to have been exposed for uh, 28 million years, um, which is that and um, looking at the parentless argon-40, uh, which is degassed argon-40 derived from 
um, radioactive decay of potassium-40, which has then been re-implanted into the surface of the sample uh, by UV light ionization. Um, serves as a semi-quantitative measure of when the sample was last exposed to the solar wind flux um, on the lunar surface for more than a few thousand years. And we, we actually can't calculate that value for this sample because it seems to have been so recent that our errors overlap with a negative age, um, which we'd indicate would indicate it's been freshly exposed on the surface. Um, so just to kind of wrap up, um, in terms of prospect and the, these calibrations, um, we may be able to examine the regolith um, from diff different depths. Um, sorry, we may be able to ex examine when regolith from different depths was likely last exposed on the surface, how long the sample was exposed for, um, the contributions of different source reservoirs within the sample's total inventory, um, all through noble gas systems. And such characterization may allow us to understand the duration over which the volatiles have been trapped at the duration over which the volatiles that are trapped at the poles may have accumulated um, and may also possibly indicate how long it would take for those concentrations to replenish, um, which is a factor that is, is fairly important in providing sustained access to the lunar surface in the future. So thank you. And Thank you very much. Our next speaker is uh, Ben Greenhagen from uh, Johns Hopkins APL. And right. We're going to talk about uh, understanding uh, thermal emissions from lunar epi regolith. Yeah, thanks. Uh, thanks for inviting or for offering the opportunity to talk about this. This is actually one of my favorite topics because it's something that's so interesting and challenging and has involved such a large number of people on the Diviner team trying to figure figure this out so we can make the most of our compositional data sets. Uh, but today I'm going to be talking, I'll be defining uh, the epiregolith and these um, thermal emission gradients that we see and then talk about some of the lines of investigation we've been working on. So what is the epiregolith? So epi outer uh, regolith. It's defined by Wendell Mendel and Sarah Noble in 2010. They have this uh, really, really nice LPSC abstract. If you haven't read it, I recommend checking it out. Um, it's just under two pages and they go through these three completely different lines of reasoning for why you need to have a special layer at the very surface. They look at optical photometry, they look at directional emissivity, and they also look at um, the thermal physical structure. And all of these lines through different means say that you have to have this um, at least 250 micron up to a millimeter thick layer that is extremely porous, um, perhaps with a fairy castle structure um, in order to be able to reproduce all these phenomena. Because you have this very, very porous structure, in a vacuum, uh, it invites strong thermal gradients. So what we basically see is that on a particle scale, you have a difference in temperature. In, in the surface. And because you have thermal gradients and we're looking at wavelengths of light, and my internet connection is unstable, um, uh, you get a wavelength dependent temperature effect. So if you're, if you're at a wavelength that's seen deeper into the surface, you're actually seeing warmer temperatures than you are at a wavelength that is not seen as deep. And so what we measure with diviner or with any thermal instrument looking at one of these planets is not emissivity, it's thermal emission that has this wavelength dependence. And it's been observed for a long time when they brought back the first Apollo soils and put them into special environment chambers back in the 1960s and 70s, they saw this immediately. And that's been reproduced up to this very day. There's a cottage industry of these experiments and it's also been produced using thermal models and we've observed it with Diviner. And one of the reasons why I wanted to bring this topic back and summarize it now is because there's about to be at least four, if not more new thermal instruments going to the moon. We'll hear about two of those missions today with Lunar Trailblazer and, and Lunar Vice this, 
after lunch. Um, so it's definitely something we need to keep in mind. All right, so here's a schematic of, of what I'm talking about here. If you're on an airless body, there's the potential for having this thermal structure uh, that we don't see on terrestrial planets. So the lower left plot here would be a terrestrial planet where you have an atmosphere. The air uh, or atmosphere allow, allows the thermal energy to be conducted very evenly and you have uh, either zero or a very weak thermal gradient. If you don't have that, that atmosphere to convect, then you're really only transmitting along grain boundaries. And if you have really angular uh, particles like we have on the moon, those are don't touch very efficiently or radiation. And so what we take is a, a particulate and you're basically turning it into aerogel if it's on the lunar surface. So you have this really highly insulating surface, which allows these really large temperature differences we see on the lunar surface um, that um, because of, of the highly insulating nature. So uh, the plot on, on the right is showing uh, what the same material looks like with the same preparation in two different environments. The blue is this terrestrial environment that looks very much like um, the inverse of a reflectance measurement. And then the black one, uh, the black curve there is if it is in a simulated lunar environment. And because of this uh, differential and thermal gradient, you see a much colder surface in the strongly absorbing vibrational bands, the uh, Rastralin bands, and you're seeing deeper into the surface when you look at the Christiansen feature, which is relatively transparent. So this is what I mean when I say this isn't emissivity anymore, it's now um, spectral emission. You can kind of visualize it, thinking about this, if you look at um, charcoal or, or coals or ashes or, or things like that, you're seeing the top surface is actually cooler than the interior, and that's exactly what we're seeing at these wavelengths. Um, where if it was an isothermal surface, we'd be seeing the same temperature everywhere. Uh, and the strength of this thermal gradient is affected by a lot of different things. I'll talk about albedo and composition today, but it's also affected by packing density and particle size and, and other factors as well. And one of the critical tools for investigating this are these um, specialized environment chambers. Um, I run one of these chambers at uh, APL. It's called the Simulated Airless Body uh, Emission Laboratory Sable. And um, it's a vacuum, thermal vacuum chamber with inside it, we can control the temperature of our samples. We illuminate them uh, both using both heaters and a lamp and we create a, a lunar-like environment. Uh, we heard from Alessandro yesterday about a similar setup at, at DLR and there's setups at um, Oxford, uh, Stony Brook, Brown University and, and soon University of Central Florida. But having these setups is, is really important for understanding these phenomena and how they're interpreted. One of the things we have been doing beyond just looking at mineral mixtures and simulants is looking at actual Apollo soils. On the left here are diviner data of all of the Apollo sampling stations uh, for which we have uh, geochemical information from the return samples. And on the right are laboratory data of the reference soils uh, that were collected at those. So these are the very uppermost um, measurements. And we see very similar trends. Um, the the y-axis here is, is iron plus titanium. And the x-axis is the location of the Christiansen feature, which is our primary compositional indicator in this wavelength range. Um, there is a difference though. You'll see there's a shift. This line here um, on the, in the diviner data, it, it does not overlie the lab data. And this is expected because the lab data is actually has the lamp at a 50 degree instance, while the diviner data has been normalized to a zero degree instance. And this is one of these, these factors that we see when the solar illumination angle changes, that changes the thermal gradient and that shifts the spectral features. We have to take that into account. Um, and one of the directions we wanna go here is that you can see there's actually some uh, diviner compositions that we don't have in our uh, Apollo sample measurements. And so we wanna get some of those too and see if the, the trend is continuing. One of the other things that was noticed was that if you take something of, of a known composition and make it darker, it also changes the, the location of this feature. And so there's experiments that were done by Catherine Shirley, uh, adding carbon to uh, different minerals and watching the, that Christiansen feature uh, shift to uh, shorter wavelengths. And there's a test here we can do with diviner as well. If there were a way of having compositionally independent albedo, would we see a similar effect? And we did see this because the optical maturity parameter is a form of compositionally independent albedo. And Paul Lucy was able to use this to come up with an additional correction and actually remove space weathering effects um, from, our, uh, from the diviner data set. This was originally published in 2017 and recently we published an updated version as well. And then moving towards you know, your forward modeling, the power with the parameter APL has been working a lot in this area and using 
um, optical scattering code and uh, models that use very thin layers. So these are layers that are on the order of tens of microns, as opposed to the typical millimeters or centimeters you might use in thermal modeling to look at the structure of this very upper surface and using optical properties um, from uh, um, with uh, uh, crystals that are, are measured with a bunch of different orientations as well. And the plot I wanted to point out here is actually the one on the right. Um, these models would predict, uh, as uh, we'd expect, that in the Chris Johnson feature region, which is on the left side of this plot on the, on the lower left, that you would be getting energy from deeper inside the sample than you would at the longer wavelengths. And we do see this. We're actually getting energy from two to three times deeper at seven or eight microns than we are at 15 to 20 microns. This is another case where we have the model that, that suggests this should happen, and we've actually seen it with Diviner as well. So uh, there's been a few times that we've been able to observe the moon in eclipse with Diviner. Um, this is some of that data. So the map here on the left is showing our orbit tracks going over the eastern part of Mari Morum. And the time um, sequence here is that uh, it's uh, the initial orbits are starting on the right and are moving to the left, and they're about two hours apart. So the first few here are when the moon was warm and normal, then it goes into the umbral eclipse and comes back out and then gets back up to, to temperature very quickly once again. And we actually saw that uh, at the longer wavelengths, we had a warmer temperature in that first orbit after coming out of eclipse because more energy was being deposited in that top layer and the interior was actually a little bit cooler, which was a really nice observation. And then we reproduced it in the lab as well where we had let a sample cool off a lot and turned our lamp on and watched that same spectral region as we observed in diviner heat up first and then equilibrate to the typical. So we're seeing these, these wavelength uh, dependence as a function of um, the uh, illumination situation as well. And then the final thing I wanted to mention here is composition. We know this is really important on the moon because the moon is made largely of transparent silicate minerals. Um, but what we see in the lab when we look at minerals is very much exaggerated to what we see when we look at lunar soils because lunar soils have opaques and, and uh, meteoritic material and whatnot mixed in. When you start going to even darker things like carbonaceous chondrites, and this is some data that uh, Carrie Downs and Hannah collected, the thermal gradient either is so strong that you're seeing past it at all wavelengths or something else is going on because you don't see this, the shifts are not nearly as large. This is one of the great questions that we hope to be able to investigate with Bepi Colombo is, is, is mercury so dark that these thermal gradients aren't setting up in the same way that they are in the moon? So in, in summary, um, we, uh, you know, we, we uh, uh, see these thermal gradients. Um, we've been observing them through observations and laboratory experiments and models. And we're really trying to understand how all these different surface properties are affecting them. And uh, there's a, a num number of different ways in which we're continuing to work on this. One of the things we're really excited about is bringing in some machine learning techniques. And um, these are needed because of these additional new data sets that are going to be coming in just a few years. Thank you. Much. So our next speaker is also from uh, APL. It's uh, Joshua Cahill, and he'll talk about the implications for interpreting LRO lamp observations. Thank you. Um, my name is Joshua Cahill. I'm from APL. I'm at talk to you a little bit about uh, some of the data we've been collecting to put LAMP into better perspective. Uh, to give you an idea, just a little background here. The LAMP is a far ultraviolet instrument. It's uh, been orbiting the moon about 10 years, a little over 10 years at this point. Uh, it has a, a few uh, different advantages in terms of its observation techniques. Uh, initially, when it was proposed, it was proposed primarily uh, to observe uh, the polar regions permanent, within permanent shadow uh, because it uh, could not only um, collect observations uh, in daylight in a bi-directional sense, but it could also collect observations at night um, from uh, two other sources, that being the interplanetary medium, uh, basically collecting uh, information uh, from the sky, from excited hydrogen uh, illuminating the regions, as well as starlight. <clears throat> in this particular instance. 
And the calibration, and this is fairly complex, Chesare can tell you more about it. <laughs> Basically, you have multiple thousands of stars that they're calibrating for in order to do that. Um, one of the kind of sideshows until relatively recently was uh, deriving composition and understanding it in, in the context of uh, maturity uh, that we see in the moon that has been so prevalent in uh, the near infrared and, and even recently in the thermal infrared uh, information uh, coming back to the moon. Um, <clears throat> so uh, just back, uh, back up real quick. Uh, so this is what we're kind of familiar with. Uh, this is a wide angle camera monochrome image from LROC. Uh, what we actually see um, in a couple of different perspectives, and I may be going a little bit back and forth between uh, daytime and nighttime. Uh, and I apologize for that. I'll try to keep you up to date with which I've switched to recently. Um, in this particular context, I'm looking at nighttime uh, in uh, the um, Lyman alpha band. Uh, and Basically, you go through this inversion in terms of uh, the actual the albedo of the surface of the moon, where uh, things that are normally bright come back as dark, uh, and things that are normally dark are actually the bright things. And there was some back and forth initially. Uh, generally speaking, we think of uh, going down into the, further and further into ultraviolet as you see less and less actual penetration into the minerals um, and, and the composition actually affecting it. Uh, a little bit less. Um, and so it's thought that a uh, majority of the signal coming back is actually the surface properties of the moon, basically the, the surface scattering. And so a number of things that are different here is that you see a lot of young things that are coming through uh, relatively uh, easily. So uh, younger craters, especially Coper Copernican and younger, uh, pop right out. There's Jackson Crater over here, uh, as well as uh, Tycho uh, down here. But you also see a number of things uh, that are very superficial um, and very immature that are popping out, even at a global scale. So that's Reiner Gamma right here, Descartes, and then uh, a bunch of swirls, which we've, we've been trying to make the case that we actually see more swirls down in the far ultraviolet than we actually do uh, in some of the, the longer wavelength bands. Um, I, I submitted that for paper. They said, prove it. <laughs> and so we kind of had to take a step back it's like, okay, let's break this down and how, how do we actually prove this? But just to give you an example, uh, so uh, this is uh, one of the photometric anomalies that we published on in 2016. Um, it's just north of Wolf Crater, which in and of itself is really kind of a fascinating area. Uh, but uh, you see this optical anomaly that comes right out in Lyman Alpha, uh, whereas you don't necessarily see it in the 415 monochrome. Uh, but if, if you do some band ratios, you can get it to pop out. But in, in Lyman Alpha, it just, it's, really apparent. Uh, so uh, a number of us have kind of been busy uh, on the front in terms of uh, one of the, I told you kind of there's this back and forth between how much is, is actually surface scattering and physical properties related versus how much we're actually detecting composition. Uh, ben Byron uh, has been in hard at work uh, taking a look at this. And so uh, this is where we switch back to daytime observations. And this is an off to on band ratio. I'll, I'll explain that a little bit more in just a moment. Uh, and that's been, this has been through a, a lot of work, uh, again, thanks to Chesare and um, others. Uh, and it's finally starting to look a lot more like what we're expecting of the moon. So this isn't Lyman Alpha. This is actually a little bit longer wavelengths into the far ultraviolet. So just even with those 100 uh, nanometers uh, within uh, our spectral range, um, you know, we see this dramatic inversion uh, just going to a little bit longer. Uh, wavelengths. Of course, you know, this is an optical maturity map here. Uh, and so if it were only surface scattering as what we're seeing, it should look a lot more uh, similar to this. But we're, we're seeing kind of these compositional effects uh, uh, coming through. And he uh, went on to do a, some additional work here uh, and uh, relative to iron content and plagioclase content derived from some of the computer data sets and seeing relatively good uh, correlations. And so we're continuing to drill down on that. Uh, one of the recent studies <clears throat> that uh, Elizabeth Chaika has done, I promised to plug this for her, uh, was that uh, we're taking a look at a very compositionally dynamic region, which is Aristarchus Crater. Uh, she took a, a relatively simple analysis of, of, of several regions within the crater and seeing uh, kind of this, um, what has been had been verified uh, within laboratory studies where we see this 
high albedo difference in anorthite versus other mineralogy, say quartz evolving. And um, we're kind of seeing this in the central peak relative to the surroundings. And she, it, it's very interesting paper. You should uh, take a look at it. Uh, and she's arguing this it's not like it's not just a north site, it's an alkali north site. You you see through the petrologic data and taking a look at Apollo uh, throughout the years. <clears throat> so um if you're familiar with the near infrared and ultraviolet studies throughout the years, so this constant maturity is in the way. I can't determine the composition, or the composition is messing with our interpretation of of the relative age of the surface is kind of in, in back, back and forth and in flux. So uh, this has been touched on quite a bit in some of the previous uh, studies in one, one shape or uh, another. Um, in the context of, of Lyme and Alpha and, and the far ultraviolet, it is thought that we're, you know, we're actually penetrating not as deeply within a particular grain as we would uh, normally uh, in, in longer wavelengths. So. Uh, we're either just um, penetrating within the upper nanometers of the surface or barely getting the compositional information between. Um, so there, there's a little bit back and forth uh, going through that. <clears throat> so we decided to start uh, taking a look at uh, some other contexts. I had mentioned before about the, the swirls, which we thought we were seeing uh, further elsewhere. Uh, uh, Recently, we were selected um, for Lunar Vertex to go to uh, to take a Prism Suite to Reiner Gamma. A student of mine, uh, Danny Waller, uh, started taking a look at Reiner Gamma, trying to figure out, okay, if we break this down uh, a little bit further, how can we confirm that we're seeing swirls in other places that some of the longer wavelength bands aren't necessarily doing? And I'm running short on time, but basically, what is apparent if we're looking in Lyme and Alpha data or Alpha on band ratio data is there are areas of Reiner gamma that we don't necessarily see, uh, which just throws cold water on my theory that we're seeing swirls and we're a little bit more sensitivity. What, what is going on? Uh, so that we have these regions where we don't see it. They're obviously apparent in the ultraviolet data. Uh, so we, we went and we started taking a look um, at this. We were able to uh, break this down a little bit further uh, where um, initially these profiles, uh, this one going right down here where we didn't, necessarily see it. We actually do. We were able to confirm that profile, but it's kind of noisy. Danny was able to confirm it a little bit more with some statistics. Um, so this paper is out, and I encourage you to take a look at it. And basically, in, in this context, what, what you're seeing is there are regions within Reiner Gamma where the, the magnetic field is actually compressed when the solar wind is, is um, pressing um, more uh, with more strength on the lunar surface. And so you have this give and take in these regions where the, the magnetic field is weaker. And so you're, you're gradually maturing this area a little bit more than other parts of the swirl. Um, and so since we're more sensitive to that type of thing, we're seeing it as, as relatively mature. So we went and the idea was, well, how do we confirm this in the lab? So we went into the lab. We have this unique capability that's not so, so unique anymore. We can measure from the far ultraviolet um, to the mirrored bread. Same samples, same conditions. And so what I'm going to do is I'm going to walk you through this really quick. And so this is basically just touching on the outer edges of mirrored bread, three different maturity levels. And we're going to walk all the way from the mirrored bread down into the far ultraviolet. So you see good separation here. You can see a water hydration band, even though it's under vacuum, that, that hasn't been driven off yet. Moving down into the other wavelengths, this gain or absolute reflectance that you're seeing differences between the uh, soil, uh, the soils of different maturities is is starting to um, is starting to uh, be dampened between the submature and mature regions. And as you go deeper down into the near ultraviolet and then in the far ultraviolet, they're virtually indistinguishable. Okay, so. Effectively, we've proven that moving down into the ultraviolet and the far ultraviolet, we are more sensitive to this type of thing. That is good consequences and bad consequences. We're in the middle of trying to unravel that. Okay. So I'm running short on time. I'll let yeah. Okay. I think I think I've actually just said what I wanted to say. So <laughs> all right, thank you.
Right. Yeah, I realize we're running a bit late, but we also started late uh, to give you more time for the coffee break. Uh, I'm sure you'll understand. So we have two more talks. So the next one is uh, of uh, Urs Mal of the Max Planck uh, Institute for Solar System Research. And his talk has the title, Finding the Missing Stones, the Mass Wasting Optical Maturity Connection. Hello, everybody. We are moving a little bit from the micro to the macro world. Mass wasting is one of the most significant geomorphological processes. These processes have not only been observed on Earth. You see here, we have them observed on comets. We have seen them on asteroids. And we have mapped them on the moon, as the two uh, images on the right side shows. The cartoon on the left side should give you a little bit an impression how one tries to classify those uh, mass wasting processes and those landslides. When I show you here an uh, image which is only a couple of days old, I'm doing this because I'm showing you here at this lovely place in the middle of Switzerland, a huge landslide which is taking place and which has been monitored with all the technological possibilities which we have at hand. And despite this, we are unable to predict what's going on and get the timing precise. Within one night, this whole rock came down and nearly wiped out this image. And the projection and what we thought, you know, were only approximation in terms of one had expected. Now, several teams and groups have tried to summarize what we have, what we have observed on the moon in terms of falls, rock slides, debris slides, lumps, flows, sweeping flows, creeps, and so on. So we have these type of maps and as this former uh, image showed you, it's a highly complex process. But the fantastic thing is here, the moon is not only for us an archive in terms of the history of the solar system, if you think of solar wind implantation, but it's also a fantastic uh, lab to investigate some of these skill mechanical processes. And I'm absolutely intrigued what I heard this morning in terms from our Norwegian colleagues and the research they are doing. Now, I'm only focusing on the absolute simplest case. I'm looking at the rock falls. So just boulders which roll and which leave a track. So why are we doing this? You know, these type of rock falls, we are interested in finding out ultimately what triggers them. And you know, there are internal and external factors. And here again, I only look at the external factors, namely the weathering of the rock strata and the earthquake and vibrations as a possible mechanism to trigger those faults. Now, there are two camps in the literature which very often discuss and you dispute what is really going to happen. And I want to explore with you a little bit what we actually can see. So I'm only looking here at the weathering processes. Everybody from you knows without doing any computation, when you want to take a sun bath, where you put your chair, whether you're going on the north side or the south side. Now, if you look at the moon, it's a little bit more complicated. And I've produced for you here, you see it here on the top side of this panel, you see on the uppermost row, the same crater with an aspect angle of 0.2, so the diameter to depth ratio. In the middle, you see the same crater at the equator, and in the lower one, you see the same crater again at the southern hemisphere. And when I move now the illumination over the local hour angle, you see how we have a gradient going from north to south. At the equator, it's homogeneous. In the north, the northern part of the crater has obviously a higher temperature. On the lower, a smaller, and it's reverse on the southern side. 
Now, I have no time to go in all the details. This is the situation for the uh, crater walls. Jamie Molaro and colleagues have worked out the details, what's happening to a boulder being sitting in the lunar regolith as the sun changes and looked at the thermal conditions and the thermal stresses. And I recommend to you that if you are interested, you are reading these very interesting papers. So we have two situations. A rock could be sitting there, could experience a thermal shock, and could start falling because of the mass imbalances which develop, or it could stay there, and over time you would have a thermal cycling known as rock fatigue. If you go into the literature, you see the extreme cases from people arguing that there should be no thermal fracturing taking place to the fact that we now have observed on Mars the thermal stress-induced rock falls on the crater slope. And if you go through recent literature, you find a lot of contradicting uh, papers on this subject. We are clear. There are several factors. There are the environmental factors, there is the rocks themselves, and there is the stress loading, which can be different. And of course, the situation is complicated because you cannot investigate this separately. You are faced with the situation that all these factors play a role. Now, the first thing we wanted to do, we wanted to find those boulders. And thanks to LRO, we were able, in the framework of a PhD thesis, to produce a map of these rock falls. On the top image you see here from Kreslavsky and Jim Head, an investigation which shows you the slope, the slopes uh, of these lunar topography. And you see there are only a few places where you have these high slopes, mainly in craters. And so it's not a surprise that we find in this artificial intelligence search the boulder sitting in those craters. So we have generated an archive of 160,000 lunar boulders with tracks. And now the goal is, of course, to use this, this information. So the question is, can we really trust these artificial intelligence result. And in order to do this, I was hoping some colleagues would take up uh, these archives and investigate it, but unfortunately nobody was willing to do this task. So I used the pandemic to do it with a colleague myself. And we have chosen something like 180 craters all over the moon and were with imaging and uh, directly searching uh, looking for those boulders. We tried really to use exactly the same image database which the artificial intelligence had. So the problem you already see, what the artificial intelligence, you feed them all these images in, but you have this area which are shaded. You can work this out and we have done this and you can ultimately create, of course, nice mosaics without any boulders without any shades, so that you should see really all the boulders. Here you see some of these boulders. So I just show you some results from the imaging approaches that we really see those types of uh, tracks on these images. This is one of the results for one particular crater. You see on the right side what we have in the RE database and what we find. So instead of 98 artificial intelligence boulders, a human search with the help of those imaging finds 1200. And this is the summary which shows you that the RE actually only finds, you know, 20% at best. So how can we now go and try to find out whether this thermal weathering is at work? The idea is we need an area of investigation. This should be clearly defined. The crater is an ideal thing. So all we need to do is focus on craters, but we need, of course, craters which are absolutely symmetric. We cannot use craters, which I show you here, which have a structure, which have superimposition, which are all inside this artificial intelligence database. And once we have good craters, we simply can try to find this. 
So here I pick one particular crater where we have an image. I show you the elevation. I show you the slope angles. We are looking for the symmetry, asymmetry of the slope walls. And if I say this is a decent candidate for doing the research, I can start counting. Now, what we noticed that even for the human, sometimes it's very difficult on these images to spot all those boulders. And here comes the optical maturity information in place. We found the clear correlation between boulder distribution density and OMAT. And I just give you now an example for a non symmetric crater. When you look directly on the OMAT map, it pops out that these boulders, which the artificial intelligence would count, you would realize that these are new craters in the crater itself, which are destroying your statistic. Here an image. So what we can now do is we can go and count, and I spare you here from going over 180 craters and do the statistics, but you see, you clearly see high latitude, craters show the statistics that you have this northern uh, south asymmetry. You have at the equator more or less an equal distribution and asymmetry north-south, and you can then observe also the southern asymmetry. So I summarize. We have clearly shown that we find these asymmetries pretty consistently. We have shown that you cannot trust artificial intelligence just out of the box. You need to be very careful. And I also would like to stress that, of course, not all the craters which we see have this pattern. We have found some very interesting cases where we do not find these asymmetries. And this is not surprising because the world is not black and white, meaning we only have the thermal. We also could have, of course, the impact which are triggering some of these fold, boulder uh, rock falls. So let me thank once more Mark and his team for using this data. It's absolutely fantastic what we can do it. I would also mention Eric Mallare because the progress in the CreepMax site has been fantastic. And some of the stuff we, which we have done offline, you could even do today on this site. So I'm looking forward especially to talk to some of my colleagues here in terms of these geomechanical aspects. And I think there's a lot of fascinating stuff coming out. Thank you very much. Okay, so the last speaker of this session is uh, Gwendolyn Bart, University of Idaho. Hello, my name is Gwen Bart, and I'm from the University of Idaho in the United States. And I have really enjoyed hearing all the talks this um, at this conference about the different aspects of the lunar surface. So I'm going to continue that and um, talk about regolith depths on the moon. So the lunar surface is covered in regolith, and by regolith here, I am referring to the loose layer of broken up rocks in uh, that covers the surface of the moon that um, is formed primarily by meteorite impact. And so here uh, you can see, this is a schematic from a paper by Wilcox in 2005, and it's just a cross section of the regolith. And what I wanted to show you here was a couple different things. So um, this is, Regolith is primarily formed by meteorite impact. And so because of the nature of meteorite impact, um, the first point I want to make is that the regolith itself is not a consistent depth over a uh, surface. It's going to be highly variable because of the um, variable nature of where the impacts occur and how large they are. So for instance, here in the middle, you can see there's an area here that doesn't have much bedrock, whereas over here, the bedrock comes up much closer to the surface. And that's one important point to keep in mind um, toward the later on toward the end of my presentation. And then the second point I want to make is that 
the lunar regolith primarily grows as a result of um, impacts that are large enough to excavate below the existing regolith. So here in the middle where you have a regolith that um, is already deeper, if you have a impact like this, it will serve to turn the regolith and um, cause fresh material perhaps to come to the surface, but it won't actually make the regolith get any deeper. And in order to actually make the regolith get deeper, you're gonna need an impact that actually comes down and excavates more of that solid rock out from underneath the surface um, to get to the top. So um, because of this, uh, the lunar regolith is gonna get deeper as you have impacts that um, excavate beneath the existing regolith. And we know that impacts are occurring to this very day. And so the conclusion from this is what I have started calling the depth age hypothesis, which is that older surfaces should have thicker regoliths than younger surfaces. And on this next slide, I have the same text, but I've added a bunch of references to show you that this is not something I'm just making up. Um, Shoemaker and Morris, of course, back in the day in 1970 and have multiple papers about the lunar regolith um, justifying why it should be considered to be formed primarily by impact and that the impact, the regolith depth will grow as you get impacts that are big enough to excavate beneath the existing regolith. And there are lots and lots of papers. These are just some example ones. And including up to this day, I um, highlighted the paper here by Hayao Bayashi in 2018. Um, who also makes this specific assertion. Um, and then the second point that impacts continue the, to this day, um, of course, Malin in 20, 2006 used the Mars Orbiter camera to um, show that there have been new impacts forming since um, the, uh, uh, in the present day. And then Dalbar in 2013, and as well, she has a new paper in 2022, more new impacts, thousands of new impacts have been discovered on Mars. And um, Spire in 2016 has a paper about new impacts on the moon. And there are several other papers about that too coming from the um, LRO team. And so um, this conclusion is not also a new conclusion from me. This conclusion is um, a conclusion that has been put forth by people um, back from the 1960s up to the present day. So um, I'm gonna show you some of the data that supports this depth age hypothesis. So this is one of the older data sets. This is by Oberbeck and Quaid in 1968. And they used the lunar orbiter data to um, divide um, different lunar orbiter images into different regolith or different surface types. And so they said they did some crater counting and that they, um, although they were not specific about how or why or what those details were. But they said type one is the least cratered surface. So it should be the youngest. Type two is more cratered, type three is more cratered, type four is the, has the most craters. And then they used a particular method to determine regolith depth on each of these crater surface types. And they found in fact that regolith depths increase uh, with surface age. So this plot very clearly supports the depth age hypothesis and you look at that and you're like, yes, okay, this is good. But um, since then, obviously, crater counting has totally taken off and become a very detailed and precise thing that everyone's working on to try to get ages uh, for surfaces on the moon that are as precise as we can get. So here's one example of um, Hessinger in 2011, who has, again, there's a whole series of papers that they put together where they have measured ages for these various Mari surfaces. And so you can see that um, there are some Mari surfaces that are much older than 3.5 uh, billion years. Uh, there are quite a number of the blue ones that are around 3 billion years old. And then there's fewer, but there's still a few um, of Mari surfaces with ages of 2 billion years and even younger. So what I did is I went back and I took this Oberbeck and Quaid data and they had listed which lunar orbiter images they had used. So I went and compared that with the locations of these Hessinger uh, Mare to get actual ages for the surfaces where they took their data. And then I replotted it to see what it looked like. So here you can see, once again, you have regolith depth 
on uh, the y-axis here. And so these are the regolith depths that Oberbeck and Quaid had measured. But when you take each of the ages of the various lunar orbiter surfaces and you plot those regolith depths where they go, uh, you can see that there's a wide range of these type two uh, regolith, uh, type two surfaces that they found, and it covers a wide range of ages. And that here around 2.5, um, there's actually a stack up of a wide range of regoliths at the same age. So this is kind of an interesting um, plot. It's not no longer clear uh, whether this data really supports the depth age hypothesis so much. So in fact, other authors since Oberbeck and Quaid have also claimed that their regolith depth measurements also support the depth age hypothesis. And here's uh, four papers um, spanning a kind of wide range of dates over the last 50 or so years. The Nakamura data in the upper left is the seismic data from the Apollo um, seismic um, experiment on the moon. Um, and then the BART 2011 is the work I had done on comparing regolith depths on the near side versus the far side. And then there are a couple more um, data sets down lower. Uh, the FA data, they studied four different lava flows in sinus iridium. And the D paper um, used actually a slightly different method um, using topography to measure regolith depths. And so all of these papers stated to some extent that, yes, look, our data show an increasing regolith depth with age. But if you look here, um, you can see that the regolith depths, um, they're all greater, well, they're not a real tight correlation. Let's put it that way. And I'm running out of time, so I'm gonna move on and just show you this is my main plot. I put all this data together on one plot to see what it looks like, because I thought, well, maybe, um, maybe things will be clearer, because a lot of these plot, other plots, you know, they have like five data points, and that's kind of hard to tell um, what you're doing. So here we put it all together. And indeed, we see that, okay, at the youngest surface on this plot, it's a lower regolith depth. And yes, there are two high regolith depths over here at large age. But for the most part, most of this data seems to fall within a box uh, that's between about three meters regolith depth and eight meters regolith depth. And in the end, I would say this is actually a really good correlation. Um, it says all these people have used extremely different methods for how to find the regolith depth. And they all found something between three and eight. I mean, that's pretty good um, because the regolith depth is highly variable on each surface. Um, but we're not seeing, I would say, a very clear trend of the regolith depth clearly increasing with age. Um, so in conclusion, it seems like theoretically, given our understanding of how we think the regolith forms, the older surfaces should have thicker regoliths than younger regoliths, than younger surfaces. But it's not clear that the existing data support that hypothesis. So why is this? That is a very good question. And we are continuing to collect new data and um, we hope to have another paper coming out maybe this fall. I have a graduate student working with me, Elizabeth Atang, who's taking some new data. And we're hoping to better understand what is going on and why the existing data may not be properly, um, be clearly showing us a trend of increasing depth with age. Thank you very much. All right, may I ask all the speakers of the session again back on stage for a very quick Q&A before we break for lunch. Are there any questions from the audience or from people online? Maybe you can ask the question, I'll repeat it. Too long, I can't repeat it. <laughs> there you go. This is for Ben. Um, so I'm wondering, so a number of people are doing near field microscopy of samples. So does this emissivity issue also pertain to the near field? I guess I, I don't fully understand what you mean by near field. Okay, so the, so the near field is you know, have an optical tip. Oh. And then and, and they just look at really spatially localized uh, mapping. 
Um, but there is some data that I've seen where they see the Christensen feature move around uh, as they sort of, you know, map the, the map the feature. And uh, but, the, but the but the chemistry or the the composition isn't changing. So could it be some, you know? Yeah, that's that's an interesting idea. So what I was talking about specifically here would require a temperature change to be driving the shift in the Christensen feature. So this is probably something different than that. Um, but I would be interested in learning learning more about that. Uh, Bernard Cohen, Urban Mars, about the, the, the zero correlation uh, uh, of um, uh, uh, regular depths with age. Uh, I've, uh, whether you have also information about the change of the dispersion of the measurements uh, with age. In particular, well, what is the statistics of area which has a very little thickness, because this could be very interesting, then you could go to bedrocks and so on, and those that have a high amount of uh, regular thickness. So is there a case where this dispersion will be different uh, as a function of age? Yes, so um, one of, um, definitely the regolith depth is highly variable. Is that what you're referring to? And so it could be that this range that I'm seeing is, yeah, the, has to do with the variability of the regolith. And perhaps certain areas um, tended to be, yeah, I, th I think that might be part of it, that it might be hard to get a tight correlation because the regolith is so highly variable. And then could you quantify, in fact, the, the distribution of regolith depth for a given site? And, uh... Yeah, so um, it seems that in general, um, when you do individual regolith depth measurements within one site, um, you get everything from extremely thin, basically down to the lower limit, up to, you get um, most of them group, I'd say within a couple meters, maybe five meters at the most, you get 50% of your data. And then you get a huge tail out toward the much higher depths up to like 20 meters, and every once in a while, up, even up to 40 meters. Um, just to, to, to follow up also on the, the regular depth um, question is, um, have you considered whether that just reaches, reaches a steady state at some point and how you might be able to model that? Yes, so that's um, probably one of the things we're gonna look into. I am wondering if, yes, the regolith has somehow, yeah, reached a steady state, um, and therefore it's no longer growing. But a lot of the older papers um, that studied the regolith back in the 60s, 70s, 80s, um, seem to think the regolith should still be increasing in depth. So if that's not true, um, maybe we can use new data to better understand what's going on with the regolith. But that is something to consider. Um, but in the literature, um, that has not been what has been assumed. Okay, thank you. I also have a question for Urs. Um, so you've just been looking now at sort of the thermal situation, sort of for, for the mass wasting. Um, have you also started to look at maybe whether the craters that are in closer proximity to scarps have a different expression of mass wasting compared to ones that are farther away? Yes, that's actually on our list of one of the next tasks. We are looking now where we have the results from the distributions, which patterns we see. So that's that's to come. Hello. Yeah. Quick question to Mark um, for noble gas uh, analysis. Uh, what temperatures are we talking about? Um, um, that you require in order to do your isotope measurements. So I knew someone was going to ask this. Um, <clears throat> within our system, we can't actually correlate the laser temperature, uh, sorry, the laser power to temperature. Um, we have tried it, but because the laser couples differently to, depending on really the color of the sample that you're hitting it with. 
Um, so one of the things that we're hoping to do is to take our gas release curves and compare them to one from um, Finesse to see how their, their kind of much finer temperature control compares to our release curves. And hopefully through that, calibrate our temperature release. Yeah, that's interesting. Could, could that not be modeled perhaps to, to correlate? I mean, thermal model, through thermal modeling? Probably not common. It, <laughs> it probably could be done. Um, it take a lot of work to do it. And if, it's something we we keep as a lab looking into and and using pyrometers to to try and get the temperature as well. Okay, thanks. One last quick question. Uh, it's just a follow-up question after Carolyn's. Uh, so, like, uh, uh, to Gwen, um, it's like, um, how do you reconcile the uh, size of the impactor? Because you mentioned in, in your previous slides, in the first ones, I think, that the size of the impactor is what defines. But as, you know, time goes on, the, the more aged surface will have seen more of larger impacts. And as you go through the time, it, they become smaller and smaller. So you are essentially adding in number of impacts, but you are, the size of that impactors are going through like becoming smaller and smaller. So there is a production function for impactors that hit the lunar surface. And that's gonna have a distribution from large craters, um, which there are very few, fewer of, down to smaller craters, which there are much more of. So over time, uh, we believe that impactor distribution has been dropping. So we expect the rate of growth of the regolith to be going down, but it should still be increasing. There should still be large impactors hitting sometimes. Um, but uh, we, uh, so even though the rate at which the regolith is growing should be dropping, it should still be growing, even if it's growing more slowly. Okay, I think that concludes this session. Let's uh, thank the speakers again. And uh, now we break for lunch. Please be back at two o'clock sharp. Thank you. Um, yes, yes. Uh, I need a plenary again, right? Yeah. Thank you.
Okay. I think we, we are ready to start the afternoon session. The afternoon session is about the commercial lunar payload services. And the first talk is from Maria Banks. Uh, so I just kindly ask all the speakers to stay within the allocated time in order to have uh, enough uh, uh, for uh, some question at the end. So please, Maria, go on. Yours. Okay. Hi, everyone. Welcome back from lunch. <laughs> um, okay, so my name is Maria Banks, and um, I'm a project scientist on one of the CLIPS um, deliveries or missions. Um, <clears throat> excuse me. And so myself and um, the other project scientists for these different deliveries, we're uh, we're reaching out to the you know the wider lunar community um, to give some talks at some of these conferences. Um, we just want to create awareness of the really wonderful wide range of science investigations and technology demonstrations that are being incorporated into these landers. And so that's what I'm going to focus on today, telling you a little bit of uh, where we're going and um, what some of the different instruments are, but focusing on uh, those objectives. So um, I don't have too much time today. Whoops, let me, okay, there we go. <laughs> um, so I just want to bring this to your attention of this uh, website that NASA is hosting and keeping updated. Um, you'll see uh, on the, on the, there's a bar in blue there at, near the top of, of the webpage um, that has the different um, NASA de designations. I'm sorry, I'm a little out of breath from running here from lunch. <laughs> um, <laughs> Um, so the different NASA designations for the different uh, deliveries. And so you can click on that and dig in for more details about uh, the different payloads and all of their, the nitty gritty of their science objectives. So I'm just gonna hit on the highlights, some of the um, top points right now to give you a sense of what we're doing. So you can uh, start brainstorming all the really wonderful investigations you're gonna do yourself with that great data. So for some of you that are not as familiar, I thought I'd start with just a little bit of intro, especially some of the lingo. Uh, you'll see on all my slides, TO, which stands for task order. And then I've, I've been using the word delivery and mission. So NASA uses the word term, sorry, NASA uses the term deliveries <clears throat> because NASA sponsored payloads are being delivered to the surface. And then the missions, uh, the mission name is, is um, created by the vendor, the CLIPS commercial vendor. So, NASA has a, a designation for each delivery, and then the commercial vendor <clears throat> creates a mission name. So I just put an example there, Task Order 19D or Blue Ghost Mission 1 are the kind of the same thing. So just to explain that, because I know that's confusing to some people, um, and NASA refers to their sponsored instruments as payloads. So I'll be using that word. Um, and then just a quick summary, uh, deliveries are currently scheduled to land in 10 unique locations on the lunar surface with more than 50 NASA sponsored science and technology demonstrations. So it's really a wonderful um, wide range of things that are happening and going on. <clears throat> and something to think about as you're planning your own investigations is that some of these payloads are flying on more than one lander. So in other words, they're going to more than one location on the surface. Um, so they'll be doing the same types of activities, collecting similar data, but in several different locations on the surface. And then also LRO will be collecting um, complementary data from orbit from their suite of instruments um, for all of these investigations. So anyway, something to think about as you think about what things you might wanna do with this data. Um, and then this next bullet I just added because I get asked that a lot. Um, the landing site selection uh, was originally the responsibility of the vendor, and then as, as uh, the CLIPS program has progressed, they've made that now the responsibility of NASA down to choosing the location of that 100 meter diameter ellipse. Um, and so that's now selected before the commercial vendors even uh, propose. Um, and each lander has a retroreflector. Okay, and then just real quick, this is a list of all 14, uh, the original 14 companies eligible to propose to the CLIPS task orders. And then on the right there, um, I have the four CLIPS vendors that currently have contracts, which are Intuitive Machines, Astrobotic, Firefly, Aerospace, and Draper. Okay, so let's dig in with the time I have left. Um, so this is the map of where these CLIPS landers are going. And I'm gonna go through this kind of 
separated out by year. So still targeted to launch this year, later this year, is TO2AB. So that's for Astrobotic. Uh, the mission name is Peregrine Mission 1. Um, and this is land going to the Mare surrounding the Gurthizen domes. And so there is a Clips lander headed towards the top of one of those domes, which Carrie's going to talk about in a little bit. Um, so hopefully we can get some complementary measurements from the Mari surrounding the domes. Um, and so there's a bunch of spectrometers on this lander exploring the Luno ex lunar exosphere and gases released by the regolith, looking at the thermal properties of the lunar regolith, um, examining the volatile abundance and composite composition in that near subsurface, and also looking at the radiation environment. Um, so TO2IM, this is intuitive, intuitive Machines Mission 1. So this is our first CLIPS lander headed to the South Polar region. So there's a set of cameras that are looking at plume surface interactions. Um, there's a low frequency radio astronomy receiver system, a technology demonstration, looking at precision navigation technologies through Doppler radar, a communication and navigation node for future autonomous navigation and technologies. And then uh, Prime One, this is our Eclipse lander that's headed closest to the South Pole, uh, targeting the uh, connecting ridge. So Prime One um, is primarily consisting of uh, the Trident Dell, which is paired with a spectrometer, a mass spectrometer called M-Solo. So it'll be extracting regolith up to one meter below the surface and analyzing the composition of those samples for water and other components. So also on this lander, um, they are uh, testing a 4G LTE wireless network, and there's a, a micro hopper, micro Nova, the SP hopper, which um, there's a talk that we'll be talking about this later in this session, so I'll let them speak more to that. Okay, so heading into next year, 2024, so I already mentioned 19D, or Blue Ghost Mission 1, that's headed to Mari Chrysium. There are 10 payloads on this uh, this lander, this is this is my uh, delivery, I'm happy to say. Um, so it's been a lot of fun working with these payloads. Um, but the wide range of things they're doing, um, investigating the heat flow of the lunar interior, uh, those same cameras looking at the plume surface interactions on the lander, um, testing regular sampling, te sampling technologies, acquiring X-ray images of Earth's magnetosphere, um, and constraining the temperature and structure of the thermal evolution of the moon, studying the crustal electric and magnetic fields. Uh, doing a bunch of things with dust, dust adherence on different materials and performing dust mitigation experiments using electrodynamic fields, um, testing a radiation tolerant computer system, um, and then also investigating the first use of uh, GNSS in transit, both in transit to the moon and also on the lunar surface. And this is, I'm happy to say, a collaboration between NASA and the Italian Space Agency. Um, so then our first Eclipse Prison instrument suite headed towards the moon is it's headed towards Reiner Gamma on Intuitive Missions, sorry, Intuitive Machines Mission 3. And so that has a suite of instruments designed to investigate the origin of lunar magnetic anomalies and lunar swirls, in particular looking at the properties of the Reiner Gamma swirl and its mini magnetosphere. Um, and also on this lander is gonna be a technology demonstration of a swarm of robotics. Um, so these are small autonomous rovers that have GPRs on them it's called Cadre. Um, we also have two international payloads, uh, one from Korea, which is a high energy particle detector. So it's monitoring the near, near surface space environment and ESA is providing a, uh, a large lunar laser retroreflector. Um, many of you are probably familiar with Viper or Griffin Mission 1, um, which is a solar battery powered uh, rover, which will operate over multiple lunar days um, and can travel in and out of PSRs. And so the overarching goal of Viper is to characterize the distribution of water and volatiles across a range of thermal environments and evaluate the ISRU potential at that South Pole. So that's the, it has a Trident drill paired with M Solo, which I talked about on. Um, Prime one, and also um, NSS and Nervous, those are two instruments that are also flying on that TO2AB, that Peregrine Mission one. Um, okay, in 2025, we have two deliveries going to the lunar far side. So um, probably about 20 degrees latitude on the far side is uh, TOCS3, that stands for CLIPS Science 3, or Blue Ghost Mission 2. And so that's Lucy Knight, which will be doing some low frequency radio astronomy with uh, standalone operations through the night. Um, and that also is a subject of future talks in the session, so I'll let them talk more about that. Um, but I'll also point out there's a lunar pathfinder orbiter that is being sponsored by ESA that will be part of this. 
Um, another clips, um, two, two prism suites, uh, the far side seismic suite, um, is headed towards the outer ring of Schrodinger Basin and TOCP2. This is Draper um, and their Series 2 lander. It says two seismometers that are designed to study tectonic activity on the moon and micrometeorite impact flux. Um, and then another um, prism suites, which investigating the heat flow and electrical conductivity of the lunar interior. And also Lucy Light, which again, I think is going to be talked about a little bit later in this session. And then these are the last two that I'm going to refer to. Um, so uh, CP21, um, so this doesn't have a mission name yet because uh, the vendor has not, the vendors haven't proposed or been selected yet. So this is Lunar Vice. Um, and so that just the overarching goal is to investigate the composition and origin of the domes. And as I mentioned, Carrie Donaldson is gonna be talking about that a little bit later in more detail. Also on this lander, the Heimdall Imaging Suite, um, a technology demonstration of a robotic arm. And again, that, that low frequency radio astronomy receiver system that's flying on two of machines one um, will also be flying on this lander. And the last one I'll mention is CP22. Um, I had the pleasure of working with these uh, payload teams in selecting our landing site just as recently as last week. And uh, Prospect, which is um, sponsored by ESA, there's some talks about that later this session also, um, but also the CRISM, uh, PRISM Instrument Suite LEA, which is a little bit different. Um, it's going to be studying the biological response of yeast to the lunar environment, and, and through that measuring the radiation levels at the lunar surface. Um, there's an imaging um, radiometer that's going to be uh, making measurements on the mineralogical and thermal physical uh, properties of the lunar surface. A flux magnetometer, which is characterizing the vector field of the moon, both at low latitudes and on the surface and uh, SEAL, which is characterizing the chemical response of the regolith to the landing of the lander. So um, I invite you to uh, reach out to me if you have any questions. I'd, I'm happy to talk about the science that Eclipse is doing. Thank, Thank you. you very much, Maria. So let's skip to the second presentation by Rachel Klima. I don't know if I pronounced it. Correctly. Yeah. <laughs> mm. Good afternoon setting a timer so I stay on time here. All right, so I'm gonna be talking about Lunar Trailblazer, which is actually a ride along on one of the CLIPS missions. Um, we were originally selected in June of 2019 and we weren't planned to fly um, with CLIPS. We were um, kind of planned to fly with whatever we could fly with. And we originally manifested with, um, uh, oh my God, I'm having a, a with IMAP. Uh, it would have launched in 2025, but the CLIPS office was able to accommodate us launching earlier um, with the Intuitive Machines IM2 mission. So we're really excited about that. And we think that in addition to the uh, orbital science that we're going to be really blazing trails with on Lunar Trailblazer, this is a good model for how we can get orbital assets into space um, through the CLIPS program. So we hope that NASA takes advantage of that more in the, in the future. So as I mentioned, we're going to be launching um, later this year um, in probably third or fourth quarter of, um, of 2023. The mission is run out of Caltech by Bethany Elman, and I'm the deputy PI. And what we've designed the mission to do is to look into this problem that you heard a lot about this morning of lunar water, understanding the character of the lunar water, migration of lunar water across the surface, um, understanding what form it's in, and really trying to follow up with data that's, that's tuned to actually analyze the properties of that water in a way that M cubed wasn't designed to do because we didn't expect to see water when we flew M cubed. So the way that we're doing that is with two instruments, um, the HVM cubed, which is a um, basically a descendant of the M cubed mission, but designed now to cover that full wavelength range of the three micron band. So we go from 0.6 to 3.6 microns, and we maintain that full spectral resolution that you saw in Janice's talk with the 10 nanometer. Um, spectral resolution so that we can distinguish features, uh, OH features from water features and do a lot better 
with the modeling and trying to understand what water may be indigenous to the moon and what water looks more like something that's more um, formed with interactions of the solar wind or other properties on the lunar surface. Now, in addition to this, one of the biggest uh, bugaboos, I'll use like a Carly word there, uh, has been that we need to understand the temperature very clearly of the surface um, at the same time that we're measuring the spectral properties in the near infrared. So to do that, we've got the LTM instrument, which is being provided by Oxford University, to understand that it's embedded within the field of view of the M cubed images and characterizes the thermal properties at a finer scale so that we can understand even sub-pixel what the thermal properties of the surface are. So um, I said I would keep us on time and I probably won't because that was only my first slide. All right. So our goals are, uh, like I said, to determine the form abundance and distribution of water on the surface. We want to understand any possible temporal va variations. We also want to look into the permanently shadowed region. So we have two modes and I'll show a little bit later um, a little bit more about our PSR mode, but we, we will integrate longer and we'll be able to actually get um, pretty high spatial resolution within the permanently shadowed regions to understand whether we're looking at ice or other mixtures of ice in the regolith. And then finally, we want to look at all of this as a function of composition, albedo, geology, all of that, so that we can really start to disentangle a lot of the questions that we've got about water on the moon. So because I usually end up talking about science for like 10 minutes and then never talk about the instruments, we flip this one on its top a little bit. So the mission status right now is that the HVM cubed instrument is not only built, but it's been integrated onto the spacecraft. Um, here are some cool hardware pictures of that being done. Um, it was integrated at the end of last year. All the requirements are being met with flying colors. Uh, just this week, they've been integrating LTM and aligning it to um, the HVM cubed instrument. That's a picture of Tris, I believe, in uh, the thermal IR, if anyone wants to. Uh, there we go. I see him in the in the visible. He's up there, um, but in the thermal, there you go. Um, so we're very excited about that. Um, requirements are also being met on that. Here are some images of the spacecraft. This was after the TVAC. So the spacecraft is um, well on its way. Basically, we still have to um, do work with installing the solar panels. Um, LTM actually probably is installed at this point because this was from earlier this week. Vibe, um, you know, magnetic interference, all those things. Um, and we're going to be ready the end of the summer, which is just crazy. Um, like this entire thing. So I'm also on Lunar Vertex and the, the speed that these missions come together is like completely astounding compared to what most space missions do. So I, this is an incredibly exciting time to be in the lunar community and everyone should be very, very happy about that. I, we're really lucky. So now, in addition to being fast, a lot of these missions are very uh, budget constrained. And one of the things that Bethany has written into this, which is really fantastic to me as a former community college student, is working with community college students in Pasadena, as well as the students at Caltech to bring more opportunities to the community, involve more people in space, but also to help develop some of these tools like science scheduling, graphics, mission website. We're bringing in students that didn't really have access to this in, um, in the past and, and bringing them along on this ride to make sure that not only can we execute the mission in the constrained cost, but also that we um, broaden you know, the, the involvement on the return to the moon um, to more, uh, more of the world. So that's been a really, really nice aspect. And that's the wrong thing to click. So um, like I said, we'll be riding along. Um, exactly when we launch, we'll determine how long we spend in, in cruise to get there. So that's a picture of how Lunar Trailblazer will be on the little Espagrande ring at the bottom of, uh, of all of the stack. And um, once we get there, what we're going to do is we're going to be collecting images in a targeted mode. So it's a small satellite. We don't have tons and tons of data. We have to very carefully choose our targets to follow up on the questions that we have. So we have requirements to view specific geologic targets, requirements to view certain targets that we understand their composition very well at multiple times of the lunar day to understand the mobility questions. And then of course, we've got the PSR targets that we'll be looking at. Um, so as I said, we're collecting these kind of nested data. Here's a visualization of a hyperspectral image cube and then how, um, how we have this kind of like inset um, 
thermal cube that will be within the data, and then some examples of the, you know, especially in the three micron region, what, what types of data we can distinguish with the spatial and spectral resolution that we'll have. And then, of course, the, the 11 thermal channels that span the uh, Chris Johnson feature region where we can really characterize that absorption um, in great detail. All right, so I am almost out of time. Um, so the, I mentioned the PSR measurements. So we've done some simulations based on the performance of the instrument. And using just terrain scattered light, we're able to really, really peer into these shadows and understand what we're seeing spectrally. Um, so th this is a, an example of distinct, do, looking at difference measurements between molecular water and ice and the signal that we're getting basically that by doing these differential measurements, we can distinguish one per, per 100,000 difference uh, between these two species in train scattered light. Um, oh yeah, click. And there's some lines of how things scatter. Um, so we'll be putting all this together into products, looking at the uh, the thermal properties. These kind of like it probably won't be mineral maps, but it will be um, like parameter maps to understand where we're looking at different um, different species of water and uh, water hydroxyl ice, uh, different minerals, all of that. Those will be delivered to the community. And um, finally, before I'm fully out of time, this is just a visualization of the size of the the pixels that we'll be getting the actual usable spectra for within some of these permanently shadowed regions. So um, a lot of the M cube data that we've had to uh, that we've looked at to identify the ice that Shuili especially has looked at to understand that have had to be binned up spatially quite a bit to get the signal that we that we need, and we won't have to do that to the same extent. So anyway, um, you know, Lunar Trailblazer is going to be really exciting. Um, we're accomplishing really um, high impact science in a very small, um, tightly constrained uh, budget and size and everything else. Um, we're going to have our data. You know, we're targeting future landing potential landing sites, former landing sites, to really try to also help to feed into the exploration side of things. And we're super excited to be a part of this. Well, thank you, everybody. Thank you. So let's move to the next speak. speaker is uh, Kerry Donaldson Anna. Thank you. Thanks. Yeah, many thanks to the organizing committee for asking me to speak on behalf of the Lunar Vice team and tell you about our exciting investigation of the Grutheisen domes. So Maria really set me up well. She already kind of gave you an overview of Lunar Vice, but Lunar Vice is the Lunar Vulcan Imaging and Spectroscopy Explorer that was selected as a PRISM payload suite uh, as part of the NASA's uh, uh, second call, and it was specifically chosen to land at the Grutheisen domes. Our 10-day, 10 10-Earth 10 day uh, surface investigation uh, is to really understand the formation of those highly silicic um, domes. And we are uh, one of the payloads that is part of the CP21 um, payload or mission that's going to go uh, no later than January 2027. So our rover and lander payload instrument suite is really uh, designed specifically to address uh, overarching science and exploration goals, including first, we really want to understand how lunar silicic volcanism works. And so we're going to understand that by first uh, looking at the Grutheisen domes and then applying that to the other silicic regions across the lunar surface. And then we also have an exploration goal of really trying to understand the geotechnical properties of the lunar regolith um, at this special location on the lunar surface. As I mentioned, our payload is a combination of instruments on a lander uh, as well as a rover. On the lander, we have a suite of cameras. We have a, a descent camera that will be imaging uh, the lunar surface as we're descending to the surface. And this will allow us to map 
our our, our landing area as well as characterize how much of that landing area is disturbed by the interaction with the lander. And then we will also have a context camera that will be on the lander imaging uh, the surface, building up a geologic map of our landing area as well as watching the rover as it moves about and really understanding how the rover is interacting uh, with a regolith. And both of uh, these cameras are being built by Ball Aerospace and are based on heritage cameras. On the rover, we have a suite of spectrometers. Um, two of the spectrometers uh, are being built by Ball. We have a <clears throat> visible and near infrared imaging camera uh, that will be used to map variations in composition and morphologies at high spatial resolution. This camera is similar to our context camera, except that we'll have filters uh, <clears throat> on the camera that will allow us to have multispectral capabilities. We also have a heritage instrument in uh, the LV Cirrus, which is based on L Cirrus, which is going to the south pole of the moon um, as part of uh, CP22. Uh, using the thermal infrared, we'll be able to get multispectral data, which again will help us understand the composition at really high spatial resolution. And then finally, but not le least, uh, or finally, last but not least, uh, is the gamma ray and neutron spect spectrometer. Um, this gamma ray and neutron spectrometer is going to be used to measure major elemental abundances as well as thorium. Um, and this is an instrument based on Arizona State University's um, mini NS that's, uh, that's on Luna map. Uh, here's just an image. Uh, obviously, as Maria mentioned, we don't have a lander or a rover yet. And so this is uh, a very simplistic drawing, just kind of showing how the instruments are going to work on, on the rover. And so uh, you can see here that our visible near infrared, as well as our thermal infrared camera, are both bore sighted and they will sit in a single enclosure on top of uh, the rover. Based on our height, uh, if we assume that we're a meter off the surface, we should be able to see 3.6 meters in front of us. And at that distance, we'll have a resolution sub uh, centimeter. Uh, and then if you look here at the table, you can see that out to 100 meters in front of the, the rover, we should still be seeing on the order of tens, uh, uh, tens of centimeters. So really great uh, spatial resolution. Um, both of these instruments, they are they are bore aligned and they also rotate. And so essentially we'll get a 180 degree panoramic view um, of whichever direction we're pointing in, uh, and we'll be essentially be building up spectral maps as that instrument rotates through. And then on the rear of the rover uh, and located towards the bottom of the rover is our gamma ray neutron spectrometer. And this is really to limit how much materials uh, is between it and the lunar surface. So as I mentioned, our ultimate goal is really to understand the formation of the domes. Um, and so to do that, we have uh, multiple science objectives. Uh, and the first is really to map any local variations in composition. Uh, and we're gonna do that in two independent ways. And so we'll be getting silicate composition from measuring the Christensen feature uh, that, uh, that Rachel just talked about and Ben Greenhagen, Greenhagen also gave a talk earlier today about. And so by measuring uh, the position of the CF uh, feature, which you can see on uh, the Y axis here, uh, this will give us a really good constraint uh, on the silicate composition. And then we'll also be getting uh, silicate composition from our gamma ray and neutron spectrometer. And so having these two different methods for measuring silicate composition uh, will give us a really robust determination uh, of the, the rock composition, which will really help us test those high uh, hypotheses for how the domes formed. In addition, we'll also be getting thorium, which will also be really critical in understanding and constraining uh, the formation mechanisms. Of course, what we really want to do is we want to take those compositions and put them in geologic context uh, for where we're measuring these compositions across the dome. That's really key. Uh, and so not only will we be mapping composition, but we'll also be looking at rock and regolith properties, uh, including the 
uh, regolith, thermal inertia, and porosity. Uh, we'll also be correlating compositions with surface features and dome morphologies. And so this will be really critical in our understanding of how these, how these uh, domes formed. And when I say we want to study rocks and regolith, we are really studying rocks and regolith. So the intention is to be uh, driving uh, to these boulders and getting measurements at high spatial resolution um, along with the regolith. As I mentioned, we want to take what we learn here at the Grutizen domes and apply that to the rest of the silicic locations on the lunar surface. And so to do that, we have to be able to ground truth our observations at the domes. Uh, so that we can then apply them elsewhere. And so to do this, we've chosen and we've been very specific about all of our spectral channels uh, on our instruments. Um, and so for the visible near infrared, we've chosen uh, channels that overlap with Clementine, Kaguya, and Elrock WAC. Um, and for the thermal infrared, we've chosen channels that overlap with Diviner, uh, Elsiris, as well as Lunar Trailblazer. And so that will really make that critical link between our in-situ surface measurements uh, and the orbital data that will be collected. And then finally, uh, we will be using um, our, all of our camera systems uh, to really be looking at how both the lander uh, and the rover are interacting with the surface uh, so that we can get some really nice high resolution images and movies uh, to be able to understand the geotechnical properties as we traverse around uh, the dome. Most recently, we've been looking at picking a landing site. Uh, we've mostly focused on uh, a location on the Gamma Dome, which is here uh, on the left. And specifically, we've been looking at this region near the edge of the dome, which you can see uh, in this beautiful Elrock Knack image. And you can see that there's this kind of nice flat plateau right here, which is where we're, we've been looking at our landing ellipse. And we've been uh, using criteria like looking at slopes, the terrain rugged in, ruggedness index, uh, the amount of boulders and craters and the illumination, all to pick the best uh, landing site possible. And then uh, as Maria mentioned, we do also want to pick a landing site that will allow us to look at the mare below or surrounding the domes, and hopefully even depending upon where the Peregrine 1 lander lands, uh, we might be able to get uh, overlapping observations of their landing site. So here's just showing an example of the hazard analyses that we've been doing uh, to really pick uh, the best landing ellipse that minimizes uh, high slopes, high TRI, as well as boulders and craters. And so uh, this is our uh, landing ellipse. And if we put that in the context of that small impact crater uh, that I was showing earlier, uh, here's that impact crater. These are the boulders uh, that we're very interested in uh, getting close to. Here is our landing ellipse. And so assuming that we land right in the center of that uh, landing ellipse, all of the green areas is where uh, the rover will have line of sight communications with uh, the lander. And so we're now looking at what our waypoints are going to be within these areas to accomplish our science. And with that, I'll just say that we're really excited uh, to be building this uh, uh, payload suite and getting to the domes to, to really understand what they're made out of. And I'll leave my summary slide here. And I think. Thank you very much, Barry. Next speaker is Trent Martin. Good afternoon. My name is Trent Martin. I'm with Intuitive Machines. 
uh, on the South Pole Hopper. I am one of the principal investigators, the technology principal investigator. Dr. Robinson from Arizona State is our science principal investigator on this mission. I do have several other roles that do to machines. I'll let Ben talk to those later when he comes up here. What's a South Pole Hopper? So we were looking at a technology to provide extreme mobility into things like permanently shadowed regions on the South Pole or anywhere on the moon. We proposed to the NASA tipping point uh, opportunities, a technology demonstration of a hopper that could hop off of a lander, or in this case, our lander, down into a permanently shadowed region or into uh, a pit uh, or perhaps even into um, a tunnel. Um, so we developed this technology um, and presented it to NASA. They, they picked it as part of a, a tipping point proposal. The original idea was that we would demonstrate the technology, we'd demonstrate the hop, and we would simply have cameras on it. Um, scientists being scientists, we couldn't help but add instruments. So we've since added a pyrometer and a neutron spectrometer to this uh, demonstration. And because we were flying it with our Nokia tipping point as well, we added an LTE antenna to the system. So besides a UHF antenna, we also added an LTE antenna. Um, at this point, though, it's full. However, um, in the future, we will be using the same technology to provide extreme mobility into wherever you'd like to go on the moon. So if you have a technology and you'd like to fly it into an extreme location, come see me. I can probably find you a way to get there. We're flying it on our IM-2 mission. Ben is going to talk about our, all of our IM missions here a little bit. Uh, Maria talked about some of them already. But in this particular mission, one of them was Eclipse uh, mission, so our Eclipse opportunity, that was the prime one. Two of them were tipping point. So we created an entire mission out of three different opportunities with NASA. So the Micronova Hopper, which we're building internally, the prime one drill, and the MSOLO mass spectrometer, and the uh, lunar outpost and LTE communication system. Uh, we actually have a few other uh, payloads on those same missions because these are commercial missions and we can sell other opportunities, including things like um, satellite deployment into, into uh, orbit around the moon, which we do on pretty much all of our missions. The engineering goals of the South Pole Hopper are to, de to demonstrate that we can deploy from the host lander, uh, provide proper power management, end-to-end -end communications, autonomous flight for predetermined locations, autonomous hazard detection and avoidance, uh, and a constant altitude traverse flight profile and flight into and out of a PSR. Our original concept was why waste a very good uh, guidance navigation and control system that lands on the moon? Why waste that? Why not take that off of the lander and fly that into another location? So essentially the camera systems that we use on this are the same systems that we use to land on the moon. We just added a propulsion system and a computer system that allows us to go take it somewhere else. Um, that was the original intent. It, in reality, what we ended up with was a completely different package so that if someone else wanted to put it on their lander, they could fly this same instrument. The science goals are to look for geologic context and geote uh, geotechnical properties of, at the Shackleton uh, Dagger Lash Ridge, which is where we're landing the IM2 mission, in particular into and out of a PSR, uh, and in this case, the Marston Crater. Uh, determination of surface brightness, temperature, illumination, and shadow terrain. Derive the surface roughness and thermal inertia of the illuminated polar regolith and determine hydrogen abundance in the illuminated regions and within the PSR and to supplement the horizon glow imaging uh, after sunset. Some of the things that we're specifically looking for are this raindrop texture that was first noticed on Apollo 14 and Apollo 12. Uh, as we get close, really close images, as we, we hop, we're going to do five different hops with the hopper. We'll be able to get really close imagery um, at places away from the primary landing site. We'll look at soil properties. Um, in this particular case, the, the image that you see there of the footprint was actually a science experiment done on Apollo 11, where they pushed down or Buzz pushed his foot down as deep as he possibly could, and then they took imagery to see what would, what would happen with the regolith. We can do the same kind of thing as like was done here on Surveyor 3 with the foot pad, where you can actually see how, how much the regolith compacts. We're going to do it where we're landing five times and have imagery of each of those. And then this uh, elephant skin tree bark texture 
first notice in lunar orbit images in the 1960s. Uh, as, as we see this imagery from LRO and from other instruments that are measuring uh, at the lunar surface, we'll be able to, to not only take this, but compare it to much, much closer imagery that we can do uh, with our camera systems. We actually have, as I mentioned, an LRAD lunar radiometer uh, provided by DLR. Uh, we have a, a neutron spectrometer provided by Pulley uh, out of Hungary. Uh, two panchromatic CMOS cameras, a medium angle and a wide angle, and the LTE technology demonstration on this experiment, even though the original intent was just to show that we could fly a hopper off of a lander and prove that the technology worked. Uh, here's some of the images that were recently gathered from our medium and wide angle camera systems at Arizona State. Um, the, the camera systems are built by Canadensis in Canada. The CONOPS for this mission, we fly on a Falcon 9, we launch out to a 380,000 by 185 kilometer highly elliptical orbit. We cruise to the moon in about six days. Unlike some of our competitors, it does not take us three to four months to fly out to the moon. It takes us six days to get to the moon. We go into orbit around the moon for about 24 hours before we land on the surface of the moon. One of the key advantages for that is that our avionics systems only go through the Van Allen belt one time. We don't go through multiple times as we're circling out to, to the moon. Uh, Novosi lands, and then we do five hops with the, um, with the hopper itself. Uh, the commissioning hop at 20 meters, uh, the requirements hop. Actually, I'll show you. Here we go. This is a better image of that. You can see uh, where it says Nova C. That's the initial landing site. We do multiple hops, one to get off the lander. We do a short parab parab uh, parabolic hop. Then we do a hop with a, a le steady level flight. Uh, then a small hop down into the Martian crater, and then a hop back out of the crater. So in summary, the South Pole Hopper enables science and exploration in extreme terrains. The intent is to prove that you can reach uh, environments like um, the environments with a hopper that you cannot reach with a rover. Um, and it provides a val uh, val very uh, valuable platform for aerial remote sensing uh, in, the, in the lunar environment. So. You guys all have instruments. I've seen them over the last three days. Come find me. We'll find a way to put them on a hopper and we'll put them somewhere on the moon where you can get some really cool science done. Thanks. Thank you. Yeah, now we call the first four speakers for uh, we have short time for questions. If you have a, uh, would like to interact with the speakers, now we have three minutes. Let me ask one question. Uh, how long is, uh, is uh, are you able to control how long is the, um, the aerial uh, flying, flight, flight, time of flight? Yeah, so this, the hopper that we're flying on our first mission weighs 32 kilograms. With the fuel that we have, we, we could fly, if you did a single parabolic uh, trajectory, we could fly probably 10 kilometers away from the from But the are you able aircraft. to define, a, a priori, I want to fly just let's say one kilometers. Yes, so we, we predefine based on imagery that we get on the way down where we want to hop to. Huh. And then essentially our plan is five hops over five days. So we will plan a hop, do that hop, take measurements, make sure everything's good. The next day we'll do it, the second hop, et cetera. Right. Flexibility. One question there. Um, also regarding the hopper, uh, as you said, uh, three to five days, um, does the system survive the lunar night or is it constricted to uh, just day? Now, currently on our missions, we do not uh, intend to survive the night. Uh, we are looking at surviving the night on future missions. Um, at this point, though, there's there's no easy way to do that, uh, short of, of batteries, the um, very big batteries. This is a South Pole mission, so it is quite possible that on future missions of the South Pole, when you only have very short duration night times, that you could survive. Um, we are doing a test on our IM-1 mission where we're surviving into the night. On purpose, we added some extra batteries just to see how far we can get into the night and see what happens. And then our intent on that first mission and all subsequent missions is to turn it back on after, the, after we come back out of the night and see if it actually comes on. We don't expect that it will, though. Okay, Bernard Frank, you're on Mars. Uh, for Rachel uh, on the Trailblazer. Uh, 
Yeah, uh, from El Cross, we had evidence from the plume that there was eventually also some carbon uh, uh, gas, CO, CO2, uh, maybe uh, aromatics. So did you see if you would be able to detect uh, uh, CO2 ice or even aromatic um, carbon? Yeah, I mean, we do have the, the spectral resolution and range to get some of those bands, um, carbon organic bands. So um, if they're there- In terms of sensitivity? sensitivity yeah. and, um, and the spectral resolution to do that. So yeah, in the permanently shadowed regions, we could, we'll definitely be looking for that as well. Excellent, astrobiology of the lunar poles. <laughs> okay, uh, sorry, I, I have one question from uh, um, Agnese Caraman Caramanico for Kerry. Uh, what kind of parameters do you and your team use to consider more for the selection of the site? Yeah, we've primarily been looking at the amount of boulders and craters because obviously we want to uh, limit the number of hazards. We've been really focusing on slopes less than 10 degrees because we want to be able to traverse uh, very easily around the landing site, but we've also been, cons been considering illumination um, because we want to be able to operate for as many Earth days as possible. And so uh, that played a huge role and all, as well as the thermal conditions. We have time for another question. Yeah, uh, one question for Trent. How much uh, mass is allocated for the hopper in, for the payloads? I mean, out of the 30, so on, on this mission, we have around three kilograms of payloads on a 32 kilogram total mass uh, hopper. However, we can we can build a hopper that's the exact same system, just larger, uh, that we hold up to eight kilograms of payload. Okay. And if I can, just one other question for uh, Maria. Uh, um, what's the selection process for uh, the LIPS mission in terms uh, for example, for 2026, 27, you said that you already decided where you want to go and which some of the payloads that are going to be present, but not the provider. Uh, so is, is it is always the case? So you first choose the sending site and then the payloads and then the provider, or it's going to be all sometimes the other way around? Um, so uh, this has been... Um an evolution, as I said, initially the land, you're talking about selection of the landing sites and just this whole thing. Okay. Yes. So um, initially in the early clips, um, like the, the TO2s, the first astrobotic and then two machines, mission one, um, the, uh, the, the payloads, the NASA sponsor payloads were selected and then it was up to the vendor that usually um, to be landing site agnostic, those payloads. Um, and so then it was up to the vendor to select the landing site. Um, and if there were special criteria that had to be taken into, sorry, special criteria for the science objectives or, or you know, for the payloads to operate and meet their goals, um, the vendor had to take those into account. But generally, as I said, they had to be location agnostic. Um, and then as this has progressed, um, it's gone to NASA choosing where it wants to go, generally speaking, um, like say the Grithyzen domes. Um, and so then it was up to, uh, and then the, the proposals were sent out, the prism proposals for, um, for folks to propose instrument suites uh, specific for that landing site. So it kind of went through that process. And then it was selected where specifically they would put that landing ellipse. And then it was uh, presented to the CLIPS uh, companies to propose to land there. So kind of a progression from uh, a different approach. Great. Okay, thank you. Yeah, sure. Well, one, thing I'd, one thing I would add to that is the CLIPS vendors actually have the opportunity, if we are flying our own commercial mission, we could come to NASA CLIPS and say, we have a mission in 2027 and we're going to the South Pole. Do you have anything that you'd like to fly? And one of the things that CLIPS has said is that if we come and have a completely commercial mission and, they, and we have opportunities, we can do that. They may choose not to fly anything on our missions, but we could do that. So if what we look for from the, from the commercial side is if I can fill a half of a mission up with, with somebody's payload that's paid for by some entity that's outside of NASA, and then I go ahead and create a mission, I might go to NASA and have them maybe have, maybe they have some extra payloads that didn't get uh, manifested on another CLIPS mission that they could put on our mission or an astrobotics mission or a Firefly mission or a Draper mission or whoever. Okay, so I think I encourage you to get in contact with the, the speakers for more uh, the uh, discussion. And I would like to call Marco Ferrari, 
uh, Fabio, Fer Fabio Ferrari so we can uh, uh, the session. Good afternoon, everybody. Uh, thanks for giving us the opportunity to present uh, Lumio mission. So I'm Fabio Ferrari. I'm a science lead for Lumio. Um, so let's see. All right, so Lumio is a CubeSat, a 12U CubeSat um, from the European Space Agency with a, a, a huge support of ASI uh, that is aimed at the uh, second Lagrangian point of the Earth Moon system. And that's the point behind uh, the Moon from our perspective. So that's the, where the point that, that's going to be facing all the time uh, the, the lunar far side. And the goal, the broad goal, is to observe, quantify, and characterize uh, meteoroid impacts by detecting the uh, impact flashes. So this is a short history of, of the mission. Uh, since 2016, when it was proposed, then it was funded uh, by ESA through GSP and then GSTP. And now we are currently uh, towards the end of phase B, which should conclude by uh, September this year. So that's where we are, and that's where we would like to be in a few years. Um, so the plan is to have phase C next year and then uh, ramping up to uh, launch, which is now planned for 2027. So this is a short overview of the uh, what uh, it will do, the mission phases. So it will uh, likely be on a, a custom transfer um, that, that was required so for the dynamics, this is a weak stability boundary transfer, and this was required to lower the delta V um, substantially at the cost of a, a longer transfer time. Um, but and in the end, we will reach um, this uh, near rectilinear halo orbit around L2, uh, where uh, Lumia will be operative for about one year. So a, a few more details on the operative orbit. Um, since we are near the L2, we have this uh, nice lunar far side coverage. So we will be always facing the far side of the moon and we will always have a full disk uh, in, in our field of view uh, for, for the camera, which is the main payload. Um, also Earth will be always in sight because the size of the halo itself is larger than the moon when seen from Earth. And the orbit of the, of the um, uh, the period of the orbit is about 14 days. So we are in two to one resonance with the Earth Moon system. Uh, all right, so a few, few more uh, details here. Um, well, I can just pick the mass, which is about 26 uh, kilos. And again, we are a 12 U uh, CubeSat. So still a small, but uh, pretty, uh, I would say, ambitious uh, mission. Uh, so just a few words on the science uh, part, which, um, of course, is concerned mainly uh, on uh, about uh, impact flashes uh, detection. So as you know, as we know, this is, uh, let's say, the final uh, part of a complex process, uh, physical process involved in the uh, meteoroid impacts on the surface. So where we have, of course, crater excavation, then some energy goes into seismic waves, some energy goes into ejecting particles off the surface, and some energy goes into uh, radiation emission. That's, and that's what we uh, actually see and detect. So there, there, there are examples of uh, uh, similar projects that have been run uh, from Earth. So using ground-based observation, and Neliota is a, a great example for this, um, and gives us the idea of what 
uh, our, uh, let's say, science uh, product will be like. Um, so this image that you see here is uh, from, from the Neliota project, which again observes the moon from, uh, from Earth from, uh, and looks for, for uh, impact uh, uh, flashes. So you might wonder then why, if we have these wonderful programs, do we want to get into space? And I would say there are uh, a few, um, let's say, valid uh, reasons for that. And I would start from mentioning that ground-based observations are somehow limited. Uh, of course, they are possible during the Earth night and only when the moon is, uh, is not, of course, fully illuminated. So within just a, a range in, in the, within the uh, overall month. Uh, so some, only some geometric uh, position are possible and there's no uh, possibility for a full disk um, actually detection. Also, the, the um, measure is going to be affected by Earth's shine that you always have, and it's, of course, constrained by weather and uh, by atmosphere. So you don't have this, of course, when you go into space, and also you, you don't have this when you go into L2. Um, so you don't have Earth's shine, of course, because you are in the, in the far side, and you can have uninterrupted observations, um, which means basically 15 days, uh, the nighttime of, of the moon, where, where, you, where you actually see the night side from the, from the far side of the moon. Um, all right, so uh, no air shine, uh, high, higher quality in principle uh, science products. And this is very nice to complement, of course, the ground-based observations that we, that we have. Uh, so this is a uh, estimate in terms of energy of what we uh, Lumio could observe. So the red and yellow points that you see here. Um, so we estimate to detect objects in the range of 10 to minus six, 10 to minus uh, one uh, kiloton. Um, and this fits nicely actually with the current literature. Uh, looks like it's uh, filling a, um, uh, some kind of void that we have. Uh, okay, so this curve is based on, on Earth uh, um, uh, measurements, but uh, we, we can have similar thing on, on the moon as well, since the, let's say the, the meteor of the environment is not gonna be very different from a dynamical point of view. So in order to tackle all these, uh, uh, all these tasks and also to extend it a little bit, um, we have started to set up a, uh, the, a science team. Um, this actually just started, so we have issued uh, a call for that about that earlier this year, and we just kicked off the activities and have um, uh, we'll we'll have the first science team meetings in um, in a two weeks from now. So apart from the let's say main mission objectives we would like to extend it to, to the community and to synergies uh, with, with other missions, other projects, uh, gathering all the information and putting them together to see whether we can constrain uh, meteoroid properties, surface properties, um, impact, uh, impact properties and, and characterization of the impact process and, and so on. So I conclude with uh, just acknowledging the consortium and uh, partners of this initiative, and that's it from my side. Thanks. Thank you, Fabio. Oh. The next speaker is uh, Jack. Jack Barnes is uh, in a remote connection. Go ahead, Jack. All right, Ricky, can you see my slides? Yes, uh, yeah. uh, your audio is coming in good. You know, I'm just waiting for it to pop into the full screen slideshow mode. That looks great, thank you. Thank you. Very good. Thank you and uh, good afternoon. Um, as 
Maria and others uh, mentioned um, earlier in the session, we're within months of the launch of the first set of um, commercial lunar payload services landers from NASA. Uh, one of those uh, first launches uh, will be with Intuitive Machines. Uh, ben Bussey will be talking um, a little bit more later in the session. Uh, this is an artist concept of uh, IM-1, including um, a payload that we're flying to do the first uh, astrophysics and radio science from the moon, first NASA radio telescope on the moon. You can see two of the monopole antennas here of the uh, four that we will be flying as part of a payload called uh, ROLSES. ROLSES stands for radio wave observations at the lunar surface of the photoelectron sheath. So we're going to be probing for the first time the plasma that lies near the surface of the moon. It's been speculated to exist for a long time, but has not been uh, detected. Um, our radio antennas are simple stacer antennas. Uh, they are hollow tube antennas that are spring loaded that will uh, pop open. This is uh, the actual flight. Uh, models of the antennas shown in the uh, center here. And then the um, brains of our instrument is a digital radio uh, spectrometer. You see the flight board here as well. It's uh, FPGA uh, driven. The uh, instrument was built um, at uh, NASA Goddard Space Flight Center. Uh, we were one of the very first um, instruments selected for um, the uh, first round of uh, CLIPS uh, missions. Uh, Nat Gopalswamy is the PI. Bob McDowell was the previous PI. Bill Farrell and myself are two of the uh, lead scientists. Uh, this is a new build, but it has heritage from NASA's SMAP uh, mission. The radio spectrometer has two bands, uh, goes from a low band, where we'll be doing the plasma observations, to an upper band for more sky observations, ranging from 2 kilohertz up to 30 megahertz. And as I mentioned before, we'll be flying on Intuitive Machines 1 Nova C lander. Here are uh, some more details on the instrument parameters and some pictures on the right-hand side, relatively recent pictures of the integration of payloads onto the panels um, that go on to the side of the lander, uh, including, uh, once again, uh, one of our uh, stacer antennas that you uh, see here at the, uh, at the bottom. Our landing site, NASA requested um, that we look at uh, landing at the um, uh, near the, the south pole of the moon. Uh, and the landing site that was selected is called Malapart A. Uh, it's um, on the uh, rim, on the other side of the rim of this small crater. It's about 10 degrees away from Shackleton and the uh, south pole. Looks like a pretty good landing site overall. So what does the radio sky look like from the moon? That was an interesting question that hadn't really been tackled before. So we did some uh, simulations that you see here of what the radio sky at uh, about 10 megahertz, uh, 30 megahertz in this particular case, will, will look like. Um, the uh, X at the center here is the zenith. So imagine uh, that you project this onto a planetarium dome. This uh, X is what you will see in the center. Uh, let me run this uh, one more time. Uh, and you can also see the Earth here and Jupiter. Uh, the Earth uh, moves right around the uh, horizon. Uh, and you can also see the sun. This is for a time period in uh, late August, early September. You can see the dates uh, located over here and the uh, what we expect to see from the, the sky. Uh, obviously, we don't have this kind of resolution, but we'll have a spectral capability. Our science goals, the electron sheath, as I mentioned before, also um, we'll be looking to detect solar planetary and other radio emissions. Uh, we'll be doing the galaxy spectrum at less than 30 megahertz, which is uh, poorly constrained at the uh, present time, and a few other um, additional environmental um, issues. So first and foremost is we'll be looking at the uh, photoelectron sheath. Here are some models of that, um, that sheath from uh, Poppy and Harani. Uh, this is density versus height. And this depends critically upon the state of the solar wind at uh, that uh, particular time, um, as you can see here. And different models from different groups have 
uh, densities that vary by as much as a factor of 10. How do we measure the density? Well, we, we will be actually measuring the plasma electron frequency, uh, and that uh, is measured. Uh, basically, it uh, produces a cutoff in the spectrum when we hit the plasma frequency. It's estimated to be around 60 or so uh, kilohertz, and that uh, electron frequency is directly proportional to the square root of the density. Uh, so that's how we will go about measuring it. In addition, this is what we expect our sky data to look like. This is actual data from the NASA wind waves um, experiment. Um, this is a dynamic spectrum frequency on the y-axis versus time on the x-axis. And what you can see is the richness of the low frequency spectrum. Uh, there's radio frequency interference coming from the Earth, the horizontal lines. Jovian bursts, solar type two and type three bursts. And below a megahertz, the Earth is a powerful source of uh, radiation called the auroral kilometric radiation. It's a uh, maser cyclotron emission. One of the things that we're gonna be looking at here is we're really looking at the Earth as a prototype exoplanet. Um, the uh, magnetospheric emission in principle can be detected also from uh, nearby exoplanets using a low frequency array on the far side. So we'll be looking at the Earth as, uh, as a prototype of some of that uh, exoplanet emission in the future. In addition, we'll, uh, since the Earth is in view, uh, we'll be looking at terrestrial RFI that hasn't been measured in a number of decades now. Uh, this is uh, also wind waves data that we're looking at here. This was when the uh, spacecraft was near the moon in 1999. And you can see these very broad bands of terrestrial uh, transmissions, RFI. Uh, we'll be looking to see how strong that is, how variable it is uh, as to whether or not a low frequency array on the near side can be used uh, for uh, studying solar bursts in the future. But also looking at these terrestrial RFI uh, once again, in terms of uh, exoplanets and, uh, and, and emission from a potentially uh, intelligent civilization associated with an exoplanet. Also, uh, dust is one of the goals. Um, uh, as uh, many of you know, both Surveyor 5 and also uh, Apollo saw a horizon glow on the moon that some have interpreted as scattered light from electrostatically uh, elevated dust. Our radio antennas are actually pretty good dust detectors, as was illustrated by uh, during the Cassini mission, uh, when dust from Saturn's F ring, shown here on the right hand side, this is a voltage spike uh, that occurs when the charge dust uh, strikes the uh, antenna. This will be challenging uh, observations, uh, but Bill Farrell is taking the lead. We will make observations, particularly at sunset. We have about eight hours of uh, battery life uh, after sunset. Uh, so we'll be looking at that uh, transition. Another goal um, is, to, uh, is to begin measuring the dielectric uh, properties of the subsurface. The reason is that our um, antenna beam couples electromagnetically with the subsurface. And this is an issue for cosmology observations that we'll be, be undertaking in the far side with a subsequent mission. This illustrates some of that coupling in a modeling sense. This is uh, power in the far field versus angle. So uh, theta zero is looking at the zenith and 90 degrees is at the horizon. You can see that these models of the antenna in a vacuum are relatively flat versus on a layered regolith, including also the lander in this case, uh, you can see how that is, uh, uh, this is uh, altered. So we've been doing specific modeling now uh, to look at how well we might be able to constrain the subsurface dielectric constant using Jupiter uh, as, a, as a passive source. And what you're seeing here are uh, model residuals from each of the four monopole uh, antennas uh, and um, looking at the table over here, you see our chi-squared uh, and our probability such that the input model was uh, epsilon of five, and we're able to uh, constrain that relatively well um, in this first observation. So uh, we will be attempting to do that once again in preparation for understanding that coupling uh, for cosmology observations. 
Uh, lastly, just a couple of pictures. Um, this is uh, taken when um, I had a chance to visit Intuitive Machines last year. So you see a full scale model of the uh, lander over on the left hand side. And then on the right, um, I'm standing next to my colleague Susan Letterer for NASA Johnson uh, in the Nova Control uh, Center, very nicely uh, built uh, by um, by Intuitive Machines. Our launch is, um, is uh, going to be in the third quarter. So the next couple of months uh, is what we are expected. This will be followed a few years later by an instrument called Lucy Knight uh, that uh, my colleague uh, Andre Slozar will be talking about next. Uh, and this will be a cosmology mission to operate on the far side of the moon. We're hoping uh, what we learn from Lucy uh, sorry, from uh, Rolls's will feed into Lucy Knight. In conclusion, then, just want to say that the CLIPS program is a high risk, high reward program, but is potentially a real game changer in terms of regular access to the lunar surface, uh, allowing us to fly payloads, uh, reconfigure them, fly them again. Rolls's will be the first, followed by Lucy Knight. And then subsequently, um, we believe these are preparing the way for future arrays of low frequency radio antennas on the lunar surface, possibly in conjunction with uh, Artemis astronauts uh, and uh, particularly on the far side of the moon. So with that, I will stop there and uh, be happy to take some questions. Thank you very much. So the next speaker is uh, and the slows are, I, I, I don't know if it is correct. Let's see Okay, okay, fine. Yeah, so let me start again. I was just also, I'm going to talk about Lucy Knight, which is a Pathfinder Radio Telescope on the far side of the moon. Um, and thanks, uh, Jack, for kind of introducing us um, and Maria for giving this uh, great introduction to CLIPS. Um, so let me, I have just 10 minutes. So I wanted to give you just what's the take home message, and then I'll go more into detail uh, about what Lucy Knight really is, right? It's a Pathfinder radio telescope to the lunar far side. Um, and I think its main goal really is to characterize the lunar far side as a radio observatory. Uh, and all, people have been dreaming about doing this for ages and we're actually now trying for real. Uh, it will observe in the 0.51 to about 50 megahertz band using four sensor antenna. And it's interestingly, it's collaboration between the Department of Energy, which does fundamental physics, uh, things like CERN, uh, um, uh, you know, LHC and stuff like that, colliders and some astronomy as well in cosmology and NASA and it's now fully funded. Uh, and scheduled to land on the moon in January 26 as a part of the CLIPS uh, CS4 mission. Okay, so the big, I would say platonic ideal here is the, is the dark ages, okay? So the cosmic dark ages are this unique period in the history of the universe uh, after this cosmic background has formed, so af after the light has decoupled from, 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 from the, so the initial plasma and before the first star has been known. So, there is no radiation sources, so you get linear physics, and you can calculate pretty much everything using perturbation theory, GR, atomic physics, to, to just using perturbative methods to basically a number of, of significant figures. However, because there are no sources, you cannot observe it. And the only way to observe it is through the 21 centimeter uh, neutral hydrogen line. Um, and I would say if you could observe it, it would be phenomenal. There are the clear parallels with CMB. So CMB had monopole discovered in 65 and got kind of a Nobel Prize for it. And the fluctuations, basically small fluctuations in the structure of the cosmic background were discovered in 1990s and another Nobel Prize got it. And the same two things exist in dark ages. We hope to see dark, dark ages monopole in sometimes the next 10 years. And then hopefully fluctuations detect this in the next 50 years and hopefully get two more Nobel Prizes because in some sense it's like CMB but in three dimensions. Uh, and this has actually been kind of recognized uh, by the decadal survey, which kind of in the in the panel of cosmology kind of says, you know, as a community, we should be working towards kind of enabling uh, 10 centimeter uh, observations of dark ages. 
Now, the other context is that, of course, people have been dreaming about building radio telescopes in the moon for decades, right? Uh, the decades about here, okay? So, uh, and you can find like the concepts from Apollo Tys, 1950s in the picture up here. Uh, in the modern incarnation, you have LCRT, which is like a bigger recibo uh, in, a, in a crater, or you have Farsight, or you have Jack Burns as, as, a, as a PI, and you have this ALO, Astronomical Lunar Observatory, which we heard talks a bit on, tu on Tuesday uh, by Brinkerink and Gosh. Uh, but these are all kind of big, many billion of dollar sized projects, and you need to start somewhere simple, right? Um, it is widely believed that the lunar far site is one of the best places to do low frequency observations, right? Uh, it is shielded from Earth and Sun at night, right? So you get no, you, you put, it's extremely radio quiet at low frequency. You see no, you see basically no radio interference from, from the Earth. Uh, it has no atmosphere, it has no ionosphere. And we have even some kind of indirect detection from this RE2, which kind of you can see how uh, the data went, you know, when the when the when this instrument went behind the the, the moon, basically it became extremely really quiet, right? This was in in uh, 70s, right? However, it has weak plasma magnetic fields. Uh, it has electromagnetically very complicated regoliths. Um, there might be other things we don't know about. So this has not has never been tried in practice. Okay. Uh, so overarching science goals for Plus Night is basically. Uh, it's a pathfinder for the of science, and we want to establish lunar surface as a viable observatory for low frequency radio astronomy, perform the most sensitive observations of the radio sky up to 50 megahertz with basically 20% absolute collaboration, and then quantify, really try to understand, you know, what would it take, what are the dominant systematic effects, uh, effects affecting the global spectrum measurement accuracy and how to mitigate them, and then as a, as a science goal, kind of constrain the, the non-smooth monopole component of basically one part in a thousand. Now, uh, for clarification, Lucy Night used to is part of Lucy. The or originally, it used to be just Lucy, and then split into two projects, right? So, what was used to be Lucy was initially a single payload manifested on CP12 mission. Uh, if you if you followed Maria, you wouldn't know what, and it was done purely because spare available parts for risk reduction. Okay, and then after you know very complicated long story, DOE got involved, and uh, and the project now consists of, of two payloads. There is a Lucy Light, um, which we spell differently in DOE land. Uh, it's a small day only payload on CP12, um, and it's basically like original Lucy, but you know, without station antennas. And then also Lucy Night, which is basically, uh, it's really kind of this path and retro I'm talking about, which survives night, and we hope to survive many nights, and it's the main payload on CS3, right? It's a much more powerful instrument, and hopefully with a perfect calibration. Uh, so this is how our payload looks like. We have we have basically uh, uh, three meter uh, uh, station antennas arranged in these kind of uh, cross configurations. So there's, there's six meters tip to tip, and importantly, they're on turntables, so we can turn everything around and kind of change our polarization sensitivity, plus also kind of you know move one into another to, to understand the systematics. Okay, it has 50 megahertz bandwidth, four channel basement receiver, and we calculate all combinations. Now, from 14 uh, inputs, you get 16 correlation products. Okay, uh, it will use the ESA Pathfinder for communications. We have a six gigabytes per lunar night, uh, and we have, there was a Christy talks about this on Tuesday. Uh, and basically, during daytime, we do some science, but mostly we kind of do charge, we turn, we do, 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 do the turntable, but during the night, everything shuts off when you just listen to the, this beautiful, uh, quiet sky, right? Um, so one one of the big thing of low frequency observations is EMI, especially from 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 spacecraft. You know there were a couple of you know experiments uh, that were less successful than they could have been due to this EMI. We are very very careful with EMI. Part of this thing is that the spacecraft dies completely after after the first uh, sunset, right? And we have we have very strange requirements. It, it's actually it's actually dead, right? I'll uh, talk a little bit more of this later. Uh, the landing site is selected. Again, thanks, Maria, for, for helping with this thing. So we've got a great site. On the far side, minus 180 and slightly south for, for, for communication reasons, OK? Uh, and the total payload mass is 120 kilos, out of which over 40 kilos is just better, because we need to survive somehow the, the, the lunar night, OK? Uh, this is, again, how the payload looks with antenna stowed. This is our lander. It will, it will go on the Blue Ghost 2 mission. Uh, we are on top of it. This is JPL user terminal, another payload on this thing. Um, and uh, we have a battery pack, electronics box, a little motor here that kind of turns the turntable on top. Uh, we have an antenna and these four stacers within the housings, the, the, the preamps, and then this turntable, the turntable turns. And then we have some, some basically solar panels on, on, on top and on, on the sides. Uh, and we have this radiator in the back. So the way how we do thermal management, which is very tricky, to survive both the day and the night, 
is basically we use cell-generated heat from 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 operations of, of the instrument uh, to keep warm enough at night with with some some insulation. But during the day, we have this uh, we have this pipe that kind of turns on and kind of ejects excessive heat through this radiator, which in the back, which will be pointing south into the free space is developed by JPL. This is basically a system that's been going to be tested in the vast for us for FSS. Uh, we know FSS, it's a FSSSS experiment on C++. Uh, we have a very good spectrometer. Basically, it's nominally the 2000 channel polyphase filter bank. Uh, we, we took the PSP spectrometer as a basis. We went from two to four channels from to six in correlation uh, products, 50 megahertz bandwidth, a lot of fancy stuff, notch filters, zoom regions, far field calibration support, and so on. Uh, and we can do the, all these things in uh, two watts. And basically, uh, 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 it's basically kind of 200 improvements in performance, basically, at prox approximately the same power draw. You know? Some of this came from, from better FPGA. Some of this is uh, just um, uh, better code, OK? Uh, so the way we do EMI control from the self EMI, land of dice will still be producing EMI. So we have this trick where kind of we force any, any kind of electronics our thing to use power switching supplies at 100 kilohertz, which is century clock to the same clock, the same master clock that drives our ADCs. So this produces this, puts all the EMI noise on, on this perfectly, perfectly uh, made fence in you know, 100 kilohertz space. And then we use DSP trickery to, to have like a 60 dB notch in the middle of our bin response uh, to kind of just cut it out completely, right? So this would be kind of uh, various measurements. And this is just a demonstration on the actual PSP waveform run trial algorithm uh, showing you can measure pass spectrum uh, and just kill out all these, uh, all these um, uh, picket fancy MI uh, very well, okay? And finally, uh, we also managed to convince NASA to, 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 to give us a far field calibrator. Again, in any radio experiment, especially low frequency, Calibration is the beginning and end of everything. So we have this concept basically where kind of the, there will be a, a park field calibrator emitting kind of a coded signal, which is actually not going to be bright, it's fainter than the galaxy, uh, but it's going to be detected in cross correlation uh, and then give us basically both spatial and absolute calibration uh, all over the entire sky. Okay. Um, and basically, this is now being done as a provision of calibration service, right? So this will be different, this will be clips provide payload for the CS formation. So NASA is really kind of trying to exercise like a different way of doing this thing where they don't contract uh, like a payload delivery, but the provision of service. Uh, and the proposed version is go ongoing and then we expect decision by end of July, which could be either this is going forward or basically NASA decided that none of the pro proposal are, are cheap enough or basically good enough. Uh, I'm okay. I'm over time, so I have just one more slide. So I'll go over it. I expect some horrible noise didn't happen, so okay. Uh, Fine. Uh, so, so these th are basically the the sensitivity plot. This is where we stand at the moment. So, on the y, y, y axis is the temperature. On the x axis, basically frequency of these these are dark edges froth. The real signal expects it to be this blue dot here. And we see these are our limits, basically depending on the width. And we see we can a couple of couple of orders magnet off, but uh, we are still kind of a couple of orders orders magnet down below from where we are now. So, we we we, are, we will be the first step in going down to measure this to take this monopole. Okay. Uh, and this is my conclusions. You see this beautiful rendering, uh, rendering of the of the uh, uh, basically blue ghost two with Lucy Knight on top, and I'll stop here. Thank you very much. Uh, now we have the, the last speaker of this uh, session. Then uh, we will have time for uh, some questions. So Ben Bassey. Oh, it's not. It is now. Okay. So um, Trent and I are both here from the company. If you have questions, um, difficult questions, um, go to Trent. So um, a few things I wanted to highlight here. And one actually one useful thing about going last is that other speakers mentioned things that you remember that you were going to mention. And so what I wanted to talk about with this one is, you know, we intend to go um, every year. And both uh, Maria and Jack touched upon the fact that we're about to see 
you know, regular visits to the moon. And I've been, you know, fortunate enough to attend every ELS um, in person, and I've seen it grow. And I was thinking, you know, um, yesterday evening when I was going through the slides, yeah, um, this is the last ELS we'll have before we're starting to get brand new data from the lunar surface. And I think it's easy to underestimate how exciting it's going to be once ELSs are starting to be looking at data that have been acquired in the last year. And the one thing that a regular uh, visitation to the moon will give, and Jack touched upon this, is you know, we're going to get data. Meetings like this are going to you know, nicely shout and argue about the science, but we'll learn new things. But this regular cadence allows the scientists to then go away, design the next generation instruments, and see them flown within a couple of years and then rinse and repeat. And so that's going to be really exciting. Um, the other thing I wanted to highlight here is the fact that you know you um, I'm showing the first as Maria touched upon. We have contracted for three missions, IM1 um, to IM3, that will go over you know in the next couple of years. Um, but our our own, own company goal is to try and have a cadence of at least one flight a year. Uh, and you can see that for the first three, you can see the NASA payloads that were part of the task orders. But when Clips was started, one of the goals was to see if there was a commercial market there to have instruments flown. And you can see, but not just with us, but with the other companies, that they, you know, each each of our landings has definitely, you know, a mix a mixture of NASA and most importantly, in a way, non NASA payload, which is a healthy, um, hopefully, uh, a healthy sign that this can grow. And you know, the holy grail, in a way, would be to do a landing without any NASA payloads, although we're always happy to take them. Um, so uh, our, um, our initial lander um, is, uh, is the Nova C, and you've seen some pictures of it um, today from some of the people who were, were flying their payloads. You know, the key takeaways is that you know, this, this lander can, you know, provide, can go anywhere on the moon with small modifications. It can carry you know, any, roughly 130 kilograms, but that is expandable depending on, on, you know, on a need. And a wide variety of mounting options depending on um, what you need, what your payload actually needs, whether it needs access to the surface or a certain visibility, et cetera. You know, we also you know, have um, derivatives that are planned. Um, you know, so the Nova D um, is, our, is then sort of the follow on from Nova C when, when, when there is a payload need, and that can go all the way up you know, to 2,500 kilogram um, class payloads. Um, so uh, just um, one very quick slide on IM-1. This just, you know, this highlights, again, the, the NASA payloads that were part of the task order, um, uh, but also it shows the variety of commercial payloads um, that, that we are, um, are flying. So for mobility services, you know, we're well aware that when um, customers come to us, they often want um, their instrument, it, require, it is required to have mobility of some kind. Um, that can either be a rover or, as we heard earlier, the hopper. Um, with the rover, we have partnered with a um, company called Lunar Outpost that can provide. Um, they have a suite of different rovers. We're already flying the MAP rover, which is on their smaller end. That can take payloads in sort of the... 12 kilogram, 10 kilogram class, but they have um, much larger rovers if the payload needs it. Um, but also part of our mobility services is the fact that we don't just fly the rovers from our outpost. Um, the Nova C is designed such that we can, uh, each individual lander um, delivery can fly a, a variety of, uh, of multiple rovers. And no matter how many times you give it, you always find one spelling mistake. I'll leave that as a test for the reader or the people taking photos. Um, right. Um, so we all, I won't go much on this, um, but, you know, Trent um, gave you some nice details on the hopper. I think the hopper is um, an incredibly exciting example of a platform that will allow um, science that couldn't have previously um, been thought of, you know, particularly sort of the idea of going into pits or lava tubes, as well as to very rapidly um, going to places that you can't um, get to um, with a rover with a variety of different flight profiles, depending again on what your data needs are. Um, a key capability is our orbital drop off capability. And I'm going to talk a little more of this at the end about a, uh, a couple of projects that we are working on. So we can drop off payloads in um, a nominal 100 kilometer circular orbit um, before landing. Um, we can also drop off larger payloads in a translunar injection um, fairly soon um, after launch. 
Um, part of what we've developed for our infrastructure, we realized early on the need to be able to get large volumes of data back and not to be dependent on DSN. So we have um, initiated, uh, we, we, we have a, essentially a global um, ground system network where we have um, contracts with various large dishes around the world to, so that we can provide near 24 seven downlink for our data. Um, also starting with the second mission IM2, we're going to start to drop off our own communication relay satellites. Um, again, which decreases the load on satellites or things on the surface for getting their data back. So, uh, so my last two slides are a couple of opportunities I wanted to share with the audience of things that we're thinking about. I'm checking, I'm checking. Um, which, um, the, you know, and hopefully that you will have an interest and will want to reach out later to chat. So one of the data by orbiter. So we got to thinking, you know, thinking about the fact that we can drop something off in a nice mapping orbit combined with um, the emplacement of our communication relay network. It got us thinking about could we acquire the next, so essentially the next generation of data sets that the community wants um, using a much more modest spacecraft and therefore doing it um, cheaper than if you like a classical lunar orbiter mission. And we, you know, the, as we all know with the moon, the good thing is data, the same, in some ways, the same data sets are of interest to multiple types of, of consumer. Um, it, you know, we have the exploration community, we have the resources community, we have the science community. You know, I throw out here examples, sort of high res, very high resolution, multispectral, or high spe, hyperspectral data or topography or neutron or thermal. Those are all data sets that if we could acquire data that is um, better than what we have right now, that could be of use. So we're exploring the possibility of essentially flying our own small sat um, to uh, acquire those kind of data sets. Um, related to this um, is also we're thinking about, could we do, um, could we either do a, a, an independent mission or again, a, a, a significant part of a lander delivery is a multiple CubeSat um, uh, mission. Apologies for the acronym, I just couldn't help myself. Um, so, you know, the idea here is, you know, I think the Artemis one showed there is an interest in, in, in flying planetary CubeSats. And again, our logic was if we could actually drop a CubeSat off in a nice mapping orbit as a starting point, then that allows the CubeSat, which also by definition have limited power and, and propulsion to, um, and communications type capabilities, does that allow the community to be innovative and, and help acquire some really interesting data for lunar science using a CubeSat platform? And indeed, you know, earlier in the session, um, we, we heard about Argo Moon a couple of days ago. We had just heard about Lumio. That's a, that's a perfect example of, is there an advantage to people, to companies or, or universities who would like to do a CubeSat um, essentially being dropped off and be able to use a communication network? Um, we think that this again, this allows the community to be very innovative. It helps grow the next generation of scientists, engineers, because they can, you know, it's a, it's it's something that a university level entity can can fully accomplish and giving scientists and engineers proper hands on um, experience. Obviously, it's a, a great international collaboration opportunity, but also it could be multidiscipline. It doesn't um, it doesn't just have to be for lunar science. Um, you know, CubeSats could be dropped off um, in orbits other than low lunar orbit. And my watch says nine minutes something, so I'm done. Thank you. Perfect. So, so we have mo one minute more for the the questions. So I can kindly ask the the speakers to come here and uh, give the opportunity to to have some question from uh, the audience. In the meantime, I I, I make one. What about the, the precision landing? What, what about what, sorry? The precision landing. So uh, it is something you can, you have a, a range in, in which you can land with respect to the, the... Yes, I mean, I think, again, it depends very much on a customer need because we can, use, we can add different systems to basically get the precision of landing that a customer... If you're landing in the middle of a mare and it's 10 kilometers flat, then there's no point spending the resources than if you need to land in a hundred meter circle. So the answer is yes, we, we can provide what's needed. Okay, thank you. Uh, yes, yeah, so question for Fabio. Um, how are you going to distinguish between 
very small, short duration impact flashes and cosmic ray impacts, assuming that you have only one detector and you're operating in a very cosmic ray rich environment. Uh, good, uh, okay. All right, can you hear me? So we have one camera with the beam splitter and two detectors, Perfect. visible and near infrared. So we mark uh, as detected when both, of course, uh, have a- Excellent, thank you. I guess so. Uh, it's a question for more than one person, but maybe Ben can answer this because uh, you, um, you know, you alluded to the fact that in two years' time, there would be so many missions returning so much data. Um, on the back of it, you know, uh, quicker missions can be put together. I mean, what would be your recommendation for universities? Because we need workforce, right? We need uh, next generation ready in that time and it takes time to to train people to be ready in your opinion do you think there is sufficient workforce out there that can actually utilize it the data at that cadence you start to come in I, I i think i think the answer is yes i mean you if on the us side we you know we've seen the excellent prism instruments that have been um selected and you've seen we saw we we saw today how that those are already taking advantage of being selected to grow the next generation workforce. And also, I think it's a bit like when ELS first started, and we had a lot fewer people than this. Once things start, once we start to do things and fly and get the data, then that will naturally grow the workforce because people hopefully will go into those science and engineering engineering fields because they see there's an interesting career that they can do. Okay, thank you. I, I just hope that, you know, while we are planning for all of that, we can also keep that in mind and universities pay attention to that. Well, that, that's, that's your job. <laughs> thank you. Hi, good afternoon to everybody. This is Alejandro in Spain. I have a question to answer in Slosa yeah, on the radio telescope mission. Um, with regards to the, I'm pretty curious about the thermal management strategy you follow. Uh, maybe if I understood well, you plan to operate all through the night to have your receiver on through the night, and you basically rely on these large packages of batteries uh, and the self heating of the batteries and certain degree of isolation. So um, after that, when the day comes, you have these large solar panels as well to, to recharge the batteries. So my question is, uh, um, you count on, on the panels to be able to survive the night by their own without any thermal aspect and, and how you account for degradation or, or in terms of functioning for how long is this plan, how many of you are nights and so on. Okay, so so uh, to repeat the question, the question is how how we deal with thermal and and energy issues and and, and solar panels, right? Uh, so so the the basic concept is, is basically as you described, right? So we we land with the battery which is kind of in the in the in the morning with the battery which is essentially flat. We charge we charge the batteries during the day. We have about seven kilowatt hour battery, about forty kilos. Uh, it's basically upscreen commercial battery, uh, and we were specially, specifically told because it's eclipse mission, no no radioactive uh, radioactive stuff. That's why we have to survive no battery. So then during during, during night we have this instrument that draws between ten and fifteen watts, depends exactly how you count, and this heat is then used to keep us warm, right? So during, during the during the lunar night, the ground is about 100 Kelvin, and the inside instrument will be around zero, right? Zero to 20, right? Uh, by by the means of, of simply uh, thermal insulation. The battery is going to be drawn down a lot, much more than in typical missions during the night, so we nearly empty it. However, this is not so bad because we, we have these very slow cycles, right? We slowly recharge and slowly Kind of lose lose charge. We have like one one full cycle per month, right? So so it's, it's going to be the the, the load and batteries is going to be very easy. Now in, in terms of uh, thermal during during the day things get very hot and we as I said to mention we have this tube that kind of uh, uh, opens up. It's kind of uh, it's like this um, it's this heat pipe that 
that, that basically becomes conductive above certain temperature, and this will just reject extra heat, right? Uh, and we have oversized both radiator, we have oversized uh, the tube, and we have oversized the panels. So the panels have some some issues about uh, basically about them. We we can lose we have about twenty percent margin of the panels due to degradation, right? Next thing is, is how, how will thermal panels survive the night without cracking? We spent a lot of time thinking about this. We had all kinds of concepts that will go in and out. At the end of the day, uh, basically, we simply found, found this company that sells us the, the panels that were supposed to kind of, they, they have special uh, cover. And uh, as long as they're, they're on, on, on the sides of the thing, they, 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 should, they should survive, okay? Uh, having said that, the, the, the tail thermal modeling, whether we will need to Put, put some heat down. I mean, this this is still in the process of being done, but it's it's one of the major technical challenges. Is 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 basically identified the most difficult things of this engineering process. Thank you again to all speakers. And uh, uh, now we have the coffee break, and we will restart at sixteen zero six. Thank you.
then it took me a little while for it to then start.
Okay, so we start uh, with um, this session. We are uh, 10 minutes late, so I ask to all the presenters to, to stay in the 10 minutes time. This session is about technologies and tests uh, toward human exploration. The first speaker is Sara Botsman with potential lending sites identified for ESA's prospect instrument, NASA LIPS. Uh, so today I'm going to give you a broad overview of the landing site assessment process that we've gone through for ESA's prospect instrument. And uh, today I'm going to present this work on behalf of the landing site working group uh, for prospect who are listed on the screen. So prospect has been mentioned quite a bit over the last few days, um, but just for some context, as Maria outlined earlier, prospect is going to be one of the instruments that is on the NASA CLIPS 22 mission. And prospect is made up of two parts, a drill known as proceed that is designed to sample the lunar surface of up to one meter depth. And then these samples will be examined by the onboard laboratory known as Prospar. So the key thing with Prospect is that it's designed to measure volatiles and sample water ice from the lunar surface. And therefore, we want to find a landing site that is volatile rich. And a bit later on in this session, uh, David Hadver will present Rich's presentation. And so you'll have a little bit more information about Prospect then. So I'm going to give kind of an overview of the process we've gone through so far. So we started with a broad overview of the lunar south polar region from 75 to 90 degrees south. And then we added in the constraints of the NASA CLIPS mission, in particular the slope, the landing size ellipse, uh, the illumination, Earth visibility, and in particular for Prospect, we were focusing on uh, looking for areas where volatiles and water ice would be stable if present. We then assessed the sites that we identified for uh, risk and their operational windows available. And um, from this, some of the sites we'd identified didn't have quite as many operational windows as we'd like and therefore new areas that were identified which had longer and more frequent operational windows. These areas were narrowed down further and then a preferred area for prospect has been identified. So just for some context, this is the lunar south polar region from 75 to 90 degrees south. I'm sure many of you are familiar with this and this is the area where volatiles are expected. So on the left hand side we have a WAC mosaic of the south pole and on the right an elevation map from the LOLA data and you can see in blue the areas where there's low elevation, typically the craters and the crater floors. And then in red and yellow areas of higher elevation, typically the plateaus and ridges. So what were the constraints that we had? We were asked to look for an area that was within 84 degrees and poleward, so going towards the South Pole. We were required not to land in an Artemis Candidate 3 site. And the landing site needs to meet the requirements of prospect, particularly uh, scientifically interesting thermally. It should be a safe site, so therefore, uh, where there are slopes of less than 10 degrees and with no observable hazards or as few as possible that were greater than five metres in diameter, in particular craters and boulders. We had a 100 metre diameter landing ellipse. And for this study, we were focusing on finding the best candidates for prospect scientifically. So how did we do this? Uh, we were using geographical information software Art Pro, and we identified 49 points of interest. And these were points where there were slopes of 10 degrees or less. Both the Oxford Thermal Model and the Page Thermal Model showed water, ice, and thermal conditions. And there was on average 30% illumination and 50% Earth visibility. We then narrowed down these 49 sites to just four, using an iterative process and a science matrix. And this science matrix asks questions uh, that would see if the site met the requirements of prospect. Uh, so for example, um, does the site have thermal conditions for water ice between zero and 10 centimeters? If the site did meet this uh, question and answered yes, then it would score a higher point. And if it answered no, it would score a lower point. And then these scores were totaled up for each of the questions asked and the highest uh, ranked site was POI 12, which is located just above Shackleton here. Now this site was really interesting scientifically, but unfortunately uh, operationally was not quite as good. And so then um, 
And this was because of the solar elevation uh, being really low, uh, so close to the poles. So we went back to the original list of points of interest, it was original 49, and we identified four more sites that um, were at a kind of lower latitudes and therefore had higher solar elevation angles. And the area that we decided to focus on was this POI 37 up here on the plateau. Uh, and so the selected area was uh, this kind of square diamond region. And within this, we mapped out a polygon where the slopes and thermal conditions and illumination uh, had good conditions um, and also met the requirements from the other payloads. And within this kind of polygon or the blob as we called it, uh, there was five points that were identified from one of the other payloads to investigate further. So I'm going to go through some of the data sets that we looked at. So uh, on the left, we have the NAC maximum illumination mosaic. And what you can hopefully see throughout this is the illumination varies across the blob, including um, some small PSRs. And then on the right, we have the slope map, which was derived from a shape from shading DEM of five, five meters per pixel. And you can see that most of the area is blue. So this was good. It had um, very low slopes. So it was uh, an area that was guarded for good uh, in terms of safety. Then thermally, we looked at both the Oxford Thermal Model and the Page Thermal Model at 120 meters per pixel. And all five sites uh, at this resolution showed uh, ice depth between uh, the shallow subsurface. And then we also looked at the diviner temperatures for both the summer and winter. And most of the five points uh, had temperatures between 50 to 100 Kelvin. And the ones that had better thermal conditions in terms of temperature were uh, these two and this one to the right. And so these were the three that we then focused on uh, further and narrowed down to the site where we wanted to do some hazard mapping. So we did hazard mapping of craters, degraded craters and boulders. And this was done for those three points that I just pointed out before. And the region that you can see on the right hand side here, um, the NAC, uh, is the area um, between those the, the two points that are closest to each other. And this was the area that was identified as the preferred region. Uh, due to the better thermal conditions that have been modelled and the temperatures in this area. Uh, as you can see, there's many hazards and lots and lots of craters, but most of these are smaller than that five metre requirement. And therefore, although it appears quite um, crater terrain, um, there's not too many of the bigger craters that would cause an obstacle. And we just want to say thank you to Maria Banks and the LROC team for their efforts with the mapping and uh, also their help with uh, other data set production. So just to conclude, uh, we've identified an area that's suitable uh, for the thermal conditions for prospect and also is operationally uh, good. We're going to be doing some thermal analysis on the illumination and direct to earth communication uh, to check this preferred area. And then we'll be doing detailed analysis um, to look at feature distribution and the sizes of features in the area and also regional analysis and uh, further high resolution uh, thermal modeling and illumination modeling. Thank you. Thank you. Perfectly in time. Uh, next speaker is Barvi Chikani, Far Side Seismic Suite, environmental testing to prepare for the far side of the moon. Hello. This is nice. It's a nice setup, actually. I get to sit down. Um, yes, yeah, so my name's B, and I'm a postdoc at the University of Oxford, um, and I'm working on FSS, which is the Far Side Seismic Suite. Um, what we'll do is we'll send an instrument to Far Side of the Moon to measure uh, seismic activity. And also, it's part of the CLIPS mission as well, so NASA's CLIPS missions. Um, so we all know of the Apollo missions. Um, so the Apollo missions from 11 to 17 um, all helped scientists answer all the key questions that they had about the field of seismology. Um, and in fact, Apollo 12, 14, 15, 16, and 17 all had seismometers as part of their scientific uh, equipment. 
So FSS will actually be like NASA's first mission to the far side of the moon, and um, it will be deployed in the Schrodinger Basin on the south side of the moon. Before I go into FSS, um, a bit about lunar seismology. So lunar seismology um, is very different to Earth seismology due to the absence of tectonic plates. Um, the strongest seismic activity um, on the moon is in fact weaker than the Earth's weakest earthquakes. So we really need sensitive equipment in order to measure it basically. So some of the key questions that FSS will answer is, um, is seismicity different on the far side? How do impact processes shape the lunar crust inside and outside the Schrodinger crater? What is the current micrometeorite impact rate driving seismic hum? So this image shows um, inside the square, you've got the near side with all the locations of the deep moonquakes, as well as the shallow moonquakes. And outside the square, you've got um, very few known locations um, of the moonquakes. So FSS will help in answering a few of these questions. So the core concepts, um, FSS will be packaged as a self-sufficient payload. So what this means is that um, it will be independent to the lander, have its own power, communications, and thermal control. Um, and outlive its lander and survive the two week long lunar nights and days. So a bit about the mission, the far side seismic suite FSS will deliver two seismometers. One of them is by the vertical, is the vertical very broadband seismometer contributed by the French space agency, uh, CNES, and it is the most sensitive flight ready seismometer ever built. The short period sensor is the most sensitive and mature compact triaxial sensor available for space applications, and it will be delivered by Kinemetrics in collaboration with the University of Oxford and Imperial College London. So Imperial College London actually make us the sensors, so that's the easy bit, um, and then we um, do the testing, the electronics, build the instrument, and then deliver it to JPL. Um, so this image basically shows um, the lander, um, which will be provided and made by um, a company in the US called Draper. Um, and then this diagram here is shows the VBB seismometer and then also the SP seismometer tucked in. So we work on the SP seismometer, um, and that's based on the InSight heritage. For those of you who don't know, InSight was a mission that launched in 2018 and was very successful in collecting seismic data but on, the moon, on, the, on Mars. Um, and now we're basically doing the same thing on the far side of the moon. So this is one of the images of a sensor. It's a micro-machine silicon system. Um, and we'll have three of these in a, what we call a Galperin configuration, which is this below, um, rather than have one vertical and two horizontal sensors that inside basically did. Um, and also the spring will be adjusted to account for the lunar gravity. Um, so yes, yeah, so a couple of the key differences between Mars and the moon. Uh, this image basically shows um, FSS at the moment. So it's, very nearly completed, um, so I thought I'd put in these images. However, um, it's not 100% yet. Like, for example, this is the lid that will go on. However, um, it won't be this one. This is just a 3D printed one, um, and it will actually be a transparent one, so you can actually see the inner beauty of it. Um, so yeah, environmental testing is really important for instruments. Um, so our goal was to adapt like the Martian design of the sensor and make it operate on the moon, which is an airless, bo airless body, which has a gravitational field strength of just 1.6 newtons per kilogram. Um, so all these tests are needed to carry out um, so it can survive launch, the landing and all the harsh conditions. So that includes tests like shock testing, vibration testing, TVAC testing, which means you place it in a high vacuum chamber and subject it to harsh conditions. So like temperatures of like 200 degrees Celsius, 
down to minus 100 degrees Celsius and then alternate. Um, so you're subjecting it to harsh conditions, basically. Um, however, there's a couple of um, tests that are specific to FSS, and that's push testing and um, noise testing, which I'll go further into in the next couple of slides. So push testing is one of the tests that I did, um, which is basically a strength test, which was done, if I go back on back to this slide, which was done on this DT strip, which is the strip in the middle here. Um, so we used this pull tester in the lab to basically exert a force onto this DT strip um, to see how much force it could exert. And the requirement was that it could withstand at least 30 Newtons. Um, and all of our test pieces did, so that's good. Um, so yeah, so we basically have exerted a force until the DT strip popped out or um, the sensor frame broke one of them. And you can see from this plot that it has um, withstood like uh, 30 Newtons, over 30 Newtons, so that's good. Also, another test that we did was noise testing to basically check the performance of the sensor. Um, so this is a typical plot that you have um, of a noise plot. And what this shows is you've got the green line, which is the threshold that we need to be below. Um, and then the predicted is what we thought we'd get from like the insight sensors. However, like if you look from this, this region here from 10 to the minus one to the 10 to the zero, you can see that um, we're much better than this, which is good. Um, also, this peak is here because um, we had a reference sensor that was connected up to it as well, just to just acted like a reference. Um, if that wasn't there, then this peak wouldn't be there, basically. And then these other tests um, are there um, just to test, just to see the coherence and the things like transfer function as well. Um, I would have liked to put in a bit more of the testing, such as like the shock testing, vibration testing, and the TVAC testing, but we just don't have the instrument 100% ready. Um, so when I'm actually going back after the conference, I'll actually be doing these tests. Um, so if anyone's going to the AOGS uh, conference in late July in 2023, then um, hopefully I can update this and um, talk a bit more about those tests. Um, yeah, so just a quick summary. So FSS will outlive the Draper lander. It will deliver key lunar science uh, for the far side of the moon. Also address key questions that we have relating to the seismicity rate, deep lunar structure, the local structure at the Strodinger crater, and micrometeorite impact rates. And then also the innovative thermal design allows continuous op operation through the lunar night. And then crucial testing is being carried out, and we hope to deliver to JPL very soon, um, maybe next month or the month afterwards. Um, so yeah, uh, thank you. And this is the team in Oxford, and we've got these two, Tris and Catherine, in the crowd there as well. Um, and then here's my email address if anyone wants to ask me anything or get in touch. Um, so yeah, thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you very much. We go to the next speaker, Dave Heater, on behalf of Richard Fizarkelin. It's prospect drilling and instrumentation package, status and next steps for flight on NASA clips. Okay, thank you very much. Good afternoon, everybody. Uh, apologies on behalf of Richard, who would have liked to be here, but uh, as you will see, we are kind of buried in project level activities at the moment, so he could not make it. So you're stuck with me. I'm going to be uh, giving you a quick rundown on Prospect, where we are in terms of the development, uh, especially, and the shift that we have had to make uh, as we have moved on to a NASA CLIPS opportunity. So you've heard a lot about Prospect already today, but uh, just to give you a, a quick overview of what Prospect is for those who don't know, it's quite a complex package. It has two major units. The first called Proceed is a drill. Uh, and the second is the Prosper Laboratory, which will analyze samples taken from the drill. 
The drill will be capable of uh, going down to about one meter depth uh, and it will, in, it will uh, sample the icy frozen regolith. It'll be capable of acquiring two different samples, although at the moment we will only be using the facility to, uh, um, to use the smaller sample, so the 45 cubic millimeter sample. Uh, that will be passed on to the Prosper Laboratory. Um, for the previous implementation, we would have passed the larger sample onto Russian instrumentation on Luna 27, but at the moment that facility is not going to be used on the CLIPS opportunity. The whole drill unit is designed to minimize the temperature increase uh, during sampling because we, of course, want to preserve our volatiles as we do the sampling. And it includes lots of other instrumentation as well. So we have a multispectral imaging system, a subsurface permittivity sensor, and lots of temperature sensors as well, um, as well as sensors for torque, et cetera, et cetera. Once we've taken the sample, it'll get passed over to the Prosper Laboratory. There is something called the Solid Inlets System, uh, which is the device that will receive, image, and seal all of the samples in a series of ovens. We have 25 ovens in total. Those samples will then be heated up and the, the gases that will be released will be analyzed by one of two spectrometers. We have an ion trap mass spectrometer and a uh, magnetic sector uh, mass spectrometer. So we can do isotopic analysis and abundance analysis for the gases that are released. We'll also be performing some ISLU demonstration experiments and uh, analyzing the, the resulting products. So, uh, the goals of Prospect, we're going to be, as I said, uh, extracting IC regolith from down to one meter. We will be characterizing uh, the volatile inventory from that one meter profile at the south pole of the moon. Uh, we'll be determining both the abundance, the composition, and the origin of the volatiles that we will be extracting. And we will be demonstrating the first in situ extraction of oxygen from minerals in the lunar regolith. Those goals were established by the Prospect science team. Many of you are here. Um, uh, the development is led under ESA contract and the drill unit is uh, being put together by Leonardo in Italy um, and the Open University is responsible for the PROSPER instrumentation and the solid inlet system. Uh, the original development for PROSPECT was for Luna 27, uh, Roscosmos, um, and we had already passed the prelimin preliminary design review um, and initiated de detailed design against the Luna 27 interfaces, so including all of the testing of breadbolt and the development models. You can see some of those models on the, the bottom right. Uh, in the bottom right in the middle, you can see the, um, uh, the Prosper uh, bench development model, and on the right-hand side, on the bottom right, you can see the uh, drill development model. So things happen uh, and uh, we are no longer flying on Luna 27. Um, and at the start of 2022, we were lucky that we had already got some agreements in place with NASA to fly a version of Prospect um, called Prospect Clips um, um, on one of the Clips providers. So this was supported by the industrial work on how to manage the interfaces. So following February, 2023, we spent a lot of time and effort in uh, shifting all of the development from uh, Luna 27 onto a, a, a CLIPS opportunity. This meant that we had to work with industry very closely to try to make sure that the interfaces um, were defined in such a way that uh, we, could, we could be flexible and allow for uh, as much interface uh, compatibility as possible on the NASA CLIPS provider, which has yet to be decided, of course. So we've worked very hard with industry uh, to reorient the, the running development. So not to stop things, but to keep on with the development. Uh, the industrial team have, in parallel, maintained all of their efforts to try to mature the design of prospect units and the system, and the science team have evaluated the scientific impact of shifting onto Eclipse mission. The biggest impact will be the, uh, the duration of the mission, which we'll discuss a little bit later on. Uh, um, that's a little video on the bottom here. right, which is showing the vibration testing um, the engineering model of Volcrosi. Uh, so uh, key features in the current timeline, um, we've had, as I said, the biggest impact of shifting to, to CLIPS is the reduction of operations duration. We had one year of operations on Luna 27. We're going to be dropping down to just one lunar day, so approximately 10 days of operations on the CLIPS opportunity. This means we really have to focus on efficiency. Uh, the science team made an assessment uh, of this uh, reduced um, period of operations, and it was deemed that we can still meet all of our science objectives, albeit with a slightly higher risk, but we need to be efficient. We need to make sure that we are pre-planning operations um, and 
making sure that we are not spending too much time analyzing the results from first operations before we move on to the second one, we have to make certain assumptions. The lander provider and the interfaces will not be confirmed until early 2024, so we need to maximize the compatibility of all of our interfaces. Uh, the ESA and the Prospect Industrial Team have worked to make sure that we can simplify our interfaces wherever possible. This includes data interfaces and mechanical attachments. And uh, you've already heard from Sarah that we've worked very hard on uh, a landing site selection. This is very important for Prospect, of course, because we're, we're looking for volatiles. We need to land somewhere where we might expect to find them. Uh, so we've worked very hard on that with the uh, with the LROC team and within the, the prospect science team as well. Quick rundown on the timeline. Um, so coming up in the next couple of weeks, we're going to have a payload workshop where we'll be presenting interfaces towards the commercial vendors. All of the requirements from prospect will be presented to the potential lander providers, and they'll be asking us all sorts of questions before they put their bids in. And as I said, we're not expected for that uh, decision to be made as to who will be our lander until early 2024. In August, uh, NASA will release the request for tender proposals in uh, end of this year. Uh, it's expected that we might actually start to hear about who the lander provider is. At the beginning of 2026, we'll have the uh, flight model delivery to the CLIPS vendor. And in late 2026, the CP22 mission that we will be on uh, should be launching and we'll be going for operations. So operations, um, this is, uh, how am I doing for time? Okay, um, so for operations, this is probably the biggest thing that we have to think about when we're shifting onto CLIPS, um, because we will not have enough time to analyze the data coming down from one operations before we move on to the next one, which means we're going to have to prioritize and pre-plan all of our science operations uh, to make sure that we can meet our science goals as much as possible. We've already kicked off some discussions with the science team early this year, and we're, we're hoping to have um, an operations workshop towards the end of this year uh, to follow up on this. We're going to be using fewer and more complete and low risk operational sequences. So we, we can't afford to take many risks because we can't redo operations. We have to just push the button and hope that uh, things work. We'll be front loading the science as well, making sure we do the, the juicy science stuff first instead of just testing things out. We just go for it and we'll take the best samples we can, um, analyze them and uh, just carry on with the operations. So the operations might be tailored to shorten uh, the execution and the analysis and recovery times. So we might not be heating up the ovens to very high temperatures because it takes a long time to cool them off before we can proceed with the next operation. So these are all things that need to be discussed and worked on in the coming months. One other thing that we're looking at is cleanliness and contamination. We have a good um, contamination framework delivered from Open University, and this has been looked at by the science team earlier this year as part of the Prosper Critical Design Review. In general, it shows that the approach that we're following from the contamination perspective is good, and we should be able to, to uh, have good science performance within that framework. We are still looking at this though, to see how the sensitivity and the performance changes based on some of the assumptions that have been made in terms of cross-contamination. So if we take one sample from the proceed um, from the Prosper push tube and a second sample, how much contamination are we expected to, to see? And uh, how can we manage that within the operational profile? I think I'm running out of time, so I'm going to skip the last little bit and just go to the summary. Um, so basically, we put a lot of effort in in the last couple of months uh, to redirect prospect from the Lunar 27 opportunity to CLIPS. The development itself is on track, um, and the industry have worked hard to make sure that they've maximized the compatibility of the interfaces for whoever our lander provider is going to be. We will find that out uh, in early 2024. The prospect science team members have been working very hard on the landing site, which you heard a little bit earlier on from Sarah, um, uh, but we do need to now start focusing on the operational impact of the uh, short-term mission lifetime. And in parallel, we're going to work uh, on the contamination and the volatile preservation work uh, to make sure that we can weave that into the operations and the data in interpretation. CP22, including prospect clips, is scheduled for launch in late 2026. And that's it. Thank you very much. Thank you. Next uh, speaker is um, Andrew Morse uh, with analytical instrumentation for the ESA in situ results utilization demonstration mission. Good afternoon. I'm a researcher at the Open University 
and I'm going to be talking about the analytical instrumentation for the ESA ISIU demonstration mission. Uh, this is a mission to uh, demonstrate the use of the metallicis FFC process for the extraction of oxygen from lunar regolith. So the requirements of the mission are to, in total to produce 100 grams of oxygen from at least five samples. Um, the advantages of it for the metallicis process would be doing it in lunar environment, which is a lower gravity, um, and also testing mechanisms. Uh, the resources is going to be for one lunar day only, and the total instrument mass is four kilograms. So in the process of trying to determine the efficiency of the ISIU process, we need to know the starting material, um, its elemental composition, um, to know how much oxygen there is, the mass of the sample, and then after the process we need to know the oxygen concentration in the gas stream and the flow rate of the gas from the metallicis cell. We've assigned an error budget of a uh, relative accuracy of 10% for the total measurement. So for each of those subsystems, we've assigned an error budget, 7% um, for the solid analysis and 3% for the gas analysis. Um, the instrumentation, uh, we've chosen to try and be as much as possible standalone. So the instruments include their own power converters and processor, uh, data, so the instrument takes commands from the lander from ground, does its analysis and then passes the data back to ground. Um, the idea of this is that if there's any changes in the instruments or movement on different landers, um, we can accommodate those fairly easy, easily without affecting the rest of the payload. Uh, the advantages in this is that testing is fairly straightforward in that the instrument can be tested without requiring other payload or lander systems to be available. And integration, hopefully, is more a case of bolting on, connecting power and comms interface. So for the solid sample analysis, we started off looking at XRD, XRF instrument. This was developed for ExoMars, uh, unfortunately it wasn't on the final payload, um, and it uses a radioactive X-ray source to generate X-rays, which is aimed at of diffraction rings um, detected by a CCD. So that gives you the mineralogy of the sample, and then the X-ray fluorescence from the same instrument will give you the um, elemental composition. So the graph on the right is the trace from the X-ray fluorescence showing that you can detect most major elements all the way down to aluminium. Uh, the problem with this instrument we found is it's difficult to accommodate um, into the lander package and it depends very much on getting the angle right to the sample and if the sample is being collected and loaded into a container the height isn't always the same and it's, so it's very difficult to try and accommodate for differences in the sample that was collected. Also, um, it had a 10 hour analysis time because the radioactive source is very weak. And given that you need to analyze five samples and there's only 10, 10 Earth days to do the uh, mission, it was too short time to do all the analyses. So we looked at some alternatives. Um, one is act active X-ray spectrometry. Um, this just uses XRF, looks down on the sample, um, uses an active source, so has a much higher sensitivity. Um, all the sum, these instruments we listed here have an analysis time of a minute or less. Um, so it's more in keeping with the timescale of the mission operations. Um, that gives you um, the elemental composition. And then you've got two options for the mineral composition. Could either use SAMCAM, which is high TRL, is on the Prosper mission, or Micro Omega, which is larger and heavier, but has high TRL, having been on several missions already. Um, another alternative is to use a Libs Raman instrument. Again, it was developed for ExoMars and wasn't on the final payload, but its continued development has been uh, progressed for breadboarding up to TRL 6. Um, it's also got the advantage that after the sample has been processed, the lasers can actually be used to vaporize the salt covering the sample, and you might actually be able to get the composition of the sample um, after the processing. Moving on to the gas analysis instrumentation, um, the requirements are to measure the oxygen concentration, but also to measure the composition of the gas from 10 to 150 mass units with a detection limit of 10 parts per million and the sample rate of than one per minute. Uh, we're also interested in contamination on the oxygen supply since we're going to be breathing this oxygen at the end of the day. Um, contaminants like hydrogen sulfide or sulfur dioxide, which would be coming from lunar regolith, 
um, or hydrogen chloride or chlorine from the breakdown of the salt. On the right is the European occupational exposure limits, and they are all of the order of one or 10 ppm at maximum level. And if you're using this as breathable air, you probably want 10 times less. So this, these contaminants are below the mission requirements. Uh, so we also considered instruments that may be able to measure that. So our main instrument is the mass spectrometer, uh, iron trap mass spectrometer, got good heritage, small, low mass and low power. And you get spectrum there on the right, which gives you the mass range, 10 to 150 um, unit resolution. Um, where we had to develop or more was the tunable laser spectrometer. So tunable laser spectrometry uh, is very good at detecting specific gases. You usually use one laser per gas and has very high sensitivity. So we uh, had some funding from the UKSA for a disrupt project to look at using TLS for three target gases, SO2, H2S and HCl. We actually found for SO2 and H2S, you could actually only needed one laser. So two lasers would actually give you those three gases. And theoretical calculations gave you that you could actually detect to below one part per million uh, quite easily with a 22 centimeter uh, gas cell having 100 reflections, so it's a 22 meter path length. So that's the design of the instrument atop is we combined the mass spectrometer and the TLS. They actually work very well together. They both scan a voltage and give you a spectrum out. So the actual same computer can actually operate both systems. We actually operate in a batch mode where sample is collected and then can be passed to the mass spectrometer or TLS. We have a calibration gas to do the high accuracy with mass spectrometer. And the total mass of the system was 3.29 kilograms. Unfortunately, mass is a problem. Um, and so with the mass reduction exercise for the whole of the payload, um, the mass had to be reduced. And the easiest to, thing to do with uh, modules is remove one module. And so the TLS was unfortunately removed to give the final design, which is just the uh, mass spectrometer with calibration gas and uh, gas distribution system. So uh, that's the summary, basically. The analytic instrumentation is XRD, XOF, we're still undecided between that and the AXS and SAMCAM. And the gas analysis is an iron trap very similar to the PITAMs with a gas manifold and gas calibration system. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. We have, uh, I think, uh, five minutes for questions, so you can stay here, Andrew. We have five minutes for questions, so if the speaker can, can come here. And if there is any question, we have a little bit of time. Any question? I had, I had a question about the um, seismic suite. Um, you said you wanted to live longer than the lander what was the expectation uh, of how long you're gonna survive um so hopefully it will be like four months at least that's the minimum that we would like but with insight i think it was only meant to be for a few months but it collected data for like four years so that was very successful so we hope fss is also the same thing For that prospect, um, I'm Mark Robinson, Arizona State University. For the prospect landing site selection, why did you exclude all of the Artemis um, sites? Uh, that was a requirement for NASA CLIPS. Yeah, he can ask NASA CLIPS. <laughs> uh, I'm afraid we don't know that information as to why it was excluded, but I think it was just areas of interest. Yeah, also um, for, for Dave and for, for you, Sarah, I'm, I'm sorry I'm, I missed your talk because of the coffee break going over, but I know that you're working very hard on the lending sites and it occurred to me um, because there's a lot of additional pressure now because of the extremely shortened operational window um, and then also the, the real needs to very carefully select a landing site where you're most likely to have some success with the, with the instruments. I wonder if this might be a good starting point for the for the sort of the, the 
landing site crack team that we were talking about yesterday, because I think maybe like I can speak for, for my group. I mean, we, we've been looking at, well, a lot of the Artemis landing sites, but um, other things in the South Polar region. And, and we probably have information that's not you know, available in the literature yet that we would certainly be happy to, to contribute to an internal discussion. So um, I would say, oh, let's get that group going. That would be great. Yeah, I think um, we should all, any landing site people, we should all uh, get in touch after the meeting and uh, we can see how we can all help each other out. I think that's a really good idea. I think it goes beyond the data as well. It's lessons learned on processes and that sort of stuff. So yeah, it's a really good starting point. We have time for one last question. Uh, for the far side, the sismometer. Uh, so, uh, with your experience from uh, inside, uh, so um, do you expect with the duration that we could uh, see the equivalent of a global mode? And also, are there opportunities where there will be another seismometer, let's say, on the other side, where you could even probe very well the, the deep core? Um, yeah, so actually, I shouldn't be saying this, but NASA really like FSS, and they said that hopefully every manned mission will have something like this, so we'll go further than the far side of the moon um, and go beyond, so yeah. And in terms of the global mode, uh, how different is the moon compared to Mars? Do you expect to, to have some time of the full moon uh, resonating as a global uh, um, yeah, it's quite different. So we have had to adapt the sensors so it can operate on the moon as well. So yeah, there's been adjustments um, and then basically the lunar gravity as well. So a lot of testing on that as well. Thank you. I think we can go ahead. I leave to Andrew to continue. So our next speaker is uh, Gatan Mehta, um, and it's a virtual presentation. Hello, um, can you hear and see me well, as well as the slides? We can hear you and we've got the slides. Okay, great. Um, hello, everyone. First of all, thank you, everyone at uh, ELS and in particular, the organizing committee for giving me the opportunity to have this talk. Um, yeah, so the title of my talk is Sustaining Lunar Exploration Through Worldwide Su Public Support. And I will get into details of what I really mean by that and some key considerations that I think um, as an observer of global series exploration, uh, that I think we may not be considering as intensely. Next slide, please. Yeah, for those of you who don't know me, um, I am a space exploration writer and uh, my flagship writing is Moon Monday, which is, uh, which is basically the world's only dedicated newsletter to covering lunar exploration updates from around the world. And I have been globally published on various publications, both in India, where I where I'm from as well as uh, abroad. And so this is the context where I'm coming from. So everything that I say, uh, I think it would be useful if you could take it from that lens. Uh, so as an observer of space exploration activities around the world and you know tracking all the updates that have happened uh, you know, over the last five years as NASA planned Artemis clips and many other programs came into being. Next slide, please. Okay, so the thing that everyone in this room knows is that we have been building up a renewed return to our moon, and that's excellent. And it's not been just for the last five years, but rather for the last two decades, in fact, because from ESA to ISRO to CNSA and many others, we have many countries have been sending their first missions to the moon. Some of them have been very successful uh, and so that, that really shows like there has been a global impetus. And of course, um, 
NASA itself has been sending multiple orbiters starting with the LARO and in the meanwhile has managed to force a very exciting and possibly the most ambitious space program in history with Artemis, which we all hope uh, succeeds really well. Next slide, please. Yes, but the thing that I think we should remember is that even though there is a global impetus and more countries and organizations of all sorts are sending moon missions than ever before, there are some unique conditions that are there now which haven't been there in history. Some of them are positives, but some may not be so. So for example, now we have uh, both private missions to the moon as well as non-traditional country first. What do I mean by that? Uh, I mean, uh, countries no longer need to develop their own launch vehicles and even moon landers for that matter to send their rover to the moon. Uh, just as one example, uh, you could be anywhere on that hardware stack. Uh, so basically the barrier to entry has been lowered, which has led to this, which is, which is what in part has led to this increased number of moon missions. But there's, and that naturally has also resulted in many collaborative fronts uh, as well as low cost avenues. So that all is great. But at the same time, what has happened is that we have started to build various programs based on these abilities, which are yet to be proven. Uh, of course, to be clear that I'm, I'm very much rooting for these new kinds of missions to be successful. And I think we all are in this very room, uh, especially with CLIPS and um, Artemis and, and, and particularly its human landing system and so on. But I think there's something that we do not need to forget is that uh, if we place these programs on the critical path uh, to the success of our moon missions, especially in the case of Artemis, then there are many more contributions that we need to take to ensure that we can sustain the funding for that. Next slide, please. Yes, so at, at the, so as even as we are having many more missions uh, to the moon, uh, again, uh, the reason we need to consider that there might be several uh, 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 slipping points in as we forge a, uh, you know, a return to the moon, that moon missions remain risky as ever. And I think everyone in this room uh, I'm addressing to knows this way better than I do, that moon missions require uh, still require orchestrating, you know, hundreds to thousands of people, and they remain complex in resource intensive endeavors. And we only need to look at the last four years of moon exploration, where say for Changi 5, we have basically had, uh, in terms of landings, uh, three back-to-back uh, -back landing failures, uh, again, other than Changi 5. So we have had, uh, unfortunately, uh, the Space Isle Barashit lander crash on the moon, the Chandrayaan 2 lander crash on the moon, uh, and of course, uh, most recently, uh, Hakuto are unfortunately also crashing on the moon. So moon missions remain risky. And the reason I point out this slide is that even as we are very excited about our return to the moon, so am I. But uh, if we are going to mount the successes of our most critical moon missions uh, on programs that we are yet to reinforce with in terms of mechanisms and fundings and so on, then we might be in for much more delays and failures and we should embrace that. Next slide, please. So uh, one of the ways I could highlight that is uh, two programs. One is NASA Clips and ESA Moonlight. There are some others, but this should be serving as good illustrations where even with the uh, Clips missions where NASA does envision eventually the Clips vendors having uh, commercial payloads as a majority of the customers. And I'm very glad to see that Intuitive Machines and Astrobotic have made a great headway in that direction, but we are still not at the majority of the uh, uh, funded payloads being commercial yet. Uh, so the fact remains that NASA or, an, or a space agency for that matter, a national space agency, which is tax funded, remains the anchor customer. That is also true for ESA's upcoming Moonlight uh, Navigation and Communications Constellation, uh, where again, ESA is the anchor customer, even though they do envision having uh, commercial um, applications of it, which might be leveraged later on. But to begin with, uh, as we do with Lunar Pathfinder a few years later, it will, ESA remains the anchor customer. And the secondary customer for Pathfinder is also NASA. So technically, you're not escaping the space agency uh, uh, dependency on a national space agency, even though you are saying that, you know, we are having private and commercial missions. Next slide, please. 
And of course, the uh, most important bit, I think, uh, or at least the most critical bit in our sustained renewed return to the moon is that the human landing systems that NASA has selected with SpaceX and Blue Origin also depend on, uh, you know, having a commercial and private inclusion where majority of the funding does in this case come from, seems to be coming from uh, the uh, companies themselves. However, NASA is still putting in a good chunk of the money uh, for this endeavor. And so ultimately, as again, this is part of a large domino effect, like is this part connect this part of a large connected program. So every uh, failure and delay anywhere. So even for, for example, if, if the SLS rocket faces delays, ultimately delays these missions as well uh, because of the program architecture. But the point is that not only are commercial and private missions, even though by definition they should be independent or can be independent or desire to be independent, they are not only having National Space Agency as anchor customers, but the reverse is also true where national space programs are now putting commercial missions on the critical path. Again, um, I don't think that's necessarily a bad thing, at least in my opinion. Uh, it, it might work out excellent, uh, and that's what I think what we are all hoping for, but it's something to watch out for. Next slide, please. Two minutes to go. Thank you. So I think um, so. I think the point has been made that there's no alternative to public buy-in and funding, right? And so that's what we need to consider. In that context, we need to consider that we might want to do more forms of communications and outreach across the globe. Next slide, please. And but at the same time, the same the same people who are funding our uh, missions across the globe, uh, depending on which national space agency you look at, uh, the taxpayers have very little awareness of the insight, like of the breadth, depth, or the purpose of lunar exploration activities. Next slide, please. And that is precisely why, at least partly why I write Moon Monday, because what I observed is that even people with, there's so much happening in lunar exploration that even people within the lunar communities uh, are not always aware of the finer bits and pieces moving here and there across the global lunar ecosystem that we are trying to like mount missions from, uh, that the, the, the kind of global missions that we are mounting uh, to the moon from. And so this is uh, just to illustrate that while this is just one person's effort, even there I'm seeing that there are many people relying on this sort of a newsletter for their primary uh, front of information. So imagine the number of people across the world who have absolutely no idea of why we do moon, moon exploration and only see random bits and pieces here and there uh, whenever the press decide to cover something at scale. Next slide, please. So I basically have a few sets of recommendations and I'll, I'll be done in two minutes. Uh, uh, and that basically covers this spectrum. Again, these are just my recommendations. There's much more to do and much more to consider. Next slide, please. So. The first recommendation that I have is enhance your websites with email alerts and RSS feeds and more press releases everywhere. I think that allows you to work with journalists and creators at scale, which you might not be considering right now. And not just that, go ahead and proactively pitch to, you know, media publication editors and journalists to write about your research or project or even the larger themes, many of which we have seen in this conference uh, in terms of tracks of the talks. Uh, and also, I think we need to learn more, uh, run more community uh, explainer blogs, the likes of Astrobytes and Nature's Behind the Papers. Uh, or in fact, even in our own lunar community, LROC featured image is an excellent blog, but I think it's kind of the only one. So I think we need more of that. Next slide, please. And we'll make it the last slide. So, sure. So yeah, and I, I think don't ignore creators. And uh, that's because they reach with newsletters, uh, and also with in, in regional languages, huge volumes of people who you would not be reaching otherwise, or the or the kinds of niches that media uh, niches that media publications don't reach otherwise. And also on the same lines, if you could have, let's say, in all of these lunar conferences, if we could have uh, something like uh, sessions which incentivize writers as well as researchers to do more outreach, I think that would be great. Uh, so similarly, like to close off with one last recommendation, I think. Uh, quick map is a great tool, not just for scientists, but also for people like me who are trying to get the word out to more people. Uh, but we need more kinds of tools like that. So a paper, paperscape, if you are aware of it, is a visual tool to visualize research papers and how they are connected. A lunar equivalent would be very great. Thank you.
The next speaker is uh, Ian Crawford. All right, sorry about that. So right at the extreme end of, um, of lunar astrobiology is the question as to whether the moon can help us in searching for not just life in the universe, but intelligent life in the universe. Because it's been recognized for a long time that radio SETI from the far side would be one, astro one way of using the moon to search for intelligent life in the universe. But there are other techno signatures which might be possible. And, uh, uh, and uh, at the extreme end of this spectrum, uh, we can ask the question as to whether we, if, if intelligent life has been common in the universe, whether there might be evidence left behind on the surface of the moon in the form of techno signatures, which would be uh, non-terrestrial artifacts. Now, just because I know this sounds very strange and just because I want to assure you that it, there are plenty of people who've thought about this over, over the years, these, these shows um, snippets from a white paper by uh, Jacob Hack Mistra and others that they submitted to the Decadal Survey, uh, searching for techno signatures, proposing searches for techno signatures. And you can see that section two here was um, searching for non terrestrial artifacts and 2.1 was surface artifacts. And since this is the Lunar Science Symposium and we're interested in the moon, the question is. Should we is there should we be keeping our eyes and minds open to searching for uh, artifacts on the moon? Um, so I know at this point that there's a tendency to think that this is slightly science fictiony, this whole question, but it isn't really so asking the question as to whether there is intelligent life elsewhere in the universe or not is not a science fiction question. It's one of the deepest and most important scientific questions of our time because uh, right up there with the nature of dark matter and dark energy, because there is something going on in the universe that we don't fully understand. We now know that planets are common, so we expect that life will be common. Yet we know that once life starts, natural selection starts driving life towards complexity. And at least in one place, that increase in complexity has resulted in a technical civilization. So if you expect that life to be common in the universe because the planets are common and all the rest of it, the logic points towards technological civilizations arguably being common, unless there's some substantial bottleneck between the origin of life and the emergence of technological civilizations. So we would we really need to try and find out um, uh, whether there is such a bottleneck or not, because if there isn't, technical civilizations should be common in the universe, in which case arguably we should have found evidence of them by now. And we haven't, and this is called the Fermi paradox. So the question here for the lunar science community is whether the lunar geological record can help constrain the Fermi paradox. Picture on the on the um, uh, the left, as you see it, is a spiral galaxy Messier 51. 
And if this were our galaxy, our solar system would be somewhere here. Now, the galaxy is 10 billion years old. So it could, in principle, have had a lot of a life in its history. And some of this life might have evolved to technical, technological civilizations. And there might have been a lot of technical civilizations in the history of the galaxy doing stuff uh, that we might expect to find evidence for. So here you recognize Frank Drake with his um, autonomous equation. And uh, we've been gradually moving um, from left to right, filling in terms of this equation in that we now know the star formation rate. We now know that all stars have planets of first order, and that probably each planetary system has at least one habitable planet, more or less. We've still no idea what fraction of such planets life evolves on or evolves intelligence or what the lifetime is. But let me just draw your attention to something that I think is often overlooked about the Drake equation. Um, if you, what Drake has done by taking the star formation rate and multiplying it by all these fractions, all of that is the rate at which technological civilizations evolve, measured in civilizations per year. And then the steady state number at any given time, which is what Drake was interested in, uh, you multiply that by the lifetime, and we, we have no idea. So that's what we'd like to constrain. The point is, though, if you are minded to think that the universe is full of stars, which it is, and full of planets, and probably life is common, and you're minded as Frank uh, Drake was, um, that uh, evolution will push life towards intelligence and technology and all the rest of it. So call it such a view, a SETI optimistic view, uh, which has all of these factors about equal to one. Um, and then what, what that means is that you're, and, and then you, if the lifetime were low, it'd still only be a small number in the galaxy at any given time. But over the history of the galaxy, there'd be an enormous number. If you were to take all of these fractions to be of the order of one, then you're predicting one technological civilization to form in the galaxy uh, uh, per, per year. The galaxy is 10 to the 10 years old. So you're predicting over the history of the galaxy 10 to the 10 civilizations. One star in 10 would host a civilization if you, like Frank Drake and Carl Sagan, thought all of the. So, so the question is, I mean, if that were the case, should we see evidence for it? Obviously, if some of these fractions are really small, then we, then we won't. So the question is, can we help? Can, is there anything that we as a lunar science community can try and do to try and constrain some of this? Um, well, we could search the moon for our, our alien artifacts that have come here. You recognize the big picture here is the obelisk from um, 2001 A Space Odyssey. Um, so there have been proposals, and Robert Wagner is, is in the audience somewhere. <laughs> Uh, uh, who, who wrote a paper with Paul Davies 10 years ago. Uh, we could search LROC images for alien artifacts, and we should, because we've got the data. So why would we not look? Of course, uh, searching, LROC, searching LROC images for alien artifacts isn't going to wouldn't have found the magnetic anomaly in 2001 because it was buried. Um, and hey, it was a serendipitous discovery from a geophysics survey. So you never know what you might, you should we keep our eyes and minds open as we explore the moon, even with geophysical instruments. Um, uh, the insert here, Arthur C. Clarke's short story, The Sentinel, was published in 1951. Um, it's a pre precursor to um, 2001 A Space Odyssey. And in, in that story, the astronauts did find an artifact on the surface. If you haven't read the story, I recommend it. It's an excellent example of the kind of serendipitous discovery that might be made from a pressurized rover as it trundles around Mare Christian in the case of this story and an artifact was found. However, I'm not suggesting this is at all likely because we're asking a lot of the aliens. We're asking the, have the, the aliens have come here, buried something, and, and, and so that, that is a really extreme range of what, you know. Anyway, what I, oh, here, is, um, here is Robert's uh, paper, sorry, hang on. Oh, two minutes, right, okay. So let's just get to time to what I really want to talk about. Uh, so if you're, if, you're, if, you're, if, you're interested in, if you're interested in searching the surface for alien artifacts, then I'll draw your attention to the, the, the Davison uh, that paper. Um, in the 1990s, uh, uh, Andrei Arkhipov um, published an idea which I think deserves more attention. And he published it in rather obscure places, mostly in Russian journals. And when he published in English, it was in strange places. But the core, so it's not well known. It's not as well known as I think it should be. 
Arkhipov's idea was that if a space, every, if a civilization gets to like our stage or where we might like to be in 50 years time, we start colonizing the solar system and mining asteroids, we will generate a lot of space debris. Well, uh, the, the, the insides of rocket exhaust engines will be eroded uh, by, the, um, by the exhaust and small micron, submicron sized particles will be put out into the interplanetary medium of the host planetary system. And ditto, all this large scale construction activity will produce debris. The small scale debris um, of micron, submicron size won't stay in the host planetary system. It will get swept out by the radiation pressure from the host star into the interstellar medium. The more technological civilizations that have existed in the history of the galaxy, the more polluted the interstellar medium will be with small scale micron to sub, sub micron to micron scale artifacts. This was our past idea. Uh, how much there'll be in the interstellar medium depends on how many civilizations have been polluting the galaxy with debris over the history of the galaxy. But that could have been a large number. If you're intuitively thinking that maybe the galaxy today contains a few hundred civilizations, it means over the history of the galaxy it will have contained billions, because that's the logic of the trade equation. Even if each one only lasted a hundred years or a thousand years, and if, if, any, if none of them developed a true interstellar spacefaring capability, nevertheless, the interstellar medium will be um, polluted by space debris blown out from stars into these dark clouds that will accumulate. Meanwhile, the solar system trundles around the galaxy, well, relative to the spiral pattern, maybe 400 million years. So the solar system has been around the whole galaxy um, about 10 times. Um, and the airless bodies of airless surfaces in the solar system may have been accreting stuff, well, will have been accreting stuff from the interstellar medium. And if in the interstellar medium there's artificial debris, then we might we should be keeping an eye open for it. And I'm, so to put it no more strongly than that, that was our Pipov's uh, suggestion. And I, and I think he's right. We should be keeping, obviously, if there'd been no civilizations in the history of the galaxy, we won't find any debris. But if Clark and if, 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 um, if Drake and Sagan and, and, and SETI optimists were on the right lines, uh, that <laughs> there have been billions of civilizations in the history of the galaxy. And if they you know, a lot of debris might have been generated. So yes, okay, so, so only two more slides. So this will, obviously these are gonna be, these are gonna be needles in a haystack in the, um, in the, in the regolith. Um, it's not something that it, it, would, re, it would require a, a very, a, so part of it would be serendipitous, right? It would potentially serendipitous discovery. You could be more of the moon we explore, we never know what we might find. But we could be a bit more proactive than that. If in the future we're going to start using the regolith as a feedstock for a lot of ISRU and construction and other purposes, one could imagine somewhere on the conveyor belt that take, takes you from the bulldozer that digs up the regolith to the end processing plant, you could install some sort, pass it through some sort of detector, like a bomb detector on the trolley that takes the suitcases from you know, in the airport. If you could pass the regolith through some sort of detector, sensitive, looking for unusual things, before you destroy it in, in the concrete or whatever you're going to make. Um, it, it, it might, it, if you do it, once you sift through enough of the regolith, it may become possible to place some sort of limit on the number of archipelag particles entering the solar system from the galaxy, which in turn would put some sort of limit on the prevalence of technological civilizations that have existed in the history of the galaxy, even if none of them have come here deliberately. This was Archipos's idea. Sorry, this is the my final slide. Um, I mean, one would not build a moon base to look for alien artifacts. And we've got a long, a long list of reasons for wanting to build a moon base, but it is the kind of infrastructure that once it's established will enable you to um, ex explore, engage in a whole range of activities on the moon, of course. But while we're doing that, Perhaps we should be keeping our minds and eyes open to um, searching for uh, extraterrestrial artifacts while we're at it. So thank you. Our next presenter, I believe, is Flavia Palmer. Is she here? Thank 
Let's see, I got. So um, I'm not uh, Flavia Palma, I am Professor Sofia Pavanello that um, I was uh, instead of uh, this, uh, my PhD student because we, he's not able to come here for uh, personal reason. So uh, I am here, I am Professor of, uh, uh, I don't uh, I'm professor of uh, occupational uh, medicine, and uh, uh, my interest is uh, on uh, uh, human space uh, exploration. Um, so uh, an argument that is completely different probably from that uh, we hear until now. Um, um, I am interested in this, uh, uh, in this argument because a new era of uh, human space exploration is started and take humans uh, to the moon and Mars in the next future, uh, with more men and women uh, that will live or work uh, even as a space tourist. And so for this reason, occupational medicine is very interested in this, uh, in this field. Um, because uh, uh, space is an extreme hostile environment uh, in which risk of human health uh, classifies as red risk. Um, red risk are radiation, microgravity, confinement, uh, uh, and distance from health. And uh, because the, uh, there is the highest probability of uh, occurrence uh, in uh, the uh, severity of uh, what is here? Okay. Uh, is an extreme environment uh, um, because uh, the, there is the highest probability of occurrence uh, and to the severity of their infant of health. Uh, those um, space agency uh, has uh, created uh, analog mission uh, in which young analog astronauts participate with the intention of simulating space life. In this presentation, I should like to uh, I speak on my experience as referent for the University of Padova on the uh, astronaut training center in Poland um, and uh, where I support the participation of uh, the student from uh, my uh, university. Uh, the astronaut uh, training center uh, is a laboratory for simulating the space environment with scientific experiment focus on uh, biology, physics, space medicine, and they specialize also in training course generally of one week, uh, not only for scientists, but uh, uh, also on uh, engineers. Um, the training center uh, organized a workshop uh, on rocket construction, um, stratospheric mission, and scientific uh, simulation analogous to uh, lunar and Mars mission. Um, I, uh, I support here, there is a photo of uh, the student that participated in the last year uh, to all of this uh, activity. Uh, here there is Bernard uh, with uh, Serena Crotti that also participate and help me uh, in this uh, uh, organization. Um, I support the, the uh, in uh, 2021 uh, uh, three mission and uh, in 2022 more recently another one. Uh, the ample six uh, was uh, uh, of one week. Uh, uh, these were the activity that were very well scheduled uh, with physical activity, research experiment, social activity, media uh, production and report that, as you can see, uh, were scheduled during one week and uh, each uh, 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 every hour of the day. Uh, the goal was uh, to improve the health, the cooperation, training to be astronaut, uh, pushing the limit, and also how to make uh, uh, scientific uh, research and article. Uh, this is Tommaso uh, Antonio Giacone, that was uh, a medical doctor of our university that uh, participated at, uh, uh, as crew uh, medical officer with experiment that we uh, um, that we set up together on environmental characterization, biological aging, uh, and oxidative stress, metabolic stress, uh, inflammation uh, during the, this kind of uh, um, project. Uh, here all uh, uh, the photo, um, here when uh, they make the experiment, uh, and so on. Um, 
the seven um, mission uh, with uh, Antonio Ricciardi, Giulia Bisona, uh, the goal were on uh, experimental uh, how is uh, the health in isolation, reduce communication with outside, how uh, to uh, react uh, for emergency experiment, Experiments were in particular uh, for the cultivation of, the, of different types of soil, um, uh, psychological uh, couple test and uh, self-confinement within uh, the team. Uh, we also measure uh, the uh, volatile organic compound and, uh, and aldehydes. In urine sample and saliva, we also make a measurement of uh, toxic and uh, um, compound. And we, uh, me band, uh, we uh, collect data on uh, physiological data. Uh, we do uh, also uh, oral um, microbiome and other kind of experiment that they make and, uh, in collecting data. Uh, the last one uh, was uh, last year and uh, was to investigate the physiological and psychological changes. Uh, the hypothesis was that variation in the parameters co uh, correlated to the phase shift in the circadian rhythm, uh, rhythm uh, in environmental conditions that are not strictly uh, physiological same. Uh, here, uh, the parameters uh, uh, that we collect uh, the uh, relative measurement method used, uh, the time of the date in which uh, they were collected, and sampling frequency. Uh, here, the psychological parameters uh, um, by which uh, we can measure uh, the mood uh, of uh, the people, uh, and uh, we can characterize the emotion according to the level of energy and pleasantness. Uh, the methods uh, for statistics is uh, here. And the result, uh, um, um, we, we found that, uh, for example, the glycemia uh, increase in all people that uh, participate uh, to, during seven days uh, during the, this uh, uh, mission. And this uh, um, agree with other experiments, with the other uh, mission. Uh, also, the earth rate increase uh, during the seven, the week uh, while uh, the student uh, make this experiment, the saturation instead of uh, is uh, very variable uh, as uh, the result. The mood, the mood um, while it is increasing in the first three days, uh, in the last uh, three, in the other, uh, at the end of week, uh, the mood uh, was decreased. In conclusion, uh, um, we, we realized that, uh, and we confirmed that alteration in uh, the uh, parameters that we analyze. Um, uh, I think that uh, uh, this behavior is in relation with the uh, variation in circadian rhythm. And uh, um, this, uh, what we found is consistent with other similar studies carried out in, con uh, in condition of absence of sunlight and uh, environmental isolation. The limit uh, uh, and uh, the prospect uh, for the future is that study with larger sample can improve data, can improve data quality, and uh, um, uh, is, uh, we need a longer period of isolation uh, that could be the first step uh, that we will realize in the next future. This, uh, uh, this summer, uh, we isolated for 21 uh, one day uh, people in order to, um, uh, to collect the physiological parameters. Um, we also um, um, need to improve data recording uh, with the device and um, more and, and uh, we, we need also a better uh, real-time feedback uh, uh, on uh, astronaut health inside uh, the, um, the, uh, the box where they make the experiment. So uh, this is uh, the, all the students that they make the, this uh, nice, uh, very wonderful uh, um, uh, experience. Uh, this is all uh, the um, country where they come. And so thank you for your attention. I, I hope that we... I was in time. No, no. <laughs> So our next speaker is Leonardo Turkey.
So here we are. So, uh, well, uh, hello, glad to be here. I'm Leonardo Turki, I'm a system engineer, and uh, I work in the preparation, development, and preparation for field utilization of a suite of uh, hardware and software tools uh, in support of the ESA, CASE, and Pangea astronaut field training programs of the European Astronaut Center of ESA. Uh, I will introduce you with this presentation to a suite, uh, which we call the Electronic Fieldbook Tool Suite, which supports these programs directly in the field. But first, what is, uh, what is Pangea? Uh, Pangea is the uh, astronaut training for planetary geology, is the ESA official training in, uh, in uh, planetary geology science and also astrobiology. There will be a presentation next to this one specifically on Pangea. So here I will just say that uh, Pangea is a training starting in 2016 and running every year and training astronauts in non-simulated science, which is, uh, I think, we, we think it's important because it introduces them to real unexpected discoveries and real exploration in the field uh, to become effective uh, uh, scientists and to communicate effectively with ground uh, at some point they will, when they will, they will be uh, on the surface of other planets. Uh, but during these, uh, these years, uh, we also developed and refined uh, a suite of tools uh, which allow for uh, data collection in the field uh, and transmission to ground science backgrounds. And we also found out that this is in line with the NASA Artemis III Science Definition Team report, which uh, indeed encourages to have uh, capabilities of real-time transmission data from, in from site, uh, from uh, um, uh, the field to uh, science backgrounds and back. Uh, during the, the last years, we came up with this uh, tool suite. We call it the Electronic Fieldbook Tool Suite. And uh, uh, this, uh, is a package that we use uh, directly in the field that we give to the astronauts in training uh, and that all streamlines uh, the data collection directly in the field, uh, providing situational awareness to ground uh, in order for ground to follow better the, uh, what's uh, going on in the field and the various operations, but also providing locally decision support uh, during uh, the geological training uh, activities. And uh, as you can see at the center of the suite, uh, there is the EFB, the electronic field book, uh, which uh, interacts with uh, other modules uh, or external instruments and sensors like uh, handheld spectrometers that are used by astronauts to collect uh, signatures of the uh, minerals or, or rocks in front of them. An embedded, uh, we all, in the EFB, there is also an embedded uh, planetary catalog uh, uh, providing reference information on known planetary minerals. And this was introduced also by our colleague in another presentation last days. We also have uh, uh, um, machine learning, a series of machine learning algorithms that run in the electronic field book uh, to provide uh, locally decision support and in general support to the users uh, during operations. And also a series of uh, external imaging devices like uh, uh, cameras, microscope, panoramic cameras uh, to provide uh, situational awareness and contextualized situational awareness to, to ground. And the EFB itself allows uh, mainly for traverse planning. Uh, it supports a traverse execution during the Pangea program, uh, allows for direct on-site uh, uh, information ingestion and uh, um, uh, classification and near real-time transmission to ground, which can review information and can sync back bidirectionally feedback. And it supports these uh, through um, also uh, a custom network that is disruption tolerant that can be in some cases also field deployed by astronauts to provide connectivity in location where it's not uh, actually uh, available. It was uh, the development of this tool started for Pangea, but then uh, we also decided to extend it to CAVES, which is another program of, uh, of ESA and is underground uh, due to the good feedback we received uh, in the, in the, during the utilization. We have a paper on this. I encourage you to, to go and read. It's on the Planetary Space Science Journal. Uh, as we said, uh, the Electronic Fieldbook Tool Suite uh, is composed by several modules, and uh, the astronauts in training are provided usually of uh, DFB on the tablet, running on a tablet for now. Um, of uh, uh, external tools like, uh, as we said, analytical tools, which are wireless integrated to the, uh, with the EFB. And uh, 
external wireless microscopes, battery powered and portable, and uh, networking uh, um, devices to forward these, uh, uh, to en enable connectivity to ground. Directly in the field, uh, the crew could therefore easily bind a scan of a rock to an area of a site, which is automatically meta tagged inside the electronic field book, which uh, ingest this information, the, the spectrum, it, it interacts with the embedded locally mineralogical database and machine learning algorithm that I just introduced you to, and uh, uh, gives uh, displays uh, in near real time an output to the crew on uh, the uh, predictions, let's say on the likelihood, uh, let's say on the, on the um, predictions that of what is the rock in front of the astronaut itself. Uh, Ground at the same time receives all these information in real time. They can have therefore contextualized uh, tracking of what's going on in the field. They can filter information in many ways. For example, they can see data on a map that can be 2D or 3D. They can uh, stack uh, uh, different layers of multispectral maps. They can also see information in an entity relationship uh, uh, classical uh, way. And as introduced, uh, one of the modules of uh, the electronic field book is, uh, uh, that is widely used is the uh, machine learning. Uh, we embed in the EFB a mineralogical database that covers more than 10,000 spectra. And uh, as you can see, more than 600 minerals. Our team at EEC uh, is working on uh, a machine learning algorithm that uh, we currently use with a, with a VNIR uh, mini spectrum, portable spectrometer in the field. But they are all, and, and this, and this uh, um, gives a sort of 84, 85% accuracy, that which is already good uh, enough for our purposes, but we are also constantly working on improving this uh, module and combining, for example, multiple uh, inputs from different spectrometers. As you can see in this case, Raman and BNAR, we could, the, the, our team at EC could achieve uh, almost 93% of accuracy. So the, this suite of tools uh, has become uh, a key factor for allowing streamlined uh, data collection in the field and uh, transmission to ground and also data archival for long-term for our uh, Pangea uh, field training campaigns. As you can see here, it was also used and we constantly refine the, uh, the concept and all the tools uh, uh, to arrive to a the, let's say a more optimized version, something that can really help an astronaut, not only in the training, uh, whilst they are in the training, but then at some point becoming a sort of field companion when they will be at some point on the, Earth, on the moon. And uh, you can see here that we also tested it uh, in a sort of more operational setup uh, in Pangea X, Pangea Extension campaign in 2018, uh, where they could have uh, uh, their own uh, networking devices, uh, their own uh, handheld uh, instruments, uh, and they could experiment uh, simulating uh, uh, EVA constraints and testing some uh, science operations. Uh, this suite is composed by several tools. Uh, it's modular and uh, flexible. We can easily add uh, additional tools. And uh, for this reason, uh, is uh, after the good feedback that we received uh, by the crews uh, in trainings, um, decided to follow up on this uh, on this uh, concept and uh, is now following some industrial activities to ruggedize portions of these two suites. For example, starting for, from uh, the, the electronics that at some point could support these or similar concepts during the astronaut uh, uh, real missions on the surface of the moon. We think that for Europe is a good occasion and it's a good, uh, um, let's say, a way to be in first line for the next uh, human exploration of, uh, of the moon. Thank you. And our final speaker is Francesco Zolo.
Good afternoon, everybody. So I will, uh, I'm Francesco Sauro. Uh, I'm working for the ISA Case and Pangea team. And I will uh, talk to you about the uh, Pangea training program, uh, which is a training program from ISA um, about uh, field geology and planetary geology. We have been running this training now since uh, seven years. And so um, the training has been de developing through time. And now we, it is in a state of the art, let's say, stage uh, where uh, we think uh, we are providing very good uh, uh, learning opportunities for uh, astronauts, uh, for uh, ESA and also for other space agencies. So uh, all of you that are working on lunar science know how uh, it was important for the Apollo missions, um, the learning on the field the um, field trips, especially for the J missions or for the last three missions, to really gather new information from the lunar surface for the astronauts to be able really to collect samples that are useful and that were fulfilling the uh, requirements from the science community. So uh, we, uh, in ENISA, we started in 2016, already thinking about future human exploration. We need time. Uh, astronaut needs to be prepared and uh, this kind of uh, uh, knowledge needs time and practice to be acquired and it's something that really happens learning in the field learning by doing so uh, of course it doesn't only involve uh, astronauts it's something that involves uh, different uh, let's say uh, space related sectors and part partners like for example of course the scientists the scientific community uh, training and operations, uh, but also analog sites, places here on Earth and especially in Europe where we can uh, train the astronauts in similar uh, geological environments, of course, industry for, for tools and uh, innovation and technologies. So after uh, the beginning in 2016, as I said now, also uh, we, we see this, uh, this need also through the, as Leonardo was saying, yeah, NASA Artemis 3 science definition team report. So, all the astronauts that will go to the moon for sure needs uh, uh, to participate to uh, courses, Apollo style, geology, planetary science, especially I would say in the field. And also uh, they need to be ready to collect uh, uh, varieties also to discern between different samples and subsurface samples on the moon or even in the future in other planets. So, uh, as I said, we, we it's seven years we are doing Pangaea uh, and uh, we had uh, up to now uh, five uh, editions. Uh, another, a new one will start in September. Uh, we, as you can see, we have uh, uh, several ESA astronauts since 2021. We have also the participation of uh, one as an astronaut uh, in the Artemis group, uh, Kate Rubin, and uh, last year, Stephanie Wilson. Uh, and um, I, I want also to say that uh, the, the training and the, the program started with the collaboration of Jesus here in Padova. And I want to remember the director at the time, Stefano De Bay. And uh, uh, it involves also a very complex also logistic setting with uh, Minds Beyond the Altec. Uh, and also we had the help of ASI uh, in, uh, in providing fellowship uh, on, on specific on this program. So there are instructors from the planetary geology community, the European community from Germany, France, Italy, Spain, UK, Norway. All the instructor and ESA, we published uh, this paper on ACT Astronautica that uh, basically described the training. Uh, of course, it was not the same every year. As I said, it was evolving through the year. So now this uh, paper described the, the state of the art and uh, uh, the structure that we have uh, uh, now. Uh, all the program is managed by the space training team in the European Astronaut uh, uh, Center. So uh, how it is now, Pangea? We, we bring the astronauts to a very uh, complete uh, training, which has the objective to prepare them, not for a specific mission, but in general, uh, about to be ready uh, on a geological exploration on a natural environment which has similarities analogies with the moon so we go to uh, four sites in europe as you see three of them are geoparks uh, we go from the dolomites to learn the basics of geology and also something about sedimentary geology and mars uh, then we go to the uh, geopark of ries uh, uh, one of the best uh, impact creator in the world in germany 
then a Lanzarote for uh, uh, lunar and Martian volcanism, and then at the end, uh, uh, Lofoten in Norway for anorthosites and uh, um, lunar highlands, a very spectacular place. Um, so the cost structure is, uh, is, uh, is made uh, through incremental learning. Uh, as, uh, as we can see from uh, this graph here, uh, we start, of course, with theoretical lessons, but uh, they are always accompanied by practical exercises and uh, direct observation in the field after the lessons in the classroom. And uh, the first two sessions are still, let's say, there is a lot of uh, guidance from the instructors, but uh, from Lanzarote uh, and Lofoten, we, uh, let's say, lose uh, the astronauts more free and we start the traverse process, really the exploration process. So. Um, uh, so th th there is very few time in classroom, but a lot of time in the field, and we ask them to re re require to do um, exploration through traverse, geological exploration. Uh, at the end, we have 23 days of training, uh, 51 hours of classroom, 25 hours of practical exercise, and 60 hours of field trip and traverses. At the end, uh, the objective is that the astronaut will be ready uh, let's say, to be involved in more specific training in the future, uh, which will be probably related to mission-specific uh, activities uh, uh, and uh, depending on the future mission where it will be landing site, which will be the scientific objective. But it's the basic, let's say, a knowledge that allows them to be ready and to focus on the specific uh, objectives. Um, the strategy is uh, is uh, is taking uh, as a, a heritage, a lot of lessons learned from Apollo, uh, from the Apollo uh, field uh, discussions and trips and, uh, and uh, teaching. So of course there is a, a knowledge transfer process where we uh, have instructor teaching to the astronauts how uh, to, for example, recognize rocks, how to read the environment, how to describe the environment, how to document, take samples. So this is, uh, we teach them and they learn from uh, the experience from the others. But then the most important thing is the problem-oriented uh, phase where we, we discuss uh, with the astronauts about uh, uh, science requirements, science objectives, science questions, and then they have to perform the traverse. They have to find out and discover, be ready for discovery, uh, also for unexpected discovery, and uh, uh, so be flexible and to interact with the scientists in a proper way. So this is uh, the part that is the astronauts, of course, like the most because it's really for them uh, to go in the field and explore. Uh, so this is, uh, let's say, the core of Pangaea. We do uh, several self-directed uh, traverses in uh, in Lanzarote. We do also in uh, in Lofoten. Sometimes we have real scientific objectives, so we involve scientists from the site that need some uh, samples. We, they need uh, some specific research to be done. And uh, the astronauts are involved in this research because uh, it is a very good motivation and we are doing something that is real 100%. And so they feel the need to, to really fulfill their objectives. So they, 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 I wanted to highlight that already in Apollo, and this is an heritage from Harrison Smith and, uh, and Jim Head, and Professor Jim Head, the T3 concept. So the, the best way to teach an astronaut is to train him, train him and uh, trust him and then turn him loose because it's what we do also as geologists when we go, we explore, we have to be kind of loose and uh, to be ready to the unexpected and to, the, to find what we are searching for, but also what uh, could be uh, completely new. I don't know if there could be any space debris from ancient civilization that would be also nice, but let's say that there could be always surprises. So we have to be ready. Um, in addition, of course, it's different from the Apollo times because we can add much more technology. And this was already shown by Leonardo. We can, uh, we can try to add uh, to these kind of trainings technology that could mimic or let's say help to advance what could be the technology that we could bring on the moon uh, uh, in order to enhance geological exploration to be able to identify different samples that look the same, but maybe from a chemical point of view are different uh, and to uh, acquire documentation in a structured way to have uh, microscopes and so on. So this is uh, something that we are trying to integrate in the training. Uh, as a conclusion, there are some lessons learned uh, from this uh, training. Uh, we, we, we just uh, uh, published them in this paper in Actasonauti, but basically it's fundamental 
to have the astronaut going uh, to the field and to interwave what they learn in the classroom with what they can see directly uh, in, in the field. Because the perspective also from space, they can learn that the perspective of looking from a satellite images then to be there is completely different. There is a lot uh, that changes. And so we, we have to be ready to read the environment. We have to be practical, uh, implementable knowledge over pure theory. This was something already uh, discussed during Apollo. Of course, uh, uh, elements of planetary space exploration, uh, scientific uh, realism, the T3 concept is very important. And uh, of course, we can add the technology to this kind of training, so we can test technologies, but uh, we have to be very careful that operational simulation should not overcome uh, the field geology learning. Uh, the operations will come later when there will be mission-specific uh, uh, scenarios. So, and the other very important thing that is for the overall community, we need to develop a common language among the astronauts, scientists, engineers, operational planners, because uh, sometimes we speak very different languages and we have to arrive in this mission with uh, a language that is uh, shared among everybody and is more effective uh, in order to face uh, discoveries on the lunar surfaces. Thank you very much. I don't know if the uh, speakers would like to come up for the Q and A panel. Is um, Kat and Matt are online as well? Yes, I'm here. Questions. Well, I am going to ask uh, in Crawford. I mean, we've had a lot of um, lunar missions attempted and landing exceeding design requirements. Is that going to ruin the signal you're going to look for? Uh, do we have a roving microphone? Oh, oh, I see. Okay. So, so the question was about contamination. Was that right? Y yes. So, of course, the first, if we find uh, some strange titanium aluminium alloy on the moon, then the most likely thing is it's going to be a terrestrial contaminant because we've already crashed lots of titanium aluminium alloys onto the moon. I think the next step, though, would be to look at the isotope ratios. If the if the aluminium and titanium have the, the alloys made out of have come from a, another planetary system, the isotope ratios are likely to be different because they'd be non-solar systems ratios so obviously finding something in the regular interesting in the regular would, would just start a long chain of analysis that one would have to go through to rule out that we move towards the uh, artemis with really a very strong human component also addressing the aspect of uh, science on the moon life science on the moon so I would like to ask you how, do, um, how can we test better this aspect of human that are going to perform this investigation with the proper tools, with the proper methodology, also with the medical expertise, which uh, I think will, will have to be addressed to keep them alive, keep them performant, uh, effective. So um, how could we uh, work more integrated uh, involving, for instance, this uh, human aspect, neuroscience operations in, uh, in a field where before we were more working as a geologist or, or physicist? I can just say a few words. It's a big question. <laughs> it could take an entire conference probably to address. But uh, I think that uh, there are two points. Uh, first is the, the interaction between, between different communities because uh, sometimes the geologists, the astronomers we know, and the, let's say the engineers for the space missions and uh, the medical doctors, uh, all these communities has to uh, work a lot together to really put in place uh, uh, this kind of, uh, let's say, activities and, and programs. The other, I think it's, uh, uh, we have to focus, of course, on, uh, let's say, what we have here on Earth uh, to, to learn from it, but also to be very careful 
to be focused and uh, to have uh, real science going on uh, in terms of, of connecting lunar science to what we do here on Earth. I think these are the two things, but it's a matter of space agencies to, to invest and continue on this path, and it's challenging. From my side, from the, the, the part of medical uh, uh, aspect, uh, um, we are uh, we make some proposal uh, uh, to our Italian agency uh, in order to study, for example, uh, the uh, mechanism of uh, biological aging uh, during the space mission. And so we study uh, with the, this uh, specific argument and try to uh, find uh, a uh, and try uh, and try to find uh, the um, something to uh, 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 to slow down uh, the uh, the aging that is increased during uh, this kind of flight. Uh, so we make uh, uh, two uh, kind of uh, proposal. One uh, is uh, uh, to study better uh, the diet and uh, the nutrition during uh, this specific uh, flight, and to measure in the same time. Uh, the biological aging uh, and follow the biological aging of uh, uh, astronaut or analog, analog uh, astronaut uh, uh, too. Uh, the other one is uh, on uh, bed, uh, bed uh, rest uh, uh, experiment uh, where we uh, we try to find what is uh, the damage to the body uh, when uh, a person uh, is without uh, um, is under microgravity. So uh, we need uh, a lot of uh, <laughs> contribution and founding on this. I, I will just add that on this technology side, uh, I believe uh, that in the long term, uh, we will need harmonization, interoperability, because if it's true that uh, in the 60s was, uh, I mean, there was only one entity doing it, so there wasn't this issue. Now it might be, not for the, for, for the short term, but for the long term, uh, for having sustainability also for any possible systems might be sent from not only agencies, also commercial parties and research institutes. So interoperability. Hey, I'm, uh, I'm Susan Kang from China University of Design Sciences. Uh, actually, uh, I feel the five presentation uh, looks quite interesting. Uh, I because I have only have time for one question, so I I would like to ask uh, the the last two presenters about the training program with uh, technology. Actually, uh, the idea uh, situation for the human exploration uh, nowadays is we are, if we can send a geologist to, on the moon, so we can trust uh, his decision on uh, uh, specific missions. But now uh, the question is, um, do we have a threshold between the knowledge of the uh, ast astronaut acquired from the geologic background and also the technology can, can help them to uh, make the decision? So what would be the threshold? I mean, the maximum knowledge the astronaut can acquire with the aid of the technology so we can trust his decision on site. So can we ans answer this question uh, now or maybe uh, in the next few years we can do it? Thank you. It's, it's a very good point, uh, I think. Um, so uh, of course uh, we, we know that uh, from the Apollo time, but also in general, uh, humans uh, have much more potential in interpretation of the environment uh, and uh, based on previous experience, okay. So, uh, so of course, uh, field geology. Everybody, uh, probably there are field geologists in the room. In the room, knows that most of the knowledge comes from direct experience uh, before. So, there is, uh, of course, uh, a theoretical basis, but there is a lot uh, related to previous experience, inability to recognize features and things. That, of course, machine learning and technology will will uh, enhance but will never at the moment completely substitute so um let's say that these two lines goes in parallel we do not need to have an astronaut which is a super expert in geochemistry 
Okay, we need to have an astronaut that is uh, very good in finding something that uh, is looking what we expect and identifying something that is completely different from what we expect. So it's kind of uh, an ability for exploration, really, to describe, to describe, identify features. Then the technology comes as an help because, of course, there are things that we cannot see. There are things that with our senses we cannot really uh, identify, and so uh, spectrometers, uh, uh, other kind of tools, uh, microscopes, uh, uh, there is a lot that can give to you the answer. Would we take this rock or this rock? So the, three, the threshold is, is, is not clear, of course, but I think it goes on a parallel lines because uh, there will be uh, also, uh, it, there is no uh, sense completely to to cut off the science community from ground. The science community from ground, of course, can probably will not be so quickly reactive to provide decisions, but still can provide a lot of uh, inputs for the next traverse, for example. So, so, so it depends on different levels and, uh, and both things goes together, I think. So um, time's running on. So I'd like to close this session and thank all the speakers again for the next session. Well, I want to um, welcome you to the very final session of the uh, conference, and it's an honor to uh, to share this. Um, after we finish these last couple of talks, um, Mahesh will give some uh, closing remarks, and then uh, and then the conference will be over. So every year, Survey is proud to host a community awards ceremony, something that we started 14 years ago in 2009. These awards honor individuals in four categories and are open to members of the community throughout the world. And so for the first time, we're presenting one of these awards at ELS to an esteemed member of our lunar community, who we all know. And uh, I think this indicates that lunar science has no borders. We're all in this great adventure together. The award presented today is the Wargo Award and is named after Michael J. Wargo, who served as the chief scientist for the human exploration enterprise at NASA and was a co-founder of our institute. We owe him a lot. He passed away suddenly in 2013 and the IAU posthumously named a crater on the lunar far side in his honor. This year, the Wargo Award goes to Dr. Ian Crawford. Dr. Crawford is someone known widely in our community for a whole lot of reasons. Um, he uh, maybe promised to give a brief introduction, but I could probably go on for quite a while. For decades now, he's been instrumental in raising the profile of lunar science and human explora exploration in the UK, um, which as a lot of us know is not an easy task at all, but he's done remarkably at it. He has dozens of publications within the space policy literature, per, particularly those linking science and exploration with a human future in space. And just as importantly, he has supervised 12 doctoral students in these endeavors, assuring the future of his important com contributions. So uh, please welcome Dr. Crawford. I will try and use this because the green light means it's off. I can switch it off. Okay, great. Thank you. Thank you, Greg. It's a great, a great honor to be here. I have a slight case of imposter syndrome. Uh, <laughs> but it's great. Uh, I'm very, very greatly honoured, of course, by 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 this award. And I I I, I never knew Mike um, Wargo personally, but he was a very enthusiastic and ubiquitous presence in the lunar exploration uh, field. Well, just as I was entering it 20 years ago, and I think his uh, his influence has been profound. And he left us far too early. And so it's 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 great that Survey have established this um, award uh, in his 
in his honor and I'm of course greatly honored to to receive it so um, I, I've never done one of these acceptance speeches before but Greg gave me instructions and the instructions <laughs> the, 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 ins the, the, the instru <laughs> I just put my glasses on so I can the instructions were to try and uh, make it personal and not give a science talk so I, I'm going to make it slightly personal and I'm not going to give a science talk, um, but I do think science and exploration um, are, they're more than two sides of the same coin. They're really fully integrated. And I, I do have some slightly political point I'm going to make. If you, but anyway, let me, let me, um, let me give you my, um, let me give you my life history. Um, so uh, as, as many of many of my colleagues know, I, I started life as, a, as an observational astronomer and I came to planetary science uh, relatively late, but it was frighteningly already 20 years ago. Um, so when I was an observational astronomer, I studied um, the interstellar medium through high resolution optical spectroscopy using ground based telescopes and those are the interstellar clouds in which I've just suggested alien debris might be uh, might be accumulating but that's uh, anyway the picture top uh, top right here shows the 74 inch uh, telescope 1.9 meter telescope at uh, Mount Stromlo Observatory uh, outside Canberra and that's the telescope I had 130 nights on that telescope and that's a telescope that gave me the data for my PhD and then sadly in 2003, the very year that I moved uh, from interstellar medium to planetary science, uh, the telescope along with the rest of the observatory was, um, was destroyed in a bushfire. So make of, make of that what you will. But anyway, that's not why I transitioned from, I'd already made the decision obviously, but, 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 it, but obviously my bridges were burnt behind me literally in the, <laughs> there, was, there was no going back because the telescope had been burnt down. Um, but, but anyway, that's not the reason I moved to planetary science. The reason I moved to lunar science in particular, is, uh, was, as will become apparent in a minute, is that I think the moon is going to play an absolutely fundamental role in the continued human exploration of the, of the, of the universe. But you don't make a career change like that without a lot of um, help, a lot of help from a lot of colleagues and teachers and far too many people to acknowledge here. So I've just listed the most important people uh, and the most important people, my PhD students and my postdocs, because without these, uh, several of them are here. Uh, so, so, I mean, I, I, owe the, I owe these people a huge, a huge debt of gratitude because I, I really wouldn't uh, be here in planetary science without these collaborations. Um, a picture at bottom right, you may recognize uh, three of us. <laughs> uh, this is at the, the uh, uh, Lunar Receiving Laboratory in Houston, where we were in 2009 collecting some Apollo 12 soil samples for a project that we were, were doing. But um, you on the, on the left here, you see Joshua Snape, who's now doing a postdoc uh, in Manchester, and on the right, uh, Katie Joy, who's now a professor at Manchester. So I would say I am very, very proud of the for a large fraction of these former students who've not, not only stayed in science, but have, are now occupying important and influential positions in the, in the lunar and planetary science community. Um, so I was asked to say, so, so I, but beyond that, there are three, everyone has some source, sources of inspiration. And I would say, if I look back at my life, there are three main influences that got me into astronomy in the first instance and then into planetary science. So I was a seven in July 1969. So at that age, growing up with the Apollo program, it's don't, don't let anybody tell you that the Apollo program didn't inspire a lot of young people to be interested in science because it, it did. The very first time I stood up in front of an audience and gave a talk, I, I remember it well. I was in my primary school. I was nine or 10. Apollo phase 1971, Apollo 14 had just happened. Teacher knew of my interest in space and asked me to give a talk. And this shows several things. It shows that if you've got exciting things happening, then good teachers and good parents, I'll come to my parents in a minute, can leverage this to, to, for, for educational 
um, um, benefit. And anyway, but it, but obviously uh, the fact that I was obviously deeply inspired by the Apollo program. So everyone owes everything to 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 our parents, of course, by by definition. But here I, I just like to highlight, especially uh, the influence my father had on 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 my life. I think. I mean, my father was a dentist, but he had an interest in astronomy, uh, which sort of kept my interest going. But he was he was the person who woke me up in the middle of the night to watch Apollo 11 um, against the objections of my mother, of course, because it was far too late to get the young lad out of it. But anyway, so he did that. And so that's that was that was an important influence on me. And then at the bottom, we see the Starship Enterprise. Now, now of course, the original Star Trek series also dates from this era and is also very inspiring. Um, but I want to make a slight, I'm going to, maybe if I have time at the end, come to a slightly um, more political point. Beyond the excitement of exploring the universe in the Star Trek universe, um, there is a geopolitical societal backdrop. And this was Gene Roddenberry's, one of Gene Roddenberry's, Roddenberry's large, big part of his vision, was that we were going to explore the universe together. I mean, not only as a united Earth, but as a, as a, a, a united federation of intelligence in species, including non-human intelligences. This, this was a fantastic vision. And I think it's something we should be aspiring to try and develop. Um, I don't, only people of a certain age and possibly a certain nationality will. Does anyone recognize this moon base? <laughs> okay, so some people. So this is moon base alpha. Uh, from the 1970s, so I should have said the third thing that influenced me was obviously not just Star Trek specifically, but science fiction in general. Um, anyway, one of the science fiction shows that was being uh, broadcast in the 1970s was Space 1999. And that seemed a long way, 20 years in the future from the 70s, right? So from, from the vision was that this is what we, by the turn of the century, we would have a moon base and it would be like this. And we're still waiting for this moon base, but, but our, our responsibility is to uh, make it happen. It had, didn't happen by 1999, it hasn't happened by 2023, but there are very good scientific reasons for wanting to build a moon base, and so we should keep advocating for it. Um, now, to say something about exploration. So, the space agencies had a mantra, which I think fortunately has slightly gone away now. And the mantra was uh, science enables exploration and exploration enables science. Well, that's fine as far as it goes, but the truth is that it's still in, it still is predicated on a dichotomy. They're two different things and one supports the other. I think this is uh, the wrong way of looking at it. I think exploration is a part of science. And I think science, I take science to mean the systematic exploration of the natural world. Then within the natural world that we are exploring, exploring um, the solar system and, and, the, and, and the universe in general is clearly a part of science. And then having developing the tools, the spacecraft, the astronauts that go out and explore the universe, then this is what we call exploration, but it's a, it's a subset of science. And so it's not helpful, forgive me for the agency people here, I don't think it's helpful for the space agencies to institutionalize a separation, to have directorates of science and directors, di directors of, directorates of exploration. I, I personally think this is unhelpful because it institutionalizes a division that doesn't really exist and that we should be viewing exploration as a, a, a subset of science broadly considered. Um, the, the English, um, uh, Alan Chapman is an English historian of science, and he, he's made the point, thinking back to the voyages of exploration, the European voyages of exploration in the um, 16th, 17th centuries, that the, the ships that were going around the world, I mean, the, botan the reason the botanical gardens at Padua, just down the road, were established, so like, like the ones in Leiden and other university towns around Europe, was because these new 
totally new species were being found by these voyages of exploration. And, and so the universities needed, amongst other things, botanical gardens to study this, this fantastically new flora that was being discovered. Now Chapman's view was, of course, we wouldn't have these exotic plants from far away without the, 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 the ships, the sailing ships that, that explored the world and brought them back. So his view was that really these ships that went around the world during the um, voyages of exploration and therefore by definition their crews and the training of the crews and everything, these essentially are just extended scientific instruments that, that like, like the telescopes and the microscopes that were being developed at the same time. So I don't, I, I think we should be viewing exploration as an integral part of science. I have a quote here that I think gives the best definition of exploration though. Um, this came from um, someone called Craig McLean, who was from the national, US National Ocean Graphic um, and Atmospheric Administration. And he was here talking about um, oceanic exploration. But uh, this, this quote um, applies to all exploration in general, I think, including space exploration. And so we've got, um, uh, without exploration, we would continue on our familiar path with familiar subjects, um, enjoying, an occasion, enjoying an occasional surprise. Uh, but with, with exploration, it's our purpose to, uh, to discover these surprises. I mean, you would not have discovered new, new plants and new animals on the other side of the world by just carrying on normal science in the 17th century. You had to build the ships to get out there and explore, and then you find these things. Um, so um, just a, a couple more slides left. I'm, I'm not sure how much time I've got. because um, So um, anyway, I, I, we, obviously we are lunar scientists here and it is possible to get focused and we should be over. I mean, obviously our speciality is the moon. So there's a tendency for us to get over, perhaps overly focused on the moon. And we should because there's a moon has a lot to tell us about the history of the earth, the earth moon system, the universe. Um, but I think we, the reason that I moved to lunar science uh, when I did was because I knew that if we're interested in exploring the universe, we've got to start somewhere. And there is only one place to start. The place to start is the moon, because the moon is the closest planetary body to us, where we can develop, while, while we explore the moon itself, which is a very important astronomical and planetary geological object to explore in its own right, uh, we're also developing the, take, the capability to take us further, further afield. So there's a quote from the, the German-American uh, rocket engineer, some of you may be familiar with the quote, Kraft Enrique, um, who, who was a long advocate of solar system um, exploration. Uh, and, and he said that uh, if God had wanted man to become a spacefaring species, uh, he, would have give, he would have given us a moon. And so here we are, we have a moon, so we should be making use of it. And of course it will help us develop the capability to get to Mars, but it would equally be a mistake, I think, to view Mars exploration as an end in itself. The exploration doesn't have to end Mars, but we will need to develop a lot of stuff on the moon to get to Mars. The exploration doesn't have to end before we get to, or after we get to Alpha Centauri, which is, um, uh, oh, I don't know whether they, oh, does it? Oh, here we go. Uh, yes, you recognize the Southern Milky Way here. Uh, this is the Southern Cross, Alpha and Beta Centauri. So there's our, there on, there's our nearest star. We know that Proxima Centauri, which is one star in the Alpha Sen system, has a planet. It's only four light years away. Of course, four light. Oh, yeah, okay. Um, so, so, so four light years is a small distance in astronomical terms, but if you want to travel four, four uh, light years in a time scale that's at all commensurate with human civilization, then that forces you to build something that can travel at like 10% of the speed of light. That's an enormous technical undertaking. We can't do it yet, but I think we know, kind of know that if we did want to do it, it's such an enormous undertaking that it's going to probably be much easier for a civilization that has already has significant industrial capability developed in the solar system uh, to, to eventually take on that challenge. And if we want to build an industrial technical capability in the solar system, then we have to, the moon is the place to start, start doing that. I believe, um, yeah, this is my last slide. Um, so Jayton had already shared this beautiful picture. Obviously it shows the earth and moon from Artemis 1. Um, but I think 
we look at this picture, and maybe this is this is something that I got from uh, Star well, from from Gene Roddenberry via Star Trek. I think you look at this picture, and it carries the perspective. So I, I may sound very naive at this point, but 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 I get to get, I guess I joy of being able the privilege of being able to like, do these acceptance speeches to say what you think. I think the, this pers almost fell down the stairs. That I think the perspective that you you look at you look at this and what do we see? Well, we see the Earth, and the Earth is already looking small. From this perspective, it even looks smaller than the Earth. And so the whole, not only the whole of human history, the whole of evolutionary history, the last four billion years that's led to us, plus the whole of human history, it's all been played out on this relatively small planet. And we're about to go and explore the wider universe. So there is something wrong. There is a disconnect between thinking we should be going out into the wider universe uh, and exploring it um, as kind of separate nationalistic, tribalistic identities. It just doesn't make, I know this is what we're doing. I'm aware, of course, I'm not totally naive. I'm aware of the history. I know why the earth is split into these different national tribalistic units. We could all, but there's still something doesn't mesh. The, the political and uh, other tribalistic divisions on this small planet are not really commensurate with the scale of the activity that we're about to embark on. And this is where I think Roddenberry's vision of trying to unite humanity in the exploration of the universe was very much uh, on the right lines. And I think it's what we should, um, I, think it, I think we should, I think it is a, so scientists are often not very comfortable making political points. And this is a political point. Uh, but I think it's, um, I think it's a political point that needs to be made. I'll finish there. Thank you. Uh, Wow. So, so Ian, taking your last point, I think ELS maybe is a step towards the United Federation of Planets, <laughs> right? Because we're all working together. That, that was a wonderful, wonderful speech. And congratulations uh, on a very well-deserved award. Um, I'm happy to now in introduce the final speaker of this European Lunar Symposium, Dr. Jake Bleacher. Jake serves as the chief scientist for NASA's human exploration enterprise within the Exploration Systems Development Mission Directorate. He serves as primary contact with NASA's Science Mission Directorate, as well as the broad science community, an extremely critical role, as we all know. Dr. Bleacher has a doctorate in geological sciences from Arizona State University and studied under the famous Ron Greeley. His research focused on the volcanic history of the Earth, Moon, and Mars, combining field work with remote sensing in a way that astronauts will do again soon. He was a co-founder of the Next Generation Lunar Scientists and, and Explorers. Has, his attention has always been on, on developing the next generation. And he was, um, he was previously funded in part by uh, Servi. So uh, we at Servi are very lucky to have him in his position and all of us indeed at NASA are. So, and his talk is going is entitled Science at the Moon with Artemis. So Jake, please go ahead. Hey, thanks Greg. Um, and thanks everybody for uh, the opportunity to, to talk here today. And uh, I just wanted to extend my congrats uh, to uh, Ian as well. Um, very, uh, very great talk there. Um, and I hope to follow that up with some uh, some maybe nudging ourselves in a direction uh, aligned with, with what you were bringing up um, about collaboration. So um, I also wanted to note uh, just to, anytime I see a picture of Mike Wargo, I've, I've got a comment on just what a tremendous um, community member he was. Uh, he certainly uh, helped uh, me and, and many of my peers out early in our careers uh, moving along. And, 
And in fact, uh, I do like to point out that just over my shoulder up here is a, is a little crater. I like this picture. I've got Wargo Crater right here uh, on my wall. Uh, I do do a good bit of, uh, of work for our Office of Communications. Um, and so I had to put some pictures on the background. Um, and so I like to think that Mike's always sitting on my shoulder as I, as I go through this. Um, the position I have, Chief Exploration Scientist, uh, he, was, he was the first Chief Exploration Scientist that we had at NASA. So um, always great to see that. And, and congratulations again, Ian, on, uh, on your award. Um, so I'm here today uh, talking a little bit about Artemis and how we hope to achieve uh, science um, and, and doing that in a collaborative manner, um, working uh, in a multi, multinational, multi-agency way. Uh, so I'm going to talk a little bit about how we are structuring ourselves inside NASA uh, to meet, meet the mission we have, uh, but also how we're structuring ourselves in a way to collaborate. Uh, broadly in in, uh, in a multinational, in a worldwide sense, because uh, I, I agree with Ian's uh, comments about uh, uh, going forward, right? This is a humankind effort that we're doing now. This is not a, a single country or a single agency or a single institution. Uh, so that was a, a great, great presentation, Ian, and, and I loved hearing those words. Uh, next slide, please. Um, so with that said, we do have funding that is somewhat divided um, nationally, uh, multinationally. Um, and so I, I, I do want to start out by saying how we are motivated and driven inside NASA. Um, so this is just a series of the documents um, that help set the framework for what we, NASA, are challenged to go accomplish uh, by the United States government. Um, and if you look, here's a series of documents. I'm, I'm sure every agency and, and every government has similar documentation. Um, but what we in NASA have been challenged to do is, uh, is lead deep space exploration. Um, and, and in those priorities, uh, we just have a quote, one of the quotes here that we're challenged to do, um, you know, leading human and robotic space exploration uh, to land the first woman and person of color on the moon, advance a robust cislunar ecosystem, continue to leverage human presence in low Earth orbit, uh, to enable people to live and work safely in space. Um, and in general, prepare for future missions to Mars and beyond. Uh, our um, Pam Melroy, um, who, who uh, helps lead our agency, has uh, frequently been saying, you know, we're, we're working on building a blueprint, how to develop a blueprint for space exploration. And I really like that. It's, uh, it's not so much anchored in a single destination. It's learning how to live and operate in space so that we can go do all the amazing things that not only NASA wants to do, but work collaboratively to meet everyone's objectives. Um, next slide, please. So with this challenge that we've been given at NASA, uh, we've been sort of reorganizing ourselves and starting to rethink how do you develop uh, an architecture to meet this kind of a challenge. Um, and so we're, we're kind of starting with the why are we going? And so from our government's perspective, from the United States perspective, we've broken that down into basically three pillars of why we're exploring. We refer to those as our science, our inspiration and our national posture. And so each one of these has um, some unique attributes, uh, but there's a good bit of overlap. Um, and, and a large part of that overlap uh, comes together in working in partnership, um, not only within our country, but multinational collaboration in order to go do these things. So these are the why reasons we're going. And, and as Ian was pointing out, you know, science and exploration um, you know, science is a big piece of this, going to understand, uh, you know, the history of us, basically. Uh, I've, I've, we have had a series of meetings over the last two weeks to discuss what I'm about to present to you, um, how we're developing our Moon to Mars architecture. Um, and uh, one of the things I'd like to say, I, I love the last uh, photograph that Ian showed, uh, looking back from Orion at the Earth and the Moon. I like to, to point out that there's a reason that no matter how far away we go with our spacecraft, we typically always still take a picture of the Earth. Whether you're looking back at the Earth through the rings of Saturn from Cassini, uh, or if you're on the uh, solar tips of the Orion, 
you know, and, and when Apollo first gazed back at the earth rising above the moon in Apollo 8, because when we leave the earth, we're actually leaving to learn about ourselves. Uh, there, you can subdivide science into many disciplines and very specific focused objectives and goals, but ultimately we're trying to understand ourselves and our place in this universe, in this galaxy, in this solar system. Uh, and, and those questions can't be answered by staying here on Earth. Uh, the very processes that enable life to exist here are the same processes that have altered some of that evidence um, or maybe even erased it entirely. Plate tectonics and atmosphere. You, you also can't only go to Mars to answer those questions. Some of those similar processes exist there. And so I like to talk about the fact that we're really talking about an Earth, Moon, Mars system that we're trying to explore, which may point to other destinations as well. So it brings me back to this point about we're really developing a blueprint for how to live in space, to work collaboratively, to go answer some of these big questions and learn about the history of, of humankind. Next slide, please. So to meet these objectives, to meet the goals that we're setting forward, we're, we're kind of starting to rethink the way we build our architectures. Um, in the past, um, at least within NASA, we, we've done what we're kind of calling now architecting from the left. And if you think about looking at a slide, you set things up on the left side of the slide and you start moving to the right. And often we would build something and then try to decide how we needed to use it to go meet objectives. Well, now we're trying to start with why. The why, why are we exploring? So again, from our government's perspective, we've broken that down into science, inspiration, and, and national posture. Um, but every government probably has their own desires, their own explanations of what the why are. And so we're in a process now of starting to, to, uh, to collaborate, to work together to understand the broader spectrum of why. But this is the starting point that we carry for NASA. But as you start to answer some of the other traditional big questions, who, what, when, where, how. They're all a part of the story of pulling together an architecture, developing an architecture to go meet those objectives. <clears throat> now, depending on where you start with these questions, you could develop a different architecture. Uh, for instance, Apollo, that started with a question about when. They were told very specifically when they were going to go and they had to develop an architecture that met the when and then filled in the other answers. So we're trying to be a little more broad now and start to look at these questions together and really start from why. So what kind of capabilities do we need in order to answer these why questions? Where should we put our systems that we develop? How will we get there and how will we return? Uh, when will we do this? Um, who does this approach include? And this gets to the point I was making about the collaborative nature of what we're, we're trying to do here. NASA knows that we can't do this alone um, because when we do this alone, it, it kind of has an end date. We've saw, we saw that from Apollo. We've seen that from other programs. What we are trying to envision is something that carries forward um, in, in hopes of reaching um, some form of sustainability in whatever way sustainable is defined by our partners as well as ourselves. Next slide, please. So over the last year, almost two years, really, when we started getting into this, um, we went through a process of trying to define our key stakeholder objectives. And this is part of why now we are now referring to this as starting to architect from the right. So I talked about architecting from the left, well, now what we're trying to do is say, what are the things we want to accomplish? How can we break those down into understanding what is needed to meet those goals and objectives? And from that, we can start to build an architecture that's informed by traceability to the objectives. So within NASA, we identified four broad sets of objectives. Uh, those are science objectives, transportation and habitation, lunar and Mars infrastructure, as well as operations. Um, and those operations could include in space or on the surface of, of, of a destination. We developed these uh, initially internally. We opened up the conversation within NASA and then began that conversation with other agencies within our own government, uh, with our industry and our academic partners. 
and then we engage internationally as well. So last year in 2022, we held a series of meetings uh, in London, um, as well as in Houston, uh, Texas, here in the States, uh, to engage broadly and ask about these objectives. So the objective set that we have includes input basically globally, um, depending on, on who uh, participated when we opened those, uh, those activities up. Over the last year, we've been taking those objectives and trying to break them down into what we call characteristics and functions. In, in essence, if I want to accomplish a certain objective, what are the things I actually need to have in order to meet those objectives? Those functions and capabilities are how we then build an architecture, how we make decisions about what elements we need to build. Um, and it could be there are many more elements than we actually have an ability and a budget to develop ourselves. And that's what's critical about developing this architecture in this way. We can identify what's needed and then together we can start working on how we address those. So we've developed a process we call the Architecture Concept Review or ACR. This is a yearly review process for NASA that will include community interaction. In fact, just last week, we were again in London interacting. We had over, we had 17 space agencies or nations present at the meeting, representing, um, again, their agency and or country and their perspective about how this review process works. And then this week, we held a similar workshop here in Washington, D.C., interacting with our industry partners and academic partners within the United States. Next slide, please. So the architecture concept review is, is a phrase that I'm, I'm hoping everyone will start to, to become familiar with. Uh, this ACR, if you will, the, the acronym, um, is driven to produce public documents so that the decision-making process and the outcomes are known to the community. Uh, we've been criticized in the past, NASA has been criticized in the past for kind of working behind closed doors, and we're trying to get away from that. Um, there are certainly some things that we are, will do internally, but at the same time, as much as we can document this in a public manner to drive discussion in that yearly cycle so that when we have our next workshops next summer, uh, that information will be public and we can have discussions that are informed on the, on the products that come out of the review we're currently in. The document that we're generating and putting out in public is called the Architecture Definition Document here at the very top of this slide, or referred to as the ADD. So this is the document that will detail uh, basically a snapshot of our architecture planning on a yearly cadence. So our review cycle, that architecture concept review, gives us a chance to study uh, the input that we receive from the workshops, um, as well as set up a series of tasks to, uh, to explore the trades to help us go and meet the objectives that we have outlined. Uh, the Moon to Mars Architecture Summary is sort of a shorter version of that, so you can start there and get just the general uh, perspective of what we're talking about, or you can dig into much more detail uh, with the ADD itself, which right now is about 150 pages. Uh, off to the right here, we also started developing a series of white papers, again, also public documents. Uh, we released these uh, about a month ago, our first set. The white papers are meant to be short four to six pages each. Um, and the purpose that they serve is to address a specific topic area. Uh, so for instance, we've been finding that when we go out in public to speak, we're often asked the same questions at, at, at every venue that we go to. Um, so the white papers are designed to provide feedback to the community uh, that we're engaging with as to what it is we're actually doing. So for instance, I helped author with, uh, with my colleague Noah Petro a uh, white paper that uh, explains why we're going to the South Polar region with Artemis. Uh, but we have additional papers. Another favorite is uh, why the near rectilinear halo orbit for our gateway. Uh, that's a, a topic we get asked about frequently. Now we have a public document that uh, tries to clearly explain that. And so we talk about all of these documents uh, in, the two, in the workshops that we held last week in London and then this week in DC as part of that annual review cycle at ACR. Next slide, please. 
So I want to put this in here. There's a QR code that takes you to the location where all of this documentation is currently held. Uh, the workshops that, uh, that we just ran gave us a lot of feedback. Um, we have a number of additional white papers now in consideration. Uh, we were specifically asking for feedback from the community about the architecture definition document. Um, so I would encourage you all to take a look uh, at that documentation. Uh, the QR code will get you to the website. You can also go to the web link that we have down there. Um, if you just type that in, nasa.gov backslash moon to Mars architecture. Um, but this is the starting point for, um, for basically understanding where we are in our architecture planning. Um, oftentimes when we don't communicate enough, it, it can be easy to think that we're much farther along than we are or that we've made decisions that don't make very much sense. And so we're trying to get all of that information out in the public uh, so that you can you know, learn about it. Doesn't mean we'll always agree on all of it, uh, but we're trying to be as public facing as we can about this. The key here to our workshops that we're running is that we understand from our partners what their goals and objectives are as well. So I've talked a little bit about what NASA is trying to accomplish, but we know that that's not the complete set of what humankind wants to do as we learn how to live and explore in space. Uh, so we need to understand that. The whole concept review, the ACR, is focused on looking at the broad set of stakeholder objectives that we have amongst our partners and trying to make informed decisions about what the next step should be that helps advance us on a front that, that contributes to as many stakeholder objectives as we can. And so that's kind of where we are in this process right now. Next slide, please. So go back to the original slide, my first slide, talking about the three pillars of the why we go. And now I want to focus a little more on the science. So I wanted to give that update that's almost hot off the presses as we uh, have just come out of those workshops, the international and our industry workshops. Um, so science is one of those three major pillars. And so I do want to talk a little bit about how the science traces into this. So from our science mission directorate here in NASA, one of the things that we're trying to do is be very clear about traceability of, of the documentation. And so our science colleagues have brought forward, um, you know, the documents that kind of drive our science mission directorate. Uh, and they largely are driven by um, research priorities from the decadal survey. So the national academies uh, conduct a decadal survey for each science division that we have. And so that basically helps set the priorities for what NASA should be trying to accomplish over the next decade. And they go through a review cycle halfway through. So it's really about every five years, they kind of get a fresh update to that. These are the guiding documents that, that we look to and trace to. Um, there are also within planetary science, if we are starting to focus more on the moon, um, a series of community documents that basically feed into these decadal surveys, but they also stand alone on their own. So we have those listed at the bottom there as well, just as, as reference. The document on the bottom right, the Artemis III Science Definition Team Report, uh, was one of the first documents that really tried to um, begin with some of the assumptions that we had for Artemis at the time. So that's almost three years old now, so it's, it's not brand new. Uh, but starting to think about how do we go about exploring in the South Polar region with uh, some of the assumptions that Artemis has. Next slide, please. Now, in addition to um, the, the science that we showed on the prior slide, we also have uh, research on, uh, on basically how humans survive in space. So um, we kind of boil that down into what we call in NASA, we call the, the five hazards of human spaceflight. Doesn't mean there are, aren't more than five hazards, there certainly are. But these are the big ones that we focus a lot of our attention on uh, to, to basically, again, help realize how to develop a blueprint that would enable humankind to spend more time in space. So we largely bend those into space radiation, uh, working in isolation and confinement, operating at ever increasing distances from the earth, um, dealing with gravity or lack thereof. And, and really what we're talking about there is gravity changes. Um, if we want to go to Mars, for instance, that's a long trip uh, in, a, in, in an environment that does not have gravity for the astronauts. So when they arrive at Mars, we have a lot of questions about how quickly can they begin to do work in a dependable way. 
So do we need to develop an architecture that has them landing on the surface and pushing buttons and pulling levers right away? Or do they really need a few days in order to be um, at a state where they can, can confidently do that work? These are the types of things that we have to learn. We are learning it in low Earth orbit. We'll learn about it as we go to the moon and spend more and more time there. And at some point, we'll have the confidence that, that we can take that longer trip to a destination like Mars. Uh, also, just operating in hostile closed environments. So that gets a little bit more kind of like microbial aspects and, and making sure how do we keep an environment like that safe and healthy for our astronauts uh, when it's this closed environment for such a long period of time. Next slide, please. Um, so you probably, if you're in a uh, lunar symposium, noticed that last uh, year we were able to successfully fly our Artemis One mission. Uh, the mission went very well, uh, tested our space launch system rocket, as well as our Orion crew capsule. Um, that flight gave us a tremendous amount of data that is propelling us forward. Um, and, I, you know, I like to really say that, you know, before this, we were talking about, you know, the Artemis generation. You know, the, the, the young people today will be the Artemis generation. Well, we are all now the Artemis generation. Artemis One is behind us. It was successful, and it's put us in a position to prepare to fly all the Artemis missions that will follow. Next slide, please. So right now, uh, we're actually looking at some of the data that came back from that. So even though there were no crew, uh, we did have a tremendous amount of, uh, of science that was conducted. Uh, we had a whole set of uh, CubeSats that rode along with the SLS, and they have uh, been going through uh, various uh, am amounts of data. Uh, not all of them were 100% successful, but that was sort of expected going into the missions. But they all have been learning about how do we take advantage of opportunities, for instance, being able to carry secondary payloads like this on any launch that we have uh, within Artemis. Uh, so together, we have learned a great amount about how do we take advantage of those opportunities from launches. Additionally, we had payloads inside the Orion. Uh, those are on the left side of this slide. Um, and, and across this board, I do want to point out the, the little stars note places where we have international participation. So the science right from the first Artemis mission has had a good bit of international integration built into it. I do, on the left side, one of the things I really like is that we were learning about that deep space environment where astronauts are going to be flying. Uh, we, we collected a tremendous amount of data about the radiation environment. Um, we have collected information about potentially how to shield ourselves from that, uh, what kind of forces the astronauts are going to feel coming back to the Earth uh, with uh, Munikin Campos, uh, the commander of the spacecraft. So. Uh, there was a lot of work that went into Artemis 1, uh, even though it was really focused on that first flight of the SLS and Orion in an integrated manner. We did gather a lot of data to help uh, help us move forward. Next slide, please. Uh, again, so Artemis 1, uh, wonderful to have that kind of in the rear view mirror. We're still working through that data, uh, but we're also full speed ahead on planning for Artemis 2. So Artemis 2, in some ways, will be somewhat repetitive of the flight of Artemis 1, but now we will have our astronauts on board. Uh, earlier this year, we named uh, the four astronauts who will participate, including an international astronaut uh, from, from Canada. Uh, so again, trying to, uh, to find ways to, uh, to take this kind of slow approach, Artemis 1, Artemis 2, gaining the confidence um, that, that uh, we've got a system that can carry our astronauts and now we'll go fly with them on Artemis 2. That will put us in a position to uh, land on the surface of the moon with Artemis 3. Next slide, please. So Artemis 3 uh, will be a human landing in the south polar region of the moon. Uh, so again, learning what we've learned from test flights of the Orion, uh, launches with the SLS. Uh, we will now be in a position to use our human landing system uh, for this mission provided by SpaceX, their Starship spacecraft. We'll, uh, we'll uh, dock with the Orion, which carries our astronauts from Earth out to a lunar orbit. And from there, they'll then move down to the surface of the moon, again, in the south polar region. Next slide, please. Now, one thing I do want to touch on briefly is um, the environment of the moon that we're dealing with. So um, one thing I've talked a good bit about lately is the lighting. 
uh, the lighting that we'll deal with. So oftentimes when I talk with folks, I, I know if in their brain, there's a picture of an Apollo, of an Apollo event. Um, Apollo took full advantage of the information that we knew about the moon. In the equatorial region, really between 85 and 85, uh, north and south latitude, uh, almost every location experiences a 50-50 ratio of light and dark. Uh, and that, that ratio is split up in a cycle where 14 Earth days of light are followed by 14 Earth days of darkness. And that's one lunar day, roughly about one Earth month. Uh, we understood that. Apollo took full advantage of it, landed in the early lunar morning, and then we knew that we had, you know, anywhere between seven, eight days to 10 days of continuous light within which we could operate. So those missions took full advantage, again, of that knowledge that we had. One thing I do like to point out, we talk a lot about, um, or NASA talks a lot about, we're going to do science. We're, we're going out there and exploring to do science. I think it's also very important to note that um, the science we already know, what we've learned from our scientific exploration of the moon, that knowledge is really, I like to refer to it as the backbone around which we wrap our architecture. That knowledge helps us to determine how to build a system. What are the environmental conditions that we have to prepare for? This is a great example. Apollo had knowledge of the moon and took full advantage of it. Next slide, please. So this is just an example on the surface. And again, when I say having an Apollo picture in your mind, it might be something like this. Uh, two things I wanna point out here are that in this picture, you're in complete sunlight. Um, if you drove 50 kilometers away from here, you would still be in complete sunlight, exactly like this. Also uh, note the antenna is just pointing straight up almost uh, because the earth is there. If you're on the earth facing side of the moon near the equator, the earth is above your head. Uh, and it's pretty much visible all the time. Uh, but it's not like that in the polar region. And I hear people say often that landing in the poles is hard, um, it's more difficult. And I, I like to challenge that. I think difficult might not be the right word, it might be different. I like to say that it will be different landing in the polar region and operating in the polar region. The environmental conditions are no less predictable we can predict them, but they are different than what we are familiar with from the equatorial region. Next slide, please. So this is a video just showing, and many of you probably have seen it or use it, maybe even helped put it together for us, uh, but it really does drive home. If you think about the video I showed of the Apollo landing sites in contrast to this, uh, what you're seeing here are more like sweeping shadows and sweeping patches of light. Uh, the ratio that you experience between light and dark over an entire year is not necessarily uh, a ratio of a 50-50 split. Uh, it could be 80 to 90% sunlight in a year, ranging entire to entire darkness for a whole year, permanent shadow. And what makes it a little uh, more difficult to deal with, again, maybe not difficult, but just different, is that that ratio can change. It can change across the surface. So if you drive five kilometers, the ratio of sunlight to darkness is going to change. Um, and it, again, it could range from significant amount of light throughout a year to complete darkness. Um, and so this is what we have to understand. But again, this is why we sent a spacecraft like the Lunar Reconnaissance Orbiter to begin mapping this for us uh, back in 2009. It's put us in a position to be able to challenge ourselves in this way. But you can take advantage of this as well, just like Apollo took advantage of the conditions. The sunlight is something that you can take advantage of. Next slide, please. If you know where places are that experience greater than average amounts of sunlight, then you don't have to go through some of the thermal changes or at least as frequently through the thermal changes. You might not need batteries the same size. And this is why I challenge the, the term difficult or hard to me, if we want a sustainable presence, the equatorial regions are actually quite difficult because you must survive 14 Earth days of continuous darkness multiple times a year. Whereas in a location like this, if you pick the right spot, you might tolerate, have to tolerate shorter stretches of darkness and only once or twice throughout a full calendar year. So this is just an example of some of the locations. The South Pole is actually in this image. 
along the Shackleton Rim, kind of that arc of, of light on the right side, uh, a region we refer to as the Ridge or Connecting Ridge, it goes by a number of different names in the community, is off there to the left. Um, and so you can see the contrast in the amount of light that you might experience at this given moment, uh, but that changes throughout the year. Now inside Shackleton Crater is the location of permanent darkness, areas that never see sunlight. Now those are areas where the environmental conditions would potentially preserve volatiles had volatiles ever entered into that area. We do have data suggesting that volatiles are present in the polar regions in some of these locations. And so that's some of the information we need to understand is what is the state of those volatiles? Can we get to those? Can we, what do we need to do to clean them up into a, uh, into a way that we can use them or to extract the science knowledge we would like from them? Uh, so I think this goes back to the point Ian made and, and just before I started about, you know, exploration and science, you know, they, they really are a part of the same effort. Uh, we would like to understand the science of the volatiles inside those, those dark regions. But first, we, we sort of have to understand how to even get to them. What are the right pieces of hardware we need to get to those volatiles to extract that information? Next slide, please. And so I'm going to end with this slide here. This is another LRO oblique view of, a, of the Malapert Mountain region of the moon. And again, I just really like to show as many pieces of, of uh, data as I can to highlight the, the contrasting light and dark in the polar region. And I just will say one last time in hopes everybody will also help repeat this, that it's not that it's necessarily more difficult. It's just different. And this is the environment that we will be operating within in order to take advantage of the light for thermal properties and the lack of light for the types of science that it might preserve us for us to access. So with that, Greg, I, I'm done. Um, I'm happy to answer any questions. Um, and if you maybe could just help me get those questions so I can hear them properly through the computer, that would be helpful. You bet. Thank you, Jake. Okay, I, I know it's uh, late here, but let's take uh, time uh, since Jake has it for a few questions. And uh, is there someone who could uh, run the run the mic? Yeah. Okay. Great. Thank you. Yeah. So, do we have uh, any questions? Yes. <laughs> Thank you. If you could please uh, um, identify yourself, if, if you wouldn't mind. Hi, Jake. This is Karen Vanderbogert from the University of Münster. Um, th this is just a, a, a question that kind of, of takes off from some of the previous presentations that we had in terms of the prospect landing site selection. I wondered if maybe you're the right person to ask why that clips delivery is being excluded from other Artemis landing sites, or is that situation going to change when, when you down select that prospect could actually go to one of those Artemis landing sites? Yeah, so thanks for the question. Uh, it's good to hear from you. I, I can't see you, but I'll, I'll wave anyway. Maybe you can see me waving to you. Um, unfortunately, I'm not the right person to answer that question for you. Um, and, uh, you know, Ian noted about not having uh, having directorates that deal with different things, but unfortunately we do, and uh, and that's mostly the, the clips is in our science mission directorate. Um, so we have uh, worked with them to let them know the regions that we have under consideration, uh, but but I do not uh, have an answer to how that uh, that determination might evolve as we move forward with Artemis, um, but. I know that that question is uh, is one that that we are thinking about and that is being thought about um, within CLIP. So, th the one thing I do often say to to everybody when I'm out here um, talking in public is I, I often plead for patience. You know, we've never done this before, and we're trying to learn how to uh, collaboratively conduct robotic exploration uh, with with, with uh, landers like CLIPS that are, that are commercial lunar payload services that are being handled by industry partners at the same time as we're trying to figure out where to land human beings while we also have, you know, maybe vehicles like the Viper uh, rover that's 
down there trying to study volatile. So um, I, the one thing I would just say is, you know, the way we do things at the very moment is likely to evolve. And just, I, I, I know that's not the greatest answer in the world. I, I never tell everybody that I'm going to give you great answers, but I'll, try, I'll show up and I'll tell you what I can and what I know. Um, so just please be patient with us as we work through how to do this, right? We want to be very cautious at the beginning and then learn how to adapt and evolve so that we can try to meet the objectives broadly across the community. Well, maybe then just one that that's maybe a little easier or you can give us a better ballpark for is um, what's the timeline that you're looking at at uh, down selecting from those existing many landing site opportunities for Artemis? Yeah, so um, to just to so everybody's on the same page last fall, we identified 13 regions. Now, 13 regions include many potential specific sites where we could land a lander. Um, and we did that uh, while before we had um, fully brought on board SpaceX, uh, who won the contract for that lander. So now we've been working with SpaceX, um, you know, trying to understand the actual capabilities of the vehicle. Um, so we're in the midst of that process, working with them, uh, understanding how their uh, expected vehicle performance so that we can begin to narrow that down. Uh, we, we are working through that. You know, I, I can't promise you exactly when that's going to be, but we are, we are making progress. Um, and I would hope that we'll be to the point of being able to discuss that, you know, sometime later this year in the next several months to later this year. Great. Thanks. Um, Jake, we have a question from uh, the online chat uh, from Jayton Mehta. Hi, this is Jayton from Moon Monday. How do you imagine countries who have signed the Artemis Accords could band together in various ways to do lunar, oh, it just went, uh, it just lost it, <laughs> to do lunar and ex science and exploration outreach, I believe was the, uh, was the question. Okay, uh, yeah, that's a really good question. Um, and and in part, the, the, the reason we're putting the accords together is to try to make sure that we're not just focusing on big space agencies that, uh, that can, you know, it's great that we can partner with other big space agencies and, and look at building big elements and really the big pieces of that architecture. But again, that we want to include and be as inclusive as we can. So what I love about the Accords is that those are countries and many of them don't have uh, extensive um, even experience, but even budgets today that would enable um, that kind of a contribution. Nonetheless, uh, they, they still are telling us what they hope to achieve, what their goals are, what their motives are uh, for being interested in lunar exploration. And I, I think that as they begin to sit at the table and have the conversations with us, what we see is that they're starting to work within their own countries to think about well, here's how we need to, to train and, and educate folks so that we can participate. Here's how we need to connect with our communities so that they understand where we're going. So just in being a part of the conversation, I, I, this is my opinion, but I believe I see that they are now starting to, to have more engagement inside their own countries and in, in their own areas of influence about what they're seeing, what they're learning. So for instance, we were just... Um, over in London, we had a number of countries there uh, that were that were talking with us, and and a few folks came up to me, and just said, you know, when we presented the white papers, they said, I I have been asked that question so many times, and I never had an answer to give. So at the very least, they are now able to take that knowledge back and share it with their communities, who they are telling us are asking them the same questions. So you know slow starts and, and baby steps to get going. But, you know, these are, again, a, a pleading patience always, you know, these are the steps we have to take to make sure that we have a good solid base that we can continue to build from. Fabulous, thanks. Uh, next question is for yeah. uh, Bernard. I'm Bernard Frank, so I'm from your Moon Mars, but also Moon Village Association. I, and on this point, um, now that we are all part of Artemis generation, even if we didn't sign the Artemis Agreement, I think that uh, we should all work for it. And I would like to advertise that two years ago, we proposed, we proposed to the United Nations to celebrate International Moon Day on 20th of July. And so all countries are going to celebrate it. So it could be also an opportunity to, to expand uh, as Artemis generation, also to unleash, uh, so there will be funding 
for each country because they signed the, at the UN, but we could also think of specific activities that our community could organize to support this uh, International Moon Day. So do, do you see anything special we could do as a, at NASA or as a, a survey to support International Moon Day? Yeah, well, uh, Greg can answer too uh, on behalf of Survey, but uh, you know, I, I, I think that effort and many others that I've seen are great examples of how just starting the conversation leads to great ideas like this. Um, and I think I think those are great ideas. We, and and NASA helped start something we called International Observe the Moon Night, where we just try to to have everybody take a break and just look at the moon, right? Because sometimes in Today's culture, you almost forget about it up there if you're not people like us who like stop traffic because we're staring at the moon. But um, I, yeah, I think what you're talking about is a great idea. And the more we help initiate those conversations and the collaboration, the more we're seeing that that kind of uh, uh, opportunities, ideas uh, being created. So I'm really glad that you brought that up. And um, you know, I. I I can't speak on behalf of NASA and how we how we participate, but I can say that I know as a lunar uh, scientist, as someone who's interested in the moon, I'm really grateful that that, that event has been created. Yeah, I, I would uh, agree, Bernard. And, and yes, let's talk about participating in that. And I, I do want to note that our institute was the one that put international and, and international observed the moon night. And I believe that the original event was Brian Day's um, idea, who's sitting right uh, here. And, and, so, and so bottom line, yes, um, we, I've, I said it before at the introduction, we consider our international partners part of, you know, our most valuable assets. We want to do this um, together. And so let's, let's talk about it. So, um, and I want to say um, now Mahesh has told me that we need to be out of the building in um, uh, just over 20 minutes. So Jake, I want to say thank mm -hmm. you very much again. A fabulous talk and really appreciate you taking the time to join us. Thank you. Thank you, everybody. Thanks so much. And I'm going to turn it over to Mahesh for closing remarks. The roving mic is still making its way back. I don't like talking while sitting. Right, I know everybody is uh, trying to get a drink and, and it just shows how much you love ELS and, and I can't thank you for that. Uh, it is wonderful and I, um, I promise that you will be um, out of here in a wee bit and I think that might give you a clue as to what might be happening next, those of you who just recognize what I said. Um, so there are a few things that we need to do um, before we uh, go and get our deserved um, favorite drink or food uh, or something else uh, is we can't um, go without thanking people. But before I do that, I also have to announce the, um, the winners of the best talk and best posters. So if I could invite my co-chair, Matteo, to, to hand out uh, um, the two awards and I will call the name and if you are present. I hope you are present, those who are going to win, and please come and collect your award. So I think the best um, oral uh, talk presentation uh, goes to Sarah Bozeman. Is Sarah here? Aye. Let's give her a round of applause. And uh, we have the best uh, poster presenter presentation award here, and that goes to Robert Wagner. Hey. The prize is there. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. It's not just the certificate. Yeah. There are some goodies in the bag. Yeah, yeah. Okay. Uh, within it, if there is okay. Uh, 
Um, so within the bag, there is a um, T-shirt with the Galileo moons. So uh, if the size is not good, you can go back to the to the main central room of uh, of the university and just change the the size. Okay, because it's quite difficult to foresee the size of what's positive. <laughs> so and uh, okay, and then there is a thermo with Galileo again. And, uh, okay. Okay. And corner of Piscopia, which is the first girl that took the master degree. Would you like to take the opportunity to thank the local? Ah, okay, uh, so I would I would thank all all the people that helped me. So I uh, for sure I, uh, thanks uh, NASA Servi. I, I thanks uh, Jesus uh, and all the people that work with Jesus and enough. And all the people that uh, have uh, helped me in organizing everything, they are, uh, I'll say there is, as many of you know, there is a lot of uh, in, invisible uh, invisible work. And uh, for sure, the, the SOC chair, so uh, Anna and, and Ricardo and uh, the doc chair or co-chair, Gloria, that work, worked with me and many, many other that you have seen uh, and uh, they are so invisible that they were not in the, in the main picture because they were working. So I want to thank all of them. And even for all of them, there is uh, just a present for you. And okay. And still. Matteo is so modest that uh, he would never say it, but it took them four plus years to put this together. So by staying this long, you're really showing, you know, your gratitude that, you know, it has been a tremendous effort. And Matteo is right that there are hidden figures and we all know what hidden figures mean. These type of meetings, nothing would be possible without the teamwork. Yeah. And I can't thank Matteo enough because he has so much patience that, uh, you know, I've not seen in anybody else. And, and we work together to put this out for you. You know, it has been long days. We start at eight o'clock. So you start from your hotel at seven o'clock and we don't finish until eight o'clock. And then we party until one o'clock at night. You know, that, that's wonderful. Um, we should also uh, uh, say uh, thanks to Matthias uh, Maurer for uh, you know, joining the meeting in addition to giving the fantastic talk yesterday. I don't think we are ever going to um, repeat what we did yesterday in such a wonderful uh, room, the occasion um, and, and that, so thank you, Matteo, for making that happen. Uh, and, and of course, um, I, I, I call Rick uh, my master Yoda. I mean, the, this, this meeting, all the IT support, you know, the seamlessly it has worked, I think, you know, there was um, uh, hardly any hitch. And, and Rick has managed uh, along with Marco uh, you know, so beautifully. So thank you, Rick, and thank you, your team. And of course, there were hidden figures on service side too. There is Maria, there is Ashcon, they are all in, in California and they have been maintaining the website. And the moment Gloria and Rick wanted an update, within a few minutes, sometimes the updates were actually posted on the website, just because, and it's good, that actually the time difference is so long because there are some people who work in different, I wouldn't <laughs> expand on that, but that's, that's all wonderful. And this really uh, makes me so happy because uh, this is exactly why we set this meeting. And I hope that uh, you all agree that this has a special place for all of us. It's meeting that has no parallel. Uh, it's not perfect but it serves a beautiful purpose and may this uh, continue. And it's so wonderful to see so many new faces that I don't know who you are. So I am really looking forward to, you know, seeing you progress and, and go from success to success in the coming years. And the final thing I would like your attention for is just a little bit longer for five more minutes or 10 more minutes to tell you where we are meeting next. So, um, you know, the, uh, Ricky has already let the cat out of the bag. <laughs> and, um, yeah, we would like to invite you all to sunny, or as it's called, Bonnie, Scotland. And uh, hopefully uh, we will be hosting the uh, next edition of the European Lunar Symposium. There are still some final bits uh, to be done. You know, we are just coming out of pandemic, so nothing is certain or guaranteed. 
but I'm very hopeful that actually we can put out a good show. And why are we going to a particular place in Scotland? Let me just give you a brief background so that you can book your ticket as you go out. So we are going to meet in a place called um, Dumfries and Galloway. And uh, it's a, a, a beautiful uh, campus called Crichton Campus run by a trust, which is for non, not for profit. And it is in the Southwestern part of Scotland. So it is just uh, across the border from England. So it's very easy to reach transportation wise. You can fly to Glasgow, Manchester, London, and within, you know, if you fly to London within five or six hours, you can get there maximum. Uh, Glasgow, two hours, Edinburgh, two hours, Manchester, two hours. So it's quite well connected, easily reachable. And uh, it's a uh, hundred acres of green land around you that you can explore. And if you want to take a holiday in Highlands, you are again, a couple of hours away from it. So the reason why we chose Dumfries and Galloway, there are many reasons, but a few reasons uh, are listed here and they might appeal to some of you differently. So those of you who are into poetry might want to visit the place because that's where the famous Scottish uh, poet Roger Burns, uh, he lived. Uh, again, if you are in philosophy, uh, or you are a thinker, you, know, you might want to um, look for the history of Thomas Carlyle. And if you're just in nature, you have the beautiful countryside uh, to explore in addition to attending the meeting. And you might have noticed that the next meeting is slotted for four days. Right, no more 8.30 starts. So, <laughs> right. So, um, and there are many other uh, landmarks there. Uh, so the, there's, there are a couple of pictures of the, the campus that where uh, we will have our meeting. So that is the campus. And then in front of that, there is a beautiful church. Again, it's worth, uh, you know, looking around. If you're, uh, you know, those of you are geologists might want to know where the, those rocks came from, where the marble in the uh, cathedral might have come from. So again, there is plenty to do. This, you can bring your spectrometer as long as non-destructive. Um, the, uh, what I was going to say was, um, um, okay, I forgot. Yes, it can hold up to 600 people, this lecture theater. So it is not a problem if we grow a little bit more next year. Okay. Um, right. So this is one of the reasons why I chose this place. Um, a few years ago, I was visiting that area and somebody brought to my attention that uh, Neil Armstrong uh, has an ancestral connection to Scotland. And that ancestral connection uh, is in Dumfries and Galloway. Uh, raise your hand if you knew this. One person, right? So most of us in the science community do not know that. And that's why I think cheekily we put the Scottish flag on the moon there, okay? But there's more than that. In February of 1972, uh, Neil Armstrong visited his ancestral town called Langham, which is only 40 minutes drive away from Dumfries. It's in the part of Dumfries and Galloway. And in Langham, he was actually given the um, Freeman of Langham, you know, uh, what do you call it, award, or he was called that. And this plaque is still there. So my hope is that next year when you come, we would make a visit to Langham and we will explore that history. And we might even meet some people who were there to meet Neil Armstrong. And I don't have time, but there is a YouTube video uh, of his visit where he was uh, uh, swearing an oath of allegiance or <laughs> to uh, the town of Langham. And one of the things that he said, which moved, was really moving, is that the, the biggest challenges for anybody is to be recognized in your own hometown. And he called Langham his hometown, okay? So uh, I would like to say that 55 years ago, almost first human being who actually stepped onto the moon had a Scottish connection. And now as we get ready to return humans to the moon, there is no better place than to come to Scotland and actually talk about things that are probably going to be relevant to the next human landing. So to me, that is a very special reason, but there are other reasons. There is another place called a multiverse, which is a, a rejuvenated, regreened open pit coal mine that has been designed by a famous uh, American architect, um, Charles James. And I was there last week on the summer solstice, uh, talking to the public about the sun and the moon. 
Uh, it's a wonderful place that you can actually explore and families go there just for picnic. And also I found out that um, this area in Dumfries Prison Galloway also has dark skies. So those of you who are into astronomy or were in, in astronomy in your previous uh, uh, careers can actually make use of that. So there are many, many things that is there. The meeting will be hosted by the Open University, that is my university in Scotland. So Open University has footprint in all the UK nations. And those of you, you know what I mean. The UK is made up of four nations, England, Scotland, Wales, and Northern Ireland. And so Open University in Scotland has agreed. And I am hoping that my colleague from Open University in Scotland, Derek Goldman, uh, who is going to be my main person uh, to, to make sure that this meeting uh, runs smoothly is online with us. So Derek, if you can hear me, uh, you can unmute yourself and say hello to the community here before we close the meeting. Is Derek there? He might or might not be there, but. Okay, never mind. It's uh, Isma, that's a good start. Okay, all right. I think that's all I had to share. And I think we are just five minutes before uh, 7.30. So huge thank you. I'm so glad that we are able to meet in person after a break of four years. Let's continue. And it's your meeting. Make use of it the way you like. Thank you.